All right, so let me quickly share my screen and start my presentation. All right, I hope my screen is visible to all the participants. Yeah, it is visible. Thank you, on Shabani. Yes, thank you so much. Let me also quickly turn on my camera. All right. So, hello, everyone. A very warm greeting to one and all. My name is Sri Gauri Krishnagumar, and I would like to welcome you all for day two of Omics Research Symposium. So, for those of you who are joining with us for the very first time, let me introduce you about the event. The Omics Research Symposium is a two day online event that is aimed at bringing together network of experts, educators, and students from all around the world to learn from each other, interact, and discuss advances in this field. And discussions will highlight challenges involving research using computational tools for big data, opportunities in this outgoing field, and applications for the advances in various fields, such as clinical, pharma, biotech, research, including agriculture. The symposium will be accompanied by a poster presentation competition, awarding prizes and giving a stage to students, faculty and research teams to present their research work and get expert feedback. So before we dive into the symposium, let me take a moment to introduce you to the organizing organization that is hosting this event, that is Omics Logic. We are a US-based bioinformatics company who is working with multiple academic and commercial collaborators to develop easy to use analytical tools. And our mission is to make bioinformatics more accessible. And this Omics Logic training has been completed by over 24,000 participants from 187 countries in over 300 workshops. And due to this fast growth, our team is working with local and regional coordinators that are helping refine local program logistics and adapting them to the needs of students and researchers around the world. This training has been completed by participants in six different specialization tracks that includes oncology, infectious diseases, precision medicine, neuroscience, data science, and even comprehensive training on omics data analysis. So how do omics logic resources help advance bioinformatics teaching? Omics logic is a portal for practical and theoretical learning of biological data analysis. Composed of courses designed to take you through the theoretical knowledge, omics logic takes a combination of training modules, data analysis tools, curated project data sets, and interactive sessions with mentors to give the student a clear path of the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid. And no matter what the user's initial experience with analysis is, Omics Logic is a useful tool for gaining a baseline knowledge of the theory behind biological data analysis, analysis of large data sets, and interaction to base supporting languages like R and Python, or even beginning a data analysis project. And these are the seven courses that were taken from the core Omics Logic curriculum that is available online. So this begins with an introduction to applications of biological data analysis, an overview of data types. Then the students are able to learn terminology and factual knowledge to build upon. From there, genomics, transcriptomics, metagenomics, epigenomics, data science, and cheminformatic concepts are introduced. And each course starts with important terms and concepts and then introduces case studies and pipelines related to each one. This allows the student to gain the conceptual knowledge in order to begin their own research projects. Omics Logic expands upon its curriculum with specialization track projects as well. Biological data analysis methods are best learned in the context of real case studies prepared by our network of mentors and collaborators that illustrate how various biological data analysis methods and omics data types are used in current research in medicine, biotechnology, agriculture, and even astrobiology. 
The projects are prepared by taking publicly available data sets and using them to explore and understand both the research challenge and the analysis part to extract meaningful insights from complex omics data. The omics logic portal gives students options for analyzing a given data set, and these can be code dependent path or code independent path. These data sets and associated publications can be used in several ways. You can learn biological data analysis without any coding at all. For that, in each project, we explain the analysis pipelines on the user-friendly T-BioInfo platform, which I'll be introducing you to you shortly in a while, for big data analysis. And you can also learn the scripts behind many of the steps, learning to wrangle, clean, visualize, and analyze data in popular languages like R and Python in order to create your own analysis. Finally, you can hear about the projects and their research applications in our mentor-guided programs where experts share their expertise and support research projects that are developed by. So here's an example of the code independent pipeline that I was just mentioning about. The pipeline builder interface on the TBINFO platform is a color-coded pipeline that helps establish a logical connection between the technical names of data analysis methods and the logical steps needed to build the full pipeline. So this is how you will be carrying out the pipeline. Data is first put in as an input file, and then analysis can be chosen based off the type of research that you wish to carry out. Each analysis is separated into three colors, blue for pre-processing, red for mapping, and green for quantification. And each time you click on a particular algorithm, a pop-up will show that will contain additional information that will be useful for you while building the pipeline. The ease of the color-coded buttons allows programs to be run without any coding knowledge and interactive outputs allow easy visualization of the data. And several demo pipelines with real data sets are available for students, researchers to practice the workflow, including demos on genomic variant calling of cancer cell lines, 15S amplicon analysis on diet and its effect on the microbiome, and a pipeline for examining a phylogenetic analysis of Ebola virus. So after using the TBINFO platform to visualize the pipelines and practice analyzing, students are then able to take their theoretical knowledge and apply that in a project. Then they check their comprehension with levels and badges, certificates of completion, and tests. Similarly, faculty should be able to assign the OMICS logic portal to their students with the understanding that it will give them holistic and comprehensive knowledge of biological data analysis, beginning with bytes and molecules, and on to designing their own question-based project. So if you are interested to get started with Omics Logic Learn Portal, it is very easy and free for anyone to register with many courses available at no cost. So to view the various courses, example projects, and student projects, you need to first sign up on the Omics Logic Learn Portal for that, let me quickly stop sharing my screen and take you to the Omics Logic portal. So I'm pasting the link for signing up on the portal in the chat box for those participants who have not signed up yet. So there you go. So that is the sign up link for Omics Logic portal. So once you click on the link, you will be able to ask to sign in to the Omics Logic Learn portal. So if you do not have a prior account on the portal, please click on the create an account option that you see here. And then you can provide a name, email ID and password and you can sign up. Or you can also sign up using any of your social media handles. That could be your Google account, Facebook account, Apple account, GitHub account, or even Twitter. And if you already have an account on the portal, you can simply log in with your existing email ID and password. So that is how you can sign up on the portal. With that, I'll pause for a couple of seconds since I can see that several participants are joining with us for the very first time. I'll pause for a couple of seconds for them to sign up on the portal. 
and then I'll show you how you can navigate the various courses and research case studies that are displayed on the portal. So let me know in the chat once you have signed up. And if you already have an existing account on the portal, please put a done in the chat box so that I can know. I'm waiting for your responses. And if you want me to explain any of the steps that I was mentioning about while signing up, please let me know that as well, and I'll be happy to guide you. And along the way, if you're facing any technical issues while signing up, please feel free to reach out to us as well, and we'll be happy to look into it. All right, I can see that few participants have signed up already on the portal. All right, meanwhile, um, rest of them are signing up. Let me quickly sign in and show you how you can navigate through the coursework. All right, so once you sign in, you will be able to see the courses page. So how do you navigate and uh, try to understand the various courses that the portal has to offer? So to be able to do that, scroll down below. And when you scroll down below, you will see a search bar that says looking for a specific course. So here, if you are to enter any of your key area of research interest, so let's say if someone wants to uh, learn about bioinformatics for the very first time, so you can simply enter the term bioinformatics, and that will show you the various courses and example projects that are associated with bioinformatics. So course one, introduction to bioinformatics, as well as course two, bites and molecules, are introductory coursework. For so those participants who do not have a prior background of bioinformatics and omics data. And these are free courses with certification available. So please feel free to check it out. And another interesting coursework that I want to direct to is uh, for those participants who are interested in coding. So the Python course one, getting started with bioinformatics and our coding course one, getting started with bioinformatics are two of the other free courseworks that are available with free certification. So for those participants who are interested to gain knowledge about coding that is related to Python and R, please feel free to check it out. So that is all about how you can navigate through the OMICS Watch Learn portal. And now you also have to set up your account on the portal. So how do you do that? So you can see a blue bar that says welcome back with your email ID. So once you click on this, you will be directly taken to your account settings. So here you will be able to see a button that says profile. Click on that and that will able to edit all the features that you are required to update on your account. So what are these features? Make sure that your name is in proper capitalization because your certificates will be automatically generated. So it is important that your name has to be in proper capitalization and add a brief bio about yourself so that we know your background and your research interests. So in my case, I have added about my education background and research interests and add a profile image for yourself as well. And finally, you can add your link to your social medias. Like for instance, in my case, I have linked my LinkedIn account and my website. So once that is done, your profile will be complete. And then you will be also seeing several tabs under your profile. So for instance, you have the activity tab wherein the program mentor and the community manager, they will be able to track your learning progress live. And under the courses tab, you will be able to keep a track of all the courses that you are currently enrolled in. And it will also display the progress that you are making. And finally, you will be able to receive all of the certificates after the required coursework, lesson completion, quizzes, assignments, and the certificates will appear under the certificate stuff. So that was all about. And another interesting tab that I want to show you is the projects tab, wherein all of the student research projects that have been carried out so far from various training programs have been displayed and compiled together on this section. So these student research projects 
um, range from topics on oncology, infectious disease, precision medicine, neuroscience, data science, machine learning, astrobiology, and so, so take a look at it and explore at your own pace. So let me quickly check the chat. All right, Peter has also signed up. Thank you so much, Peter. So let me go back to my presentation. All right, so I can see that uh, several of the participants are joining us for the very first time. So let me quickly summarize the events that happened on day one. So to begin with, Dr. Mohit Mazumdar introduced us to Omics Logic Asia and how the team is working to provide a platform for learning and skill development in biological data analysis. Then we were joined by Dr. Andrew Lin, who discussed the modeling of sequence evolution in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and its implication for immune escape and vaccine design, which is especially relevant given the current pandemic situation. Then we were joined by Dr. Mukesh K. Gupta, who provided us with insights into the omics of spermatozoa and its relevance to male fertility, which has important implications for reproductive health. Then we, were, then we had an exciting academic panel discussion on the future of bioinformatics and data science in India that provided us with diverse perspectives on challenges and opportunities that the field has to face. Then we were, uh, had uh, an exciting poster presentation competition that showcased innovative research by students in the field of bioinformatics and data science. The next session was focused on Omics Logic Africa, wherein Mr. Adikunle Adlivoye introduced us to Omics Logic Africa and how the team is working to provide a platform for skill development in biological data analytics. Then we had another exciting session by Mr. Ashraf, who highlighted the need for more bioinformaticians in Africa. This was followed by Dr. Piluke, who discussed the importance of bioinformatics in livestock improvement, which has significant implications for agriculture sector in Africa. Finally, the day one concluded by a panel discussion on bioinformatics education, training, and research in Africa that provided valuable insight into the challenges and opportunities in the field and how the team is working towards building a stronger bioinformatics community in Africa. So overall, yesterday was an incredibly informative and exciting day filled with fascinating discussions and presentation. Today promises to be just as engaging with a lineup of renowned speakers who will share their insights and expertise on the latest trends in this field. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Mohit Mazumdar. Dr. Mazumdar has over 12 years of research and industry experience he completed a master's in bioinformatics from Jamia Millia Islamia and a PhD in computational biology and chemistry from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is an expert in machine learning in application to biomedical and chemical data. He is currently heading the global business development for Pine Biotech USA and contributing to biological data science research and education by collaborating with universities in India and Africa mentoring participants from various programs by providing research support. And today he will be giving you a review of day one and a brief introduction to day two events. So with that, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Shrikari, and uh, welcome to all the participants who have joined today. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, as uh, this, uh, as Shrigari said, um, today we will start with a detailed review of uh, what we did uh, yesterday and uh, understanding and summarizing some of the things that would help us uh, gain uh, and extract information and knowledge from these uh, sessions by speakers who have uh, the immense experience in their field. So it was a great day one, and uh, we are excited to start our day two for the Sumix Research Symposium. And uh, for in this presentation, I think uh, there are some things that we have already discussed, and as uh, many of you are joining and will be joining throughout the day, 
uh, we will be also um, uh, available on uh, on live on youtube and also uh, you can reach out to us via chat in the chat box feel uh, feel free to reach out to our team for any assistance uh, with that i'll start uh, what we have planned for day two and uh, also review day one and uh, we have some exciting things uh, happening during the day we have a workshop coming up so i think uh, we are all looking forward to that to that as well which will be a great learning experience for those who are interested to you know dive to dive deeper into some of these type of data analysis and methods that we have been discussing and showcasing so um yesterday it was a great opportunity for all of us to learn from professor andrew lynn who is a very renowned professor from jawaharlal nehru university uh, school of integrative sciences uh, and uh, it was great to learn from him about his research which is mostly about modeling sequence evolution in sars cov2 proteins so in that in that talk uh, we learned several things from him and the research and also a lot about what people have already done uh, in the sky uh, spike proteins uh, and its evolution predicting potentially immune escape variants and researchers using computational models to analyze the genetic data of the virus so one of the approach he was discussed uh, he discussed and uh, was uh, very common for most biologists and bioinformaticians which is multiple sequence alignment so how can you predict uh, you know mutations and predict uh, their effect like whether they will be stabilizing or not and their binding properties of the uh skype uh, uh, spike protein to its cellular receptor which is the as2 receptor so he also elucidated a significant volume of research that has focused on monitoring and analyzing existing skype uh, spike proteins uh, pr protein data in order to track the evolution of the virus and make predictions about the future sequences that would be coming uh, that we could uh, you know um, see so interpretation of uh, these substrate specificity and determining residue and then understanding which enzyme subclass and subfamilies are there is an important way to understand the entire um entire uh, virus and its family and its functional characteristics so there was a lot of focus on that during the talk and uh, uh, um, professor lin also discussed about the receptor binding domain and uh, its uh, its structure and showed us different uh, locations of these residues on the x axis and the structural fold and the function so understanding how these data uh, are put together and how the protein sequence of each segment like the alpha delta beta beta omicron uh, are put are uh, looking so through nucleotide alignment and annotation they try to map the differences and understand what how and understand by comparing with the wild type so these are some of the things that we learned from the session and um, and soon we will be also making the session available uh, on our youtube channel so um, i think uh, you can look forward to that and uh, learn more uh, by going through the session again because some of these talks were very technical and uh, i think uh, going again and um, going again would definitely be helpful to understand in a deeper sense that how some of these um, methods have been used and why these methods have been used for a specific type of problem so uh, next talk was by dr mukesh ki gupta professor mukesh ki gupta and uh, his title was something that uh, a lot a very less number of people have been working upon uh, using technologies such as next generation sequencing technologies and has a huge role uh, in in market for people who are looking for such help in terms of uh, conceiving so one of uh, one of the things that uh, and dr gupta was able to discuss is about the infertility rate that it has like globally there is a 60 to 80 million couples uh, and in india there are 20 million couples who have these uh, types of disorders and characterizing the different types of infertilities and then uh, show, uh, showing that what his research and how his research has helped in this entire area 
and the different ways they have collected this, the the data uh, and uh, how they have uh, uh, designed the experiments and uh, collected different types of data and, and in the end integrating them for understanding specific types of uh, problems that uh, these uh, different cases have shown in different uh, regions. So that was a great uh, talk and we have learned a lot about depletion of the spermatozoa with the uh, relationship with the RNA and then um, uh, the use of IVF and uh, the embryo development and uh, specific functions that he discovered uh, for uh, the uh, for the RNA function. So that was a good talk. If someone is interested in understanding and doing more research in this area, because there's a lot of opportunities in for business opportunities as well as research opportunities and the translational research opportunities. So um, that's what we were discussing uh, during the academic panel discussion, which was uh, really uh, very enlightening uh, because it actually paves way for institutions, for companies, for, uh, for governments to best utilize and what is the uh, way forward for students uh, to take up these different types of skill sets and based on and expect what in terms of you know, opportunities or uh, uh, the kind of career uh, one would imagine. So these were very important points that we were discussed, that were discussed during the entire academic panel and covering and telling the way forward and uh, for specifically for students coming from a non-bioinformatics background to bioinformatics uh, background and data analysis background, more, more about the biological data analysis capabilities and uh, finding the ways using uh, these type of coursework, online coursework, certification or diploma course for um, deeper understanding, and then understanding uh, about the principles and open source tools and using the uh, graphical user interface for beginners <clears throat> and uh, classifying uh, the, uh, the uh, students into several categories about you know engineering technicians and scientists and you know people who are uh, uh, working as an application scientist and uh, the way forward to do internships and in the field of data science and how uh, many companies are planning to use AI and uh, use this data and how this is growing in specific countries around India and also in Africa. So this was a very uh, uh, good session. And I think uh, if you would want to go through it and you would want to gain some in in insights, that would be something that I would really recommend for those who are, uh, who are investigating more into how to build capacity and how to uh, address the gaps. So followed by that, we had uh, the exciting session where we had the student presentations uh, from uh, from our Omis logic programs, research fellowship program, and as well as students who have done their own research or uh, at their own labs and uh, PIs. So um, we had the session where we got uh, the presentations from the students uh, from spe specifically talking about different types of research areas and what they have been able to contribute. So uh, I think uh, one of the key presentation that we started off with was about uh, the role uh, of uh, you know uh, um, crop interventions and diet supplements to combat food insecurity in sub-Sahara regions, and then understanding the microbiome in animals like cats, understanding their role in microbial community in health and disease. Then we learned from uh, Ariana, which was the first talk perhaps about the um, use of deep learning, noble deep learning predictor for post-therapeutic breast cancer re reoccurrence risk. People who have developed breast cancer many times, there has been uh, cases that there is a reoccurrence and she used multi-omics data integration framework to find out the biomarkers and specific genes. Uh, they, those were responsible and could be identified and said to be biomarkers uh, for uh, diagnosis. So that was a very good presentation. 
and then we had uh, a presentation by Tanmay uh, exploring the role of uh, intestinal microbiota and how it regulates the high fiber and high fermented diet. And uh, there were questions by by the experts uh, who are listed here, Dr. Julia Panov and Dr. Priyanka Narad from Amity University and Dr. Ramesh from River University. And uh, they were very satisfied with uh, with uh, with many of these projects and gave their feedback. And uh, there were also some projects which were not we were not been able to showcase, but uh, um, those will be available as well um, uh, as uh, short videos for those who are interested in understanding uh, like projects which are related to Parkinson diseases and the crop in intervention and diet supplements project. Uh, which were not shown uh, during the presentation, but are available. So uh, also, uh, as Shrigari said, once you start exploring on the Learnomics logic, you will find there is a section on projects where all these projects have been published. And uh, it's a great resource to develop new ideas from what uh, seeing how these projects are done and uh, using public repositories, public publicly available data. Uh, which are repurposed and reused for, to look into some different types of analysis. So we will uh, do a short glimpse of that. Uh, and then, as said, uh, Adi Kunle, our uh, uh, director from um, the Omics Logic Africa team, discussed about the valuable initiatives and the much needed training and capacity building in bioinformatics and data science uh, for life science researchers in Africa and building local expertise and skills programs which are aimed to support research and innovation in the region uh, focused on local problems and we have been working on several of these research projects on malaria on different types of immune immune related diseases uh, which are pre pre prevalent in africa and also important challenges in health and agriculture so uh, there were uh, discussions about how a student can be uh, associated with uh, Omics Logic Africa initiative, how a researcher can be associated and how a professional can be associated with the, with the initiative. And uh, we are looking for, uh, for participation from our African community and help local problems, address local problems, and also participate in global problems by working as a team, working as a community, utilizing the Omics Logic as a community, a network of uh, researchers from all around the globe trying to understand and trying to utilize the data. So after that, uh, we had this amazing talk by Mr. Ashraf, uh, who recently showed also his publication that talks about the need for more bioinformatics, bioinformaticians in Africa. He explained the bioinformatics definition and the components like IT, computer science, uh, databases, molecular biology problems in Africa. So how there is a lag in IT sector and expertise, lack of basic problems such as electricity, government, what are the different government interventions and lack of, you know, high throughput machines and practical implementation. And because of that, the data generation is not very specific to African population. And um, what are the ways uh, one could be utilizing the resources such as public repositories and do their research? Um, because it's challenging to do data generation, but it is still possible to do data analysis and interpretation using platforms such as ours and many other which are available. So we also had this session followed by followed by the session about the education in Africa and the current need to the role of bioinformatics and livestock uh, uh, livestock improvement. Uh, so it was a session for where we uh, where uh, the uh, where the expert uh, Faluke, uh, um, who is an associated professor, Dr. Faluke, who is an associated professor at the Department of Animal Production, Molecular Evolution, and Genetic Diversity Unit. So these type of sessions, I think, are very, very helpful, and it's uh, it's very enlightening for many of us to understand that how these uh, not only like how these biological technologies are being utilized in different types of areas like you name it and you will be able to find that there is an application and many of these applications are uh, still to be explored and still to be uh, you know properly executed and hence there's an opportunity for all of you 
for all of those who are new to this field or for all of those who are excited about this field to contribute and do something meaningful it could be startups it could be you know research projects it could be just an initiative uh, for you to start your journey and uh, in the end you will be able to find those opportunities and that's what something that we've had discussed in the panel discussions and uh, understanding from these experts so as i was saying that uh, dr faluke was uh, talked about how bioinformatics is an important aspect of in thrilling genomic data to enhance uh, you know breeding programs increase productivity uh, and understand like how we can unlock the omics data such as genomics proteomics transcriptomics lipidomics glycomics uh, and use this for a, uh, for a better understanding and interventions that could just change the way things are right now making it much more efficient process much more productive and also much more scientific and um, uh, in the end um, uh, uh also in the in the end we have to think about the sustainability in terms of um, how it is affecting the environment so um we uh, here learned about different types of databases uh, basic bioinformatics and computational statistical techniques that one need to have to be able to uh, go through the data and uh, also have those basics that are required for you to get a deeper understanding of different types of data so i think um, it was followed by the panel discussion which uh, shri gauri just explained you in much more detail but yeah in conclusion i think uh, we are all at that stage where we would want to do this in a way that would make uh, uh, make the next generation and make the next uh, set of people life easier by uh, collecting right kind of data by doing meaningful research and not just by fulfilling uh, you know the requirements of a degree or anything like that but to gain real knowledge and then participate because otherwise um, it's not uh, something that would be able to you know sustain and do long term so that's why i think we had this small case study uh, that i quickly wanted to go through uh but before that i would just want to tell you that um what the sessions are looking like so we will be having our next session in couple of minutes and i want to show you about the industrial partnership and uh, the industry focused uh, talks that we are having in the next uh, next uh, uh, few uh, uh, in the next few hours and also throughout the day so Uh, we are really fortunate to have a lot of industry um partners who have collaborated with us in several different ways and are utilizing and have utilized the learn uh, omics logic or the server for research for training and uh, for providing career guidance and opportunities as well as job opportunities and internships so uh, we have been constantly reaching out to industry and we are inviting industry for their expertise and letting students know their need and provide uh, work with us to provide them uh, provide the student community and the research community the right kind of tools right kind of guidance to be able to excel in their careers so uh, we recently collaborated and we are starting um, student uh, career based training incorporated into the omics logic training which would help any student to you know connect their skill sets with the kind of job opportunities that are there but uh, as we realized while working with thousands of students that uh, there are uh, major gaps in that area as well so that's why this collaboration is to help those students develop uh, strength assessment job searching strategies personal branding networking resume cv cover letters sops so for higher education for job opportunities communication skills these are very important skill sets that are also required in addition to the uh, hard skills that you're learning the projects that you're doing so that's that's how i think it would be a complete journey and you will be market ready so that's where we have these initiatives and collaborations to help student uh, learn from collaborative resources and experts from the industry mm, similarly uh, for research we have Uh, collaborations with ngs industry partners uh, such as premas life sciences who are really um, doing uh, a lot of research with lot of research labs in india 
providing technologies such as Illumina, uh, to, uh, 10x genomics, twist biosciences, uh, working on clinical genomics, omics research, and different types of cool uh, fields such as synthetic biology, genetic engineering, and they are also working on different types of research projects and uh, providing these uh, these instruments and uh, uh, support to, to the labs. So we are uh, collaborating and we are working together to be able to provide right kind of data analysis tools and skill sets and capacity, as well as research support and end-to-end -end, uh, data analysis support so that uh, uh, based on the requirement of the of the participant or of the institutions or of the labs or of the universities or of the company, um, we can uh, provide uh, all of those uh, requirements in the sequencing sequencing areas. And similarly, we have our other partners uh, who are working on different technologies for sequencing, such as Oxford Nanofort technology, which is a very uh, uh, upcoming technology that provides uh, high accuracy based calling at very low cost and uh, alignments on methylation and all of that. So uh, one of the technology is also the Nanopore mini ion. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, portable and also it's a very affordable sequencing technology, I think, which many of, uh, of uh, be, many of the researchers are aware of and also are not aware of. So it helps uh, in acquiring, uh, you know, different types of uh, uh, sequence uh, any anything anywhere actually and it's real time and also like uh, technologies such as Promethean which is which generates uh, you know up to 11 terabytes of data in 48 hours so these are the technologies that are the future technologies that many labs and institutions and and uh, research institutions and um, and companies are, are readily using these technologies so um, we also collaborated with uh, AI based or academic uh, healthcare uh, companies to be able to provide uh, such services as well as to be able to provide uh, opportunities for the students. And uh, we are really uh, uh, happy uh, to be able to collaborate with, uh, uh, with PABA, so Federation of Asian Biotech Association um, we have been collaborated. Uh, uh, we have been collaborator for last three years and working and developing different types of programs uh, for bio, biomedical data science, chem informatics, and drug discovery, as well as uh, working and helping different institutions to develop such capacity with the help of Professor Radana, Dr. Kamath, Dr. Saxena, and uh, their experienced um, pharma leaders and. Uh, uh, they understand where the industry is heading and where the drug discovery industry is heading. So together, we have developed several curriculums just to help students understand chem informatics, drug discovery from uh, an industry perspective. And now this has been taken up uh, by uh, the CEO, uh, Dr. Jagdish, and other respected members. So uh, we will be hearing from them as well uh, very soon. So as I was telling you that... Uh, uh, for a life science student or professional, uh, I think we we quite hear about drug discovery all the time and the problems with drug discovery. So this actually addresses that. So we have the upcoming session coming up, um, and I think we am over time. So without any further delay, I'd like to uh, ask Shri Gauri to invite the next speaker and um, the opportunity for all of us to learn from Dr. Jagdish uh, and his. Uh, his insights into the industry and uh, mm, from his experience. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohit, for uh, giving us an overview about the day one. And with that, uh, we'll be passing on to the next session. So we all, all know that advancements in healthcare and biotechnology have enabled us to better understand and treat diseases, develop new therapies and medicines, and make significant strides towards personalized medicine. But what are the latest trends in healthcare and biotechnology? And what are the various potential that the field has to offer? So for all of that and more, we'll be uh, discussing about that in our upcoming session by Dr. Jagdish Gandla. Dr. Jagdish Gandla is a seasoned entrepreneur with a strong background in science and passion 
for driving innovation in healthcare. As an accomplished scientist turned entrepreneur, he has successfully built and led startups in the life sciences and healthcare space. His expertise lies in community building and mentoring and having worked with prominent international organizations like the European Union EIT Health to establish mentoring and alumni networks. He also founded his own startups, including Dare to Start and Global Life Sciences and Healthcare Network, with a focus on helping others establish their own startups and fostering bilateral ties between Europe and India. Currently, he is serving as the Chief Operating Officer at the Federation of Asian Biotech Associations in India, where he is leveraging his experience and expertise to build robust entrepreneurial ecosystem in the biotechnology and the life science field. So with that brief introduction, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ragdish Kandla to start with the session. I'm stopping my sharing and the screen is all yours. Thank you, Sri Gauri, and thank you, Mohit, for inviting me. I think my five minutes is gone in the introduction, Sri Gauri. Next time we can skip it. <laughs> Very good. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, because this trends topic is, is quite a quite, uh, broad one, right? So I would really like to talk and inspire people about what where where they can their career can lead to. Okay. So uh, Sri Gauri, may I know what, what is the background of uh, people? We do have uh, several participants who are beginner in bioinformatics and okay. their research interest mainly lies in plant biotechnology and agriculture. Oh, okay, okay. So so everyone, like, please keep it interactive. Like, You don't need to wait until I finish because we also don't have much time. It's only half an hour. So I'll, let me try to share my screen. So, okay. Okay, so let's talk about trends in biotechnology and healthcare. So we will basically understand what is a trend and then then where you know opportunity lies. So I mean it's it's fortunate that you're already connected with Omics Logic because they are they are one of the best companies who are training the next generation of scientists, especially in this data science and artificial intelligence. So firstly, let me introduce myself. Who am I? So I'm a BSc biotech. I did my BSc in India, MSc also in India at University of Hyderabad, then PhD in Germany, and then worked with several healthcare companies in India. Now I serve as a chief operating officer at Federation of Asian Biotechnology Association. I mentored several healthcare startups and students, built several communities and startups. And, and, and also I, I used to work at, at Technical University of Munich in Africa, for Africa on global health projects. So I think since we have lots of African students here, so my topic is a bit related to global health, where, I mean, I think one of the burning issue, global health, let's say this pandemic or anything or malaria, Leishmania, tuberculosis, and all these things, how you can apply these cutting edge technologies to our own problems, like you know, India or Africa. So let's say first, so my topic is trends in healthcare and biotechnology. So before we, we move into uh, looking into what are the trends, first understand what is a trend. So a trend is a general direction in which something is developing or changing. Okay. So when you when you talk about biotechnology or healthcare sense trends, so why should we know about it and what, what exactly is a trend? So here, the biotech or healthcare trends serve as a compass for the biotechnology or healthcare industry, indicating where it is headed and highlighting the disruptive technologies bound to reshape it. These trends also help industry leaders to get a greater sense of end user needs and how they can modernize their business models to meet them. For example, I mean, you know, if, 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 if you have been using Nokia phone long time back, they did not understand the technology of smartphones. They didn't understand the trend. So they failed in the business. So that's how basically, you know, uh, some consultants that set the trends and based on that whole industry will follow. So what is biotechnology? I mean, let's let's keep it interactive. May I know what is biotechnology? If somebody can type a definition in the chat. What is biotechnology? So this is also a test that if you're alert or not. Come on, should not shy away. What is biotechnology? So who is, you can also open your microphone and talk. Who is the hero? First one to send me the answer.
Mohit, <laughs> we need to find a way how to inspire people. <laughs> Surely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is uh, not good. So people, you need to be open up and speaking. These are the fantastic opportunities that that you get to know. Okay, I see. It's a, it basically it basically involves using biological systems and mechanisms with a so aim of developing enhanced product. Fantastic, sir. That's amazing. That's what is, is biotechnology. So biotechnology is a technology that utilizes biological systems, living organisms are parts of this to develop or create different products. It could be vaccines, it could be enzymes, it could be anything where biological organs are used. Biological material is used. It could be animals, cells, anything. Okay. So how are healthcare or biotech trends being set? So usually it's always about money. You know, funding, like let's say in the research, based on the funding, research or innovation, education or businesses will be set. Then afterwards, you know, trends put forth by institutions like World Health Organization or some consulting firms. So because they have the data and they understand where we need more resources, that's where the trends are being set. So we'll talk about them today. I'll try to share a few things because we don't have much time. So... I mean, when I started my career in biotechnology, I think in, in 2000s, people were saying biotech boom is happening now at the time. But actually, there was never biotech boom. Uh, I didn't really, it was even difficult to find a job after master's or PhD. But now after the COVID pandemic, there's this different kind of revolution happening in terms of vaccines or in terms of, uh, you know, CAR T cell therapy and all these things. So I think the biotech boom is happening now and we have to capitalize on it. So... Before jumping onto it, since we, we, we have a lot of participants from Africa, let's look into one major problem that we are we have to address. One is One Health. So One Health represents an integrated approach to advancing multi-species health at the human-animal environment interface. So basically, we are not living alone. On this planet, we have animals, we have plants, we have microbiota. So a lot of things are there. We basically live along with everybody. This is where, you know, we need to take care of everybody's health. So that's where this one health concept comes. So I'll basically, I, I have told you what are trends. I told you what is biotechnology, what is healthcare. Slowly, I have diverted you into different concept of one health. Where, where What I want to highlight here is that human is not alone. And, and, and as a researcher or somebody who is in the industry, we have to think everything is as one. And then, you know, you, you can use your trends for that. So One Health, if you have seen, you know, I mean, birds are caged very wrongly. You see how the pollution and, and the global warming, mining and all these things are happening. So it's really difficult. I think we will, the global warming is happening. I think we are not headed in the right direction. So as I said, you know, humans, environment, animals, we are all living together and One Health comes in place there. So 60% of all our diseases are zoonotic. So that means they come through animals. And 70% of all the emerging human infectious diseases in the past three decades originated in animals, like COVID, all these things, they came from animals. And 65% of all the neglected tropical diseases are zoonotic. So the world population is projected to grow from 7 billion in 2011 to 9.8 billion by 2050. So that means the more number, more number of people we are, there'll be more interaction with animals and environment. And, and that interaction is going to increase. So that's where we need to look into this communication where everybody uh, are, are all their needs are taken care like sectors and disciplines society one health everything has to come together that's where i think you know that's the, that's the idea where i was working at at global health in, in technical university of munich in germany and we used to do a lot of projects about neglected tropical diseases solid project systemic project systemic project is about tinea solium uh, and we worked on antimicrobial resistance and neglected uh, and neglected tropical disease drug development and the helm about helminths we did lots of projects we also did some clinical trials of prasequantal for you know helminth disease so i mean this is one of the projects that i have worked about tinea solium where you know in africa and india and couple of asian countries latin america where pigs are eaten that's where this disease used to come actually it is still exists and there are so many people who struggles and uh, this life cycle is it starts from animal then uh, so first human it, it will the tapeworm will be in the human then when he sheds his feces eggs will come out that will be taken up by pig and then when you eat pig 
when you eat like a raw pig meat it comes again and this is deadly and usually people develop epilepsy and the many people who are struggling with it i'm i'm just trying to give an example like how these kind of diseases are neglected and how people like you with this trends and with this omics logic help i think you have to address these things so you know there is not even a proper test that is available for that disease so we developed a kit so simple like uh, you know lateral flow test we developed one kit with with the help of many many uh, institute in collaboration with we are also doing clinical trials with a small drug called prasiquantel so okay so that's like a background now let's really look into trends so uh, i don't have trends for 2023 i am giving trends from 2022 and i also have some data from 2021 so i still uh, i don't think we are ready yet for 2023 let's let's take example of 2022 so if you look at top 10 trends in biotechnology so artificial intelligence so biotech and health will go hand in hand okay somebody can i mute them okay great so so these are the trends like artificial intelligence big data gene editing precision medicine gene sequencing bio manufacturing synthetic biology bioprinting microfluidics tissue engineering these are the top 10 trends these are couple of companies that we used to work with they work in this trends so let's look into each trend so what is artificial intelligence i mean i think mohit was beautifully explaining when i joined so artificial intelligence refers to the simulation or approximation of human intelligence in machines so this artificial intelligence i think we we is 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 going to change lot of our lives in many things especially in the drug discovery and other processes so biopharma can biopharma startups can leverage artificial intelligence to speed up drug discovery as i mentioned uh, we are also doing a workshop on it screening biomarkers scraping through the scientific literature to discover novel products you know image classification algorithms allowing rapid detection of different traits such as cancer cells from medical scans or crop science systems from leaf leaf images leveraging deep learning to analyze microbiome screen phenotypes and develop rapid diagnostics so one can use in diagnostics one can use in discovery one could use in in many things wherever there is you know big data like really lot of data one could automate it through artificial intelligence that's one of the trend so why understand this trend will help you is that you know you could you could do next big company in this field or you can start your career in this field or you can do research in this field so it will help you in every aspect of wherever you are aiming at so the next one next one is big data and of course mohit's company pine bio is 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 helping you so the definition of big data is that is is data that contains greater variety arriving in increasing volumes with more velocity so i don't want to read everything so you could you could basically it's like omics technologies so recruitment of patients for clinical trials finding effective drug candidates so you could basically use drug big data lots i have lots of friends who are working in big pharma companies they they are basically collecting big data and analyzing it analyzing big data is not so easy so big data comes it can come from anywhere it could be in the healthcare it could be in the cosmetic space it could be in any any of the space like wherever you collect data you need to analyze it and and that is one of the trend and there are lots of jobs in this field okay yeah so that's like the second trend and the third trend is gene gene editing so gene editing i mean i'm not sure if you guys know recently there was a nobel prize for christopher uh, emmanuel charpentier and jennifer doudna who invented crispr who discovered crispr so they basically opened up a new field in genome editing there are lots of diseases like thalassemia where it can be edited only through genes because these are genetic defects and one can also increase crop yield so this is one of the field that is really flourishing and there are lots of companies that are budding and there are also a lot of problems that has to be addressed so please look into it you will learn quite a lot especially look into the uh, technique called crispr and the precision medicine so i mean precision medicine or personalized medicine is something where you know which is very very specific to one individual so my the drug that works on me may not be working on you so you this this kind of field is really evolving because you know most of the drugs whatever work in some people may not work so this precision medicine will help to identify new drug targets discover novel drugs offer gene therapies develop new drug delivery technologies so they, this field is rapidly evolving there's lots of investments coming in please look into it okay another one is microfluidics so microfluidics i mean the beauty of microfluidics you know these are very very small channels 
And when you put any drop of liquid here, it could be blood or water, any liquid, the properties are completely different as what you see outside. So this is where a new technology opened up. This in these micro channels, you know, one could basically build a liver here, a kidney here, a brain here. These things are fantastic. I mean, they 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 will, I think they are already in the market, but once they come in, they will revolutionize whole diagnostic space or, or discovery space, all experimental cells. Most of the clinical trials can be done on this uh, lab as a dish, you know. So I can I think I kind of briefed about five trends that are really interesting, but there are also many others. So just because of time, I'm not focusing more. Uh, on every technique. So another one is gene sequencing, where you have Illuminas, all other sequencing machines, which are, you know, the, the technology we think we are, we are already in rapid space, but actually there is much more, you know, using this technology, you could sequence microbiome, genome, there are many things to, to still figure out. We could already, you know, predict this is what we get in next 20 or 30 years. Biomanufacturing, like large scale fermenters, like you are, you are producing organic meat in the lab, vegetarian meat. So all these things are coming up, synthetic biology, where you produce bacteria or anything that could, let's say, biofuels and all these things, bioprinting. So my teacher used to say, like, once, once the biotechnology flourishes, at one point, we'll be printing liver, kidneys, and all these things. When we want it, we go just go to supermarket and buy it. So that's where this technology is growing, tissue engineering. So these are all the trends. And these are all the trends set by, you know, based on how investments and everything is coming. So I'll try to share based on funding. So global health and biotech investment update. I took this report from a company called Deal Room Co. So where they do analysis based on investments. So let's look into some valuation figures, like how to how these companies like you know biotech companies and healthcare companies have projected the numbers. So the global VC funding. If you look into the venture capital funding, so venture capital. So uh, if you don't understand what I am talking, don't worry about it. So this is all startup language that we use. It's all about companies, what they raise money and everything. So here, if you look into 2010, the funding that VCs used to invest in the healthcare companies was around only, only 10 billion. But when, when it increased to 2021, it increased to 79 billion. So there is 8x scale, 8x increased or 800x increased within 10 years. So this kind of shows that this is where the trends are happening. This is where the investments are happening. So this is a real, real kind of reality where we can expect that there will be more money, there will be more research happening. And also when you look at the unicorns, unicorns are the number of the, the startups that have 1 billion valuation are called as unicorns. So in biotech and health tech, if you see in 2014, there were only four. Then slowly, slowly, slowly they increase now 84. And they will increase day by day after the pandemic. You know, they, the people started to believe in healthcare and people started to invest in healthcare. So they will grow. And combined enterprise value of both health tech and biotech was, was few. Now it increased to trillions. It used to be in billions. Now it's in trillions. So the number is increasing like anything. And people like us has to play a big role. So as I said, you know, the, the, the health tech companies globally have reached a combined value of around 1.7 trillion, a 5.5x increase since 2016. So there are a lot of companies like, you know, the Illumina, which is the major sequencing company, the valuation is quite a lot, 64 billion. And there are many other companies. There was also one company, Indian company that I was looking into it. I'll try to tell you it's in the different slide deck. But what I'm here, what you need to look in here, what I'm trying to show is the valuation of the companies got increased. When the valuation increases, that shows that the field is really increasing. And the second one is it's glucose, the, the diabetes market. Diabetes market is increasing like anything, and it will. It is not going to slow down. It will increase. So Dexcom is one of the major company who is who is uh, you know providing insulin pumps and other things. So that if you look into these things, like you know what this Pharmacy, Pharmacy is one of the Indian company that I was looking into it. They recently raised Series F funding of around five hundred million. So this really shows that you know people are now interested to invest in healthcare and biotech. And, and this is where, you know, the biotech boom is happening and people I like, can find whoever works hard, their careers are not so difficult now. It could be easily made. Okay, so those are, so those, those one thing. So I try to tell you, uh, like, what are the trends that are happening? 
through fields and then i showed you the uh, the, the investment landscape now let's going into different field like uh, like how consultants or otherwise somebody who are big bodies like who they basically see there are lots of health challenges that are very urgent and we need to address of course covid is one thing i think it, it is not finished yet we will it will come back again so couple of other challenges you know elevating health in the climate debate like air pollution mal pol uh, malnutrition spreading of malaria this is one of the major problem that we have to address and and uh, this is i think they have set around 13 i picked up only six which which is relevant to us delivering health in conflict and crisis for example ukraine and russia war is happening how could we give health to them okay making healthcare fairer socio economic gaps let's say people who have money they have better health as well because they have access to good healthcare but how can we make it fairer that everybody is equal in terms of healthcare then expanding access expanding access to medicines like falsified medicines vaccine supply so there are lots of uh, you know falsified medicines have come into the market but how can we attack how can we tackle it vaccine supply like vaccine is not supplied properly in many places of the world stopping infectious diseases especially neglected tropical diseases and tuberculosis etc how could we stop it and preparing for pandemics endemics like covid 19 is kind of example like we were not at all prepared or we were under prepared and then how can we in the future how could we prepare so finally you know i want to close with the sustainable development goals set by un united nations so though there are lots of 17 goals that we have been set like you know no poverty zero hunger good health and well-being quality education gender equality and a lot of other things i think you might be aware of it so just take this as an example there are so many things to be solved and there are trends so you once you are passionate about things especially in healthcare and biotechnology i think that the revolution is happening and you have to participate in it so that's all today for today for my talk and I would be happy to take any questions or feedback. I have three more minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Kandla. So I have been receiving few queries. So let me ask that one by one. So we okay. have one query. Uh, can you share your perspectives on the potential of wearable digital devices in healthcare and uh, how could they enable healthcare providers to provide highly personalized care? So the wearable technologies, basically, right? So wearable technologies yeah. itself is a is a big field. So I mean, if you follow up the Apple Watch trend, so they they basically projected themselves uh, not as a medical device, but but when you look into it, it still shows that when you have heart attack or when you are not when you are not having proper energy, how is your temperature? I think these things will play a very big role, already playing a big role. And uh, glucose monitoring is one big example. There are sensors that you can just put it on your hand. It will measure for next 14 days and tells you like what, what when you eat something, what will happen next? Like when do you need, when you are fit for energy or uh, fit for exercise, when you are not fit for exercise, how good is your sleep? I think these things right now, people are collecting data. We, people are not into personalized medicine yet. They're collecting data. But once data is pooled, I think next big giants like Facebook is already investing in it. Google is investing in it. Amazon is investing in it. So the personal medicine is already happening in this space, but it will happen quite a lot. Thank you so much, sir. I hope uh, that answers the part of the query. And then the second is the biotech industry's drug research segment is exhibiting great potential. Uh, I would appreciate hearing your perspective on this matter. And... Uh, he is interested in smart technology. So biotechnology or smart technology? It's he says smart technology. Yeah, okay. So I think smart in the sense you were talking about smart proteins, if I'm not wrong. Smart proteins yeah. in the sense people call smart proteins when you are making you know alternative meat or producing plant-based meat, uh, something where you would like to reduce the global footprint of animals. So that's where smart proteins are playing role. Smart technologies are playing role. Uh, right now, there's a lot of investment hype in it. And uh, I think we need to focus on it. Otherwise, you know, just relying on animals, growing lots of animals and killing them, it's not good for the planet, also not good for our health. So I think that the technology, I have seen a couple of companies raising big amount of money in this space. And the next question that we have is, I recently completed my master's in biotechnology from Kolkata. 
please, sir, how do I get opportunities in healthcare data science domain? Contact Dr. Mohit Majumdar. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mohit will be the right person to tell you because uh, his company is built to help you people like you. Uh, but uh, the question has been directed at you. So I guess your insight will be helpful as well. So the question is like how, how to uh, establish the, career in data scientists, right? The person has a background in biotechnology, but it yeah. looks like he wants to transition to healthcare data science domain. Exactly. So healthcare data sciences is a very big field and uh, that that could be in many things. You could look into clinical trials or you could look into uh, big data analysis. For example, one of my friend works for Boringer Ingelheim in, in, in Austria, Vienna. So he works on uh, cancer big data. So it's all healthcare data analytics. So he does it and he predicts like what kind of mutation will lead to what kind of cancer. And I'm talking mostly cancer, but there are many, many diseases one could look into data. So the future is bright in this space, but the thing is you need to be well equipped with certain type of techniques. And that techniques is usually not taught at your college in biotechnology. And that's where, you know, Mohit can help. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. So Thank much. you so much, Jagdish. I mean, this was such a motivating presentation for us, <laughs> seeing the numbers and all. <laughs> but uh, I think it has been truly, uh, I mean, uh, throughout the session, we understood every aspect and uh, learned about the different things and opportunities and where all of us are heading because some of us have no idea being a student and uh, like such presentations are of a great, great help to get that direction and get that motivation to do something which is uh, going to be useful for uh, all of us. Thank you. Sure, my Thanks for inviting me. I think we, we don't have much time. Maybe you need to move to the next talk, right? Yes, sir. We do yes. have a couple of queries, so I'll be emailing them to you. I'm receiving as we are speaking in the chat, but I'll be happy to email them. To you. Okay, please email me. I'll I'll drop off now. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, for that wonderful Thank you. Thank you so much, Jagdish. All right. So with that, let us move on to the next part of uh, today's symposium. So let me ask by asking you a question. Have you ever wondered how bioinformatics is used in the field of uh, industry and academia? What are the similarities and differences? To shed light on these topics, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Prasanna Koti has a background in genomics, bioinformatics, and data science and comes from extensive experience in analyzing following generation sequence data his tenure as scientist and educator. Dr. Prasanna is fueled by his passion for analytics in biology, informatics, and data science. Also reads enjoying reading, jogging, meditation, and gardening. And with that brief introduction, please join me in welcoming Dr. Koti to start with the session. Thank you, Sorry. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Gauri. So I'll just uh, share my screen and so I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Yeah, right. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so um, the topic is uh, role of bioinformatics in academia versus industry, right? So today I'm not going to be speaking too much into the science of bioinformatics, but uh, rather uh, uh, I'll be uh, speaking more into the contribution of uh, bioinformatics as a domain in academia versus industry, right? So I had the experience of, uh, um, uh, you know, being both in industry as well as in academia. I started my career in uh, industry, then I moved to um, uh, academia, I finished like four to five years there, and then I came back to industry, right? So now I'm the associate principal scientist in genotypic technologies, private limited in Bangalore, okay? So um, just the motivation, right? So we would like to know what is bioinformatics, right? So bioinformatics as a domain, it's a huge, vast domain, I would say. I mean, it's it's not only supporting a lot of knowledge systems, but it is also being supported by a lot of technological domains, right? So if you can see on the right, 
we have very important domains that are supporting bioinformatics. Let's say, for example, computer science, right? So people are sitting and writing softwares, right? Just to, you know, make sense of the data that is being generated by bioinformatics. And then at the other end, we have a lot of IT infrastructure or, you know, people who are involved in building just the, the, the resources to run the big data nature of bioinformatics, right? So we need a lot of RAM, we need a lot of storage space, and yeah, nowadays I think uh, people might have also, you know, heard about these GPU machines running a lot of processing processes in parallel, right? So, so uh, there is a lot of scope for, you know, even the infrastructure here. And um, yeah, once we have a lot of information, uh, there is this another domain, the data uh, database management domain, which is trying to structure this data, right? So it's putting all the information into a specific you know, structure where people can, you know, query it, you know, for useful information, right? So these are some of the domains that are supporting bioinformatics. On the other side, bioinformatics as a domain, it's supporting many life science domains, right? So for example, it's, you know, it's looking at agricultural data, it's looking at, you know, health science data, it's looking at, you know, structural, you know, protein structural data, genomics, biochemistry, biology, and, you know, let's say mathematical sciences, it's responsible for forwarding the science in mathematics, right? So the demand from bioinformatics is helping to develop new algorithms with a lot of mathematics involved in that. So that is a kind of motivation, right? So bioinformatics is a huge, vast science that is, you know, coming up. And in India, Bioinformatics is one of the thrust areas of bio biotechnology. Let's say, for example, you know, biotechnology in itself is a huge market, right? So, for example, uh, it was about $80 billion worth of market in 2022, and it is forecasted to grow to about $150 billion by 2025 in India, right? And it is also going to you know you know increase our footprint in the world biotechnology market so it's going to increase from 4 to 5% to almost 19% by 2025 and yeah so the market is just known to be growing and growing right so it's a huge market and um, a majority of the the biotechnology market is being contributed by uh, pharmaceuticals as you might be knowing that you know India is the uh, pharmaceutical you know pharmaceutical house of the world, right? So you get or you you are you know getting more and more let's say I mean vaccinations, right? So recently we had so much of vaccinations that were you know produced in India, they were shipped I mean shipped to all parts of the world, right? So followed by uh, pharmaceuticals, we have agriculture and so on, right? So what we can understand is that biotechnology in itself is a huge market uh, in India. And uh, that, you know, keeping all these things into consideration, uh, the Department of Biotechnology, I mean, let's say, for example, Department of Biotechnology, uh, during 1987, they considered bioinformatics as one of the trust areas of biotechnology. And, uh, you know, they um, uh, put in a lot of support and, you know, infrastructure was given for the development of you know bioinformatics resources in the in the country, right? So, for example, uh, two best examples are uh, in front of you. One is the IBDC, that is um, Indian Biological uh, Data Center. So, it's a single point access, you know, um, resource location where you can you know put all your data. You can you know, uh, let's say for example, curate the data. You can you know quality control the data. And you can add the metadata. See, for example, you can store the data for long times. You can share the data. So it's, it's kind of a data archive, which is related to all domains of biology. Right? Let's say, for example, agriculture, livestock, microbes, and humans. Right. So that's one of the best examples. It's going on, and it it has a lot of you know subsidiary uh, web servers, which are giving you a lot of information. Right. So it's one of the best examples. And another one was. Uh, a MANU initiative, so it was one of the, the uh, uh, comprehensive initiatives to build uh, uh, or construct a human atlas. Um, 
uh, one of the first of its kind in India and uh, see, for example, here, you know, all kinds of data, right? So it might, might be data, it might be information, all could be, you know, put into this specific location where you could, you know, include macro level to micro level information, right? So you could probably annotate them. It might be genomic information. It might be, you know, information from the publications, a lot of things, right? So you could probably put in uh, all the data with respect to humans in this specific resource, right? So once you have this uh, resource, it's a huge resource, right? So what you're doing is you're also, uh, you know, structuring this information for people to understand it. You, you know, when, the, when there is a lot of information, it can be very difficult for us to understand. So you're structuring it in such a way that, you know, people could understand it, right? So once you have a lot of information, what you're doing is you are using machine learning, you know, languages to just to find out some trends in the data, right? So you're trying to find what are these trends, you know, do we have any trend in this specific you know, disease? Do we have any specific trend in this, you know, heritability related issues or whatever, you know? And then finally, uh, one of a kind, you know, where people who are being, you know, uh, teach, right? So there was a lot of extension work, which was also being, uh, you know, taken up by this, uh, you know, uh, Manav Human Atlas Initiative. So what I would rather want to conclude from this uh, slide is that, you know, bio bioinformatics in itself is a huge market. Let's say, for example, right now, I think it should be around 15 to 20 billion dollars. But uh, by the end of this decade, it could easily reach to about 50 billion dollars, meaning that it's it's also going to become a lucrative market. And this bioinformatics market is going to attract a lot of human resources. That is what I'm, I wanted to conclude from this specific you know slide. Okay, and then. Coming to the, the context of today, right? So bioinformatics, academia versus industry, right? So in academia, what are we doing, right? So academia is a place where we focus on research, education, training, and extension work, right? So you do research, you do propagate what you are doing to a lot of people, and you're also publishing a lot of your papers, right? So for example, bioinformatics research can lead to some important findings or even tools that can be used by the industry so that is the most important thing so a lot of things can be you know uh, found out or can be you know uh, generated or constructed in academia which can be easily used by the industry right so at the same time in industry bioinformatics applications are more involved or you know more used to solve the practical problems right so the practical problems that are of immediate requirement right so let it be, you know, health science, let it be, you know, agriculture, or even, you know, you, you can ask whatever kind of, you know, biological field, right? So here, innovation or research is designed for the requirement of the industry, right? So the immediate needs. So innovation or research is only pointed towards the immediate needs. So we are not going to forward the knowledge here. We are always sticking in the boundary here, right? So there are industries which are working on developing a lot of tools they are going a bit outside the the boundary but for most of the the research in industry they are only trying to specifically solve the immediate you know, problem okay and then um, let's understand some of the basic accomplishments right so in academia you can see that one of the biggest accomplishments was a human genome project you know, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of money, and you know, once the human genome project was completed, uh, we were obviously interested in you know a lot of diseases, right? So we were thinking at a point to you know, you know sequence individual genomes, right? So what happened is that it opened the floodgates, right? So you could see that you know in industry there were a lot of sequencing you know machines that were coming up. Which were giving us, uh, you know, a lot of data at a very less time, right? So these newer generations of sequencing are, you know, forwarding the knowledge, right? So forwarding the science at a very brisk pace, right? So now we have a lot of data that is already there, and very few people to analyze this data. That is the most important thing, right? So 
you know, uh, what we are thinking right now is uh, we want to uh, sequence a human genome at uh, probably $100 or even less than that. So that is the point where we are sitting right now, right? So in academia, you know, individually, many people are, uh, you know, interested in uh, doing a specific task. Maybe somebody is interested in assembling the reads to the genome. Some of them are uh, interested in mapping the reads to the, the uh, reference genome or, you know, assembling the genome. Some of them are trying to, you know, predict the variants. Some of them are trying to, you know, annotate the variants. So uh, specific research interests are being, you know, chased and specific genomic tools are being published by academia, right? So a lot of things are coming out of academia. At the same time, in industry, we are need-based approach, right? So what we can do is we, we combine uh, probably the, the tools that are being, you know, um, you know uh, uh, discovered or, you know, constructed by the academia and we are making it a workflow to chase or to find solution to a specific problem, right? So basically we are need-based, you know, institutes, right? So we are only solving the, the problems at hand and we are constructing workflows to, you know, perform those jobs, right? So for example, in our own company, we have a tool called as a Commander, which, uh, you know, um, uh, removes, I mean, a lot of hurdles, right? So for example, you don't have to uh, be a, a programmer, you don't have to have uh, knowledge in you know Linux-based systems. But it's it's a graphical user interface. You just have to point where uh, the input files are, and you just have to point where you want the output files to be located. And you click on the run button, and it's gonna you know execute the workflows. So we have a lot of workflows like you know WGS workflows, whole genome sequencing workflows. Uh, variant analysis workflows, you know, metagenomics workflows, a lot of workflows that are integrated into this specific tool called Commander. So what are we trying to do in industry is, you know, more oriented towards problem solving, which are immediately required, right? So in academia, it's it's like, you know, it, it, you can take some time and you can, you know, increase or decrease the level of, you know, uh, the, the tool or you know, the information that you are trying to uh, you know, publish to uh, the uh, larger audience. Okay. So coming to working environment, right? So working environment in academia is uh, much more relaxed. So for example, uh, you might be working on one to two projects, you know, spanning over a defined period of time. You know, it's, it's not that you know. You'll be uh, super busy here, but uh, you, know, you have a defined period of time where you need to uh, execute a project and you know you need to uh, send out a report. Yeah, publications are always welcome during this process, right? Whereas industry, it's highly dynamic, right? So you are working working on multiple projects and they are always time bound, right? So you are, you are looking at a specific you know, you, you get the sample, you get the sequencing done, you get the data, and you have this, you know, turnaround time. So you need to always stick to the specific turnaround times. So it's highly dynamic, and you are not really interested in publishing papers here, right? So it's, it's up to the clients um, who wants to publish the data or, you know, who wants to forward the, the science. But for you, you are just analyzing the data and you are just reporting the data to the clients okay so for example in academia the goal might be just to assemble 100 genomes predict the genes annotate the genes do some kind of comparative genomics in about three years right so the project might be running for about three years whereas in industry you might be working on the same 100 genomes you are assembling them you are predicting the genes you are annotating and you are doing comparative genomics. Plus, you are also doing some 20 transcriptomic analysis or even metagenomic analysis in way less time period compared to the, the academia, right? So I'm telling you in 30 days. So this is just the number, but it can be less or a little bit more than that, right? So industry is always time bound. So you are analyzing and you are supposed to report it within a specific 
time form also. That is the most important thing in industry. Whereas in academia, you can be a little bit relaxed. And relaxed in the sense, you're also involved in teaching. You're also involved in, you know, extending the, the, the work in academia, right? right? I don't mean that you know you are completely relaxed in academia. I mean we are also running certain projects in our in, in our university. It doesn't mean that you know we were like completely relaxed, but we were involved in teaching. We were involved in taking this you know uh, research to uh, audience. We were trying to collaborate, and you know, a lot of works are also taking place at academia. Okay, and coming to funding, right? So. In uh, academia, um, funding is provided uh, by government agencies, right? So uh, you are writing a lot of, uh, you know, proposals. Uh, it might be to uh, central institutes, it might be to state institutes, or even the uh, the NGOs, right? So you are constantly on the edge of the seat to write the proposals and get the funding here, right? So whereas in industry company itself or investors are putting the money, right? So it's not that, you know, too tough in, in industry to get some funding, right? So in academia, researchers needs to constantly apply for grants. That's what I told, you know, you need to be on the edge of the seats. You need to constantly look for you know, grants, right? So you need to write the grants. You need to get the money just to keep the, the lab or, you know, whatever resources running, right? So industry there is a fairly constant supply of funds right so there's mm -hmm. a lot of money which is coming from uh, the uh, the tasks that are being done by the industry and you know a fairly constant supply of you know, funds to support the resources right uh, in academia um, benefits can be uh, consolidated right so it means that you know you have a fixed uh, salary and uh, apart from that, you are not getting any much more. Whereas in uh, industry, uh, benefits can be variable, right? So you do, um, you know, uh, get bonuses, right? So um, depending on the, the work done, or probably, uh, you know, uh, if you can uh, contribute a little bit more in getting the profits, you are going to be provided the bonuses in, in the industry. So the benefits can be variable, right? So. And then um, going to uh, the job hierarchy, right? So for example, in academia, you can always start from a, a PhD, right? So nowadays, uh, PhDs are also being funded by uh, the institutes uh, and uh, you get uh, you get very uh, little, uh, let's say for example, support. And you also get some uh, you know, contingency for performing some kind of research every year. And once you have this PhD done, you can go into the postdoctoral research where you are a little bit more experienced. You are capable of finding your own, uh, you know, experiments, uh, design your own experiments. You can write, uh, you know, uh, with uh, uh, proposals yourself and uh, help your, you know, immediate senior, right? So, for example, you might be an assistant professor. So you can uh, come, you know, uh, for example, sit with assistant professors and write the proposals for you know, submitting to the institutes, right? Once you have done with the assistant, uh, I mean, postdoctoral researchers, you go into this assistant uh, professors. So here people are, uh, uh, you know, doing research as well as teaching, right? So you are not only uh, doing research, you're also teaching to a lot of people, I mean, a lot of students, and uh, you're also constantly writing the, the proposals, right? So to get the funding, and uh, once you are done with so assistant, you are going to the associate professor. So you are basically the the uh, the responsibility is increasing, right? So you still have a lot of you know people to uh, delegate your job, but yeah. So the number of responsibilities will be uh, increasing, right? As an associate professor, and finally, uh, professor who is probably uh, the uh, kind of a head of a department, you know. You can probably be looking into uh, people's jobs. He's also teaching. He's also looking at people who are writing proposals. Are they, you know, getting accepted? All kinds of roles is being done by professors, right? So this is with respect to academia. When you come to industry, yeah. So for example, in bioinformatics, let's say for example in a, in a service-based industry, right? So you can probably start with a junior scientific analyst. And um, after a certain uh, period of time, uh, you can become senior I mean, scientific analyst. And yeah, similarly, you can become a bioinformatics scientist, right? So here, 
all these three people right so junior senior and bioinformatic scientists are more or less you know sitting and you know executing the workflows right so they are you know following a certain protocols they are trying to you know um, generate the yeah analyze the data and generate the reports and uh, when it comes to um, bioinformatics team leaders um, they are the ones uh, who are you know uh, planning the workflows right so they are you know sitting and you know uh, preparing a uh, new workflows they are looking into uh, you know uh, whether there are new tools which are being released are they um, you know giving us more information compared to the old tools so they are constantly reviving the workflows right so team leaders are sitting and you know looking at the workflows and uh, um, finally we have the bioinformatic group leader who is looking at every aspect of all the people below him right so he is sitting with you know team leaders he is you know uh, reviewing the workflows you know he is once the the workflow is fixed he is probably sitting and training all the people in the, the team so these are some of the the things that you know bioinformatics group leaders uh, you know does and yeah similarly um, you know there is uh, an increase from the the beginning position to the last position there is always an increase in the amount of money that you are going to be getting here right so it can be academia or industry okay so irrespective of academy or industry right so if you are joining uh, um, let's say for example uh, a lab in in academia or uh, uh, industry you know some of the basic requirements that we need is at least a masters degree in bioinformatics right so it's it's a prerequisite requirement and uh, we always uh, look for basic biostatistics knowledge and uh, yeah so um, we also look for uh, people who can uh, do some kind of coding let's say for example uh, python and r can be uh, very beneficial right so people with uh, knowledge of python and r can be uh, you know uh, can be uh, very beneficial for the, the candidate itself and uh, yeah so since um, bioinformatics in itself uh, is dealing with data and structured information so we have the pieces of data which are scattered around we put all this data together make it a nice information for this we need a lot of visualizations right so we need visualization we need graph so summaries so visualization and graph summaries can be a very good value addition right so people who can you know create some very nice measures yeah of course you know if you know r or you know even python there are a lot of packages a lot of you know libraries that can be used to create some very interesting you know graphs and you know yeah images so visualization and graphical summaries can be a good value addition okay so um i think with this uh, i would probably uh, give you uh, some kind of a recommendation uh, see for example we have uh you know charted out you know papers that are already there if you guys are interested you know please um, you know take a snap of the slide 10 simple rules for landing on the right job after your phd or post doc right so 10 simple rules for approaching a new job 10 simple rules for getting ahead as computational biologist in academia and finally 10 simple rules for choosing between industry and academia okay so these are some of the recommendations that i would highly recommend you to uh, you know how to look you know uh, for probably taking the right direction okay so with this i will probably um, end my talk and yeah thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr koti for that wonderful presentation so uh, we do have a couple of queries that uh, i wish to uh, ask you so let me quickly share my screen All right. So, up first, um, the query that uh, the participant has shared is: Can you tell us about the role of machine learning in bioinformatics? How they are being used in industrial research versus academia? Yeah, I mean, machine learning in bioinformatics. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. So, for example, you know, uh, we have uh, a domain in bioinformatics called as natural language processing where we are looking at you know tons of publications that are already there in the database right so 
We are looking at specifically gene names. So these gene names may be associated with a certain phenotype. It might be you know, variations in this gene, which might be leading to a specific disease. It might be cancer, it might be Alzheimer's, it might be whatever it might be. So there are certain relationships that are already present in these publications, right? So using natural language processing and a lot of machine learning you know, algorithms, they are already trying to build these kinds of models, which can go into the database and it can bring all these relationships on the table, right? With a certain level of accuracy, right? So it's always percentage. So let's say 70% accurate or 80% accurate. So machine learning models can always be, you know, with respect to accuracy. Whereas, uh, um, yeah, I mean, in industry, yeah, of course, machine learning is used uh, uh, in large, uh, you know, let's say, for example, uh, uh, you know, you uh, you are um, looking at lot of variations in in uh, cancer, and uh, you are trying to just find a relationship between a certain SNP to a certain cancer. So this can only be done by you know machine learning, which algorithm, right? So you can write a script which can take ages to complete. But you know, machine learning algorithms can do this thing for, I mean, within a lesser time. That is what is being done, right? So industry and academia, so exactly. So academia, we are building the algorithms. In industry, we are using the same algorithm to find, you know, new relationships. Right? Yeah. And uh, the next question is, um, how can an undergraduate student prepare themselves for a career in bioinformatics in industrial research? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a very good question, right? So first thing is that, you know, start early, right? So start preparing early, right? So you need to, uh, yeah, so what I can say about bioinformatics is that you need to have a little bit of knowledge in mathematics and statistics. So it's, it's, it's a preliminary, I mean, prerequisite that we need to uh, know. So if you're in under, undergraduate, yes, you can probably, you know, initially you can start looking at some, uh, uh, you know, online courses, right? So from undergraduate, you can easily go into master's in bioinformatics, but if you are at the undergraduate level, you can already start, you know, there are a lot of, you know, databases. There are EMBL is offering a lot of free courses. Okay, so just the free courses, EMBL, just go into that, have a look at the, the uh, you know, uh, let's say subject headings, take something which is interesting and, you know, you can build up on that, right? And it might be, you know, genomics, it might be building algorithms, it might be, you know, proteomics, I mean, it might, I mean, there are, I mean, bioinformatics in itself is a vast domain, right? So it's dealing with all kinds of biological knowledge, right? So it might be protein structure analysis. So find your interest, start early. That is what I want to say. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lodi. And uh, there are a couple of questions, but one final question that uh, I want to ask you is, how do collaborations between academia and industry in bioinformatics work? And what are some benefits and challenges to such collaboration? Yeah, so... Um, in academia, right? So, for example, if you are an expert bioinformatician, so you are kind of a loner, right? So you have a lot of biologists who are, you know, revolving around you, and you are kind of, you know, trying to understand what a biologist wants to do, right? And then uh, the, the challenge is that, you know, uh, it's more monotonous in, in academia, right? So you are kind of, you know, looking into, let's say, whole genome sequence assembly, right? So you do doing this for a lot I mean, a lot of times, right? So you become expert in whole genome assembly. Whereas in um, industry, it's not the case, right? So you are handling multiple projects. You might be doing assembly, you might be doing reference-based variant calling, you might be doing, you know, transcriptomics. Similarly, your collaborations is also so dynamic, right? So your, your people are asking for you to do some assembly process. You know? People are asking you to find some variations. So in industry, I would say it's a much more dynamic, right? So collaborations can be much more dynamic. And the uh, the thing is that in industry, you learn a lot more compared to academics, right? So academics, you're more monotonous, you're more spe specialist into one specific domain or something like that. Okay. Yeah, 
you so much for that uh, wonderful insight. And uh, we do have a couple of queries, but due to time limitation, I'll be uh, emailing them to you. Okay? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pati, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, with that, and with that, let us move on to the next part of uh, today's session, um, which is a practical hands-on session that focuses on into the omics world, understanding omics data analysis. And to start with the session, we'll be passing on the stage to Ms. Nalika Ray, who has completed a master's in bind math from Punjab University. Her interest lies in areas of omics research, data science, computer aid drug discovery, and pharmacogenetics. Presently, she is also responsible for developing the curriculum of the training programs and oversees the participants' progress while working together on their research quest. So with that brief introduction, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Shrigani. So today I wanted to discuss about different omics fields, which includes genomics, transcriptomics, metagenomics. First, we'll discuss about the fields, what it is all about, and then what different types of analysis can we perform on it. And then we'll do some hands-on where we'll extract some data from the public repositories and then run some pipelines on the DBioInfo platform to see what type of results we get and how we can interpret the results. But before we do that, I uh, would just take you through some of the videos so that we can and learn more about the fields. And before starting with omics for, uh, fields, let's discuss about bioinformatics because um, some of you are also new to the field bioinformatics. So we'll first discuss about what the field bioinformatics is all about and then dive into genomics, transcriptomics, and metagenomics. So at omics logic, we follow a hybrid approach where we tend to share some session recordings that the participants can watch because we understand that the participants um, are preoccupied with their already going tasks in hand, if they are professors or researchers or students. So I just wanted to give you a taste of what these uh, pre-recorded sessions look like that you can watch. Though what I'm going to show you today is just a very brief overview of what this session could look like. That's just a very brief overview of five to 10 minutes about the field. Though the training session, it's um, around an hour or so. So let's get started. We'll begin with uh, the field in bioinformatics, and then we look at some resources that we can leverage on the Omics Logic Learn portal to learn about the field bioinformatics, and then we'll take up the Omics field. Uh, Srimari, can you just confirm if uh, the voice is audible or not from the video? I'll just start the video. Let me know in the chat, please. Okay, thank you. Omics Logic is an online portal yes, to discuss the audio is perfectly audible. labyrinth of biological data. It's an online community for top researchers and professionals in bioinformatics to supply universities and other organizations with online courses certifications, and practical case studies in biomedical data analysis. Spanning the journey of a novice to develop skills and stand out from the crowd, we provide access to asynchronous resources, specialized training, mentorship, and big data infrastructure. As a result, students learn about meaningful application of computational skills to relevant data sets in their chosen domain. In this way, we address the pressing challenge that slows down the effective analysis of large data sets produced in research and biotechnology industry. We address the topic of software complexity, the need for big data processing power, access to tested methods by experts in the field, exposure to real world challenges, and training for faculty to stay updated even beyond their area of expertise. To do so, we first address the topic of materials for courses that are usually developed in-house, taught sporadically, and are rarely updated. So we opened up the Omics Logic portal to a dynamic community that will introduce new materials and keep them up to date with the newest technology all the time. Secondly, these courses have to be organized. And because the challenge is to combine several different topics together, the flow and transitions between subjects has to be improved. This is addressed at Omics Logic through introductory materials 
being woven throughout the courses. Finally, let's talk about systematization. These topics are extremely complex, so there's a need to know that someone is stuck and needs help or allow another one to run forward. And so to address this, Omics Logic uses standardized modules and interactive sessions that begin with mastering terminology and concepts to then implementing these concepts with real data sets in a case study approach. So the portal brings community-driven experience to anyone to learn how to analyze biological data, build up their profile to be ready for research, industry, or entrepreneurship using biotechnology and big data. The features are designed to make this process seamless for individual users, a class, or a whole institution. The Omics Logic portal gives students options for analyzing any data, codependent or independent paths. These datasets and associated publications can be used in several ways. You can learn bioinformatics without any coding at all. For that, in each project, we explain the analysis pipelines on the user-friendly tBioInfo platform for big data analysis. You can also learn the scripts behind many of the steps, learning to wrangle, clean, visualize, and analyze data in popular languages like R and Python in order to create your own analyses. Finally, you can hear about the projects and the research applications in our mentor-guided programs, where experts share their experience and support research projects developed by you. So this is not just a portal with online courses or MOOCs. This is a community where you can see achievements, progress, certification, and explore projects developed by students. Having access to big data analysis tools with interactive outputs and a logical flow helps students master and understand complex bioinformatics processes designed by experts and produce outputs that are both intuitive and biologically interpretable. In addition, students can learn, practice, solve computational problems, and discover opportunities as they go through intuitive learning using our coding console with predefined answers that can be obtained by manipulating the code. Having expert designed training opportunities, students can design job ready skills and find job opportunities in the academia, industry, as an intern, or even by finding a short term project. This approach allows any student to develop a profile that stands out. Onyx Logic was designed in collaboration with top universities, and as a result, we have a team of experts that are guiding the development of the necessary resources managed by a team that is distributed across several locations like North America, India, and Africa. In each one of these locations, we have established partnerships with top institutions that represent community colleges, universities, high schools, and organizations that support biomedical research. All right, so that was about the field bioinformatics and how can the portal be helpful to you to learn the skill set. So as you all know, this field is an interdiscipl uh, interdisciplinary field that combines biology, computer science, maths, and statistics to develop and also apply the tools and the algorithms to process, analyze, and interpret biological data. So the goal of bioinformatics is to extract the useful information and the, no and the knowledge from the massive amount of biological data that is generated through different high throughput experimental technologies. Now, to get started with this understanding of bioinformatics, the best course that you can pick up is the introduction to bioinformatics. So all you need to do is just go to the courses tab and type here bioinformatics or an introduction to bioinformatics. This is the first course that I want to showcase to you. And the second one, is a course that we have designed with LBRN that is for biomolecular data analysis. Yeah, so in the first course, that is introduction to bioinformatics, 
this course includes lessons, several different lessons. In all of the courses that I'll show you today, in every course, you have different lessons, different number of lessons, in which you have a mix of uh, concepts in the form of uh, texts, videos, and also we have linked up important research publications that you can refer to and a mix of assignments and quizzes to ensure that you have gone through the concepts well and understand them to proceed ahead. So in this first uh, lesson, you, will, you would be introduced to big data. What are the opportunities and limitations of working with big data? What is data-driven discovery? And also uh, a real-life example in healthcare followed by a quiz. And in the second lesson, you will learn about the role of bioinformatics in healthcare. So we all know that bioinformatics is an emerging field because of the exponential growth of the data in these recent years and the development of these technologies, high throughput experimental technologies has enabled the scientists to generate vast amounts of data in really short amount of time. So it becomes very important for us to understand how we can explore this data and what the role of bioinformatics could be in healthcare. So this specific lesson would help you understand the power of personalized healthcare through uh, bioinformatics tools, and then learn more about molecular diagnostics and also the treatment development. So the understanding that you get through exploring the different types of data, how you can uh, use that data to design a better therapeutic approach. And in the third lesson, you will learn about translational bioinformatics. So with an understanding of bioinformatics that plays a very critical role in many areas of biological research, which includes genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and also systems biology, it is very important to understand how the tools could be used to analyze DNA sequences, identify genes, and predict their functions. It also, it could also be used to compare different genomes and then identify genetic variations and then contribute to disease susceptibility or drug resistance. The applications are uh, diverse and also a lot to mention. So in this specific uh, lesson, you will learn about the role of bioinformatics in environmental science, in agriculture, and in several other areas. So that was about how you can get started with an introduction to the field bioinformatics. With that, I wanted to know how many of you are from uh, a different field than bioinformatics. It could be biotechnology, microbiology, or biochemistry. And how many of you are really from the field of bioinformatics? If you are from a different field and you want to get started, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat. You can also unmute yourself. Let's try to make this session more interactive so that we can address your questions and uh, guide you how you can get started with the learning of bioinformatics. I'm waiting for, for answers. You can put in the chat or maybe unmute yourself. You can also raise your hand. Oh, are the messages going directly to the co-host? Yes, I can see one raised hand. Hi, Michael. You can unmute yourself. Uh, Shri Gauri, uh, the participants have the, yeah, they have the permission. Yes, yeah, Michael. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, I mean, microbiology graduates from Covenant University in Nigeria. So I'm looking into getting a graduate degree in bioinformatics. And uh, I have some programming experience in different program language and I feel I'll be able to kind of explore this field very well. But my question is, most of the application portal I've checked, I think uh, bioinformatics uh, requirements uh, mainly requires, uh, I think a couple of degree in uh, a background in computer science and uh, maybe mathematics or something like that. So I'm not sure if I could go into that field because of some requirements uh, I can meet. 
I hope you're able yeah, to speak so, question. Okay. Yeah, so you basically want to know about uh, the different types of things that are important for you to have the knowledge about to proceed ahead, right? In your career. Yep. Yes. All right. So uh, as uh, Dr. Prasanna also mentioned in the previous session, that uh, to advance in the field of bioinformatics, it's very important for you to have the knowledge about uh, different tools about of bioinformatics, uh, statistical methodologies, and also a programming language like either R or Python. So I would showcase you some resources that you can go through. And also when you say data science, it includes learning about machine learning, how machine learning could be used where you have different types of analysis, unsupervised or supervised analysis that you can use for exploring data, correct? So as you yep. come from a non-bioinformatics field, you can definitely get started with the first course introduction to bioinformatics and then pick up one of the RNA-seq um, fields to learn the analysis. It could be genomics or it could be transcriptomics or it could be metagenomics. So it, it would be good if you have an expertise in one of these omics uh, fields. And uh, right, it's not important to have an expertise in all of the omics fields analysis. It's good to have the expertise of one of, of the fields as well. And um, then I think you would be a very um good package, a, a power-packed resource for the companies where you proceed ahead with in your career. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yes. So uh, for Alice, I will take you through uh, the programming and data science course that you can go through. One of the questions that I uh, hear a lot from uh, different participants, uh, either students, bachelor's, master's, or also college students, and sometimes PhD scholars, is that when they have to begin with data science or data analytics, or let's say programming languages like R and Python, you will get various resources to learn about the basic computing languages, like what are data structures or what are classes, functions, and like the basic computing language uh, part that a person should know about what are classes, functions in different libraries and packages. But when it comes to bioinformatics, there are some specific sets of libraries and packages that are very required for you to know about. There are specific statistical tests for different types of analysis that you should know about. And uh, your understanding gets limited to these different resources because you don't really know what resources you can leverage. So right after bioinformatics, I'll just show you some R and Python coursework for biomedical data research. R and Python specific for biomedical data research that you can uh, get your hands on. All right. So Alice, uh, just uh, hold on and uh, I'll just take you through these resources that you can learn from. So the second course that I wanted to take you through uh, along with introduction to bioinformatics is the biomolecular data, uh, biomolecular data analysis course, where we have put together four different modules. These four different modules are specifically hands-on based modules, where we are trying to make you understand how you can use, what are the different types of databases, repositories, first of all. So there are uh, two different types of databases, primary or secondary databases, what type of information is stored there, how you can extract that, how you can work with it. And then you have a lot of exercises as well that you have to uh, practice and answer to, to proceed ahead. So going through these uh, four modules will really help you get a good understanding of the field bioinformatics and at least give you a good start. Thank you, Shri Gauri. Shri Gauri, I share the link in the chat. So if you're a beginner, you can go ahead. If you don't have the link, say, let's say uh, sometime later you want to explore these courses, it's very easy to just go to the courses tab and type in the search to get the specific course. Okay, so that was about introduction to bioinformatics and uh, the biomolecular data analysis course that I showed you. 
Now, there are many people who get introduced to the field bioinformatics and also know about the different omics fields, be it genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metagenomics. In our academics, we are mostly introduced to the fields genomics and proteomics. Uh, the degrees I have heard about and gone through the uh, syllabus of, I've seen genomics and proteomics integrated there. But what lacks is that you definitely get a good conceptual understanding of genomics and proteomics. But when it comes to practical hands-on, like how you have to deal with genomic data, what type of genome, like what the genomic data looks like, and then how do you have to clean the data or process or pre-process the data and then analyze uh, different types of uh, possible analysis and then interpret the results. That specific understanding is missing. You would be taught about different tools or databases that hey, you have different fields that you can explore data from, but how to really do that, that understanding is missing. And to fill that gap, I want to take you through this introductory coursework where you can get an understanding of what these different omics uh, field includes. And when I uh, say omics, I'm collectively referring to genomics, transcriptomics, and metagenomics, so don't get confused. Now, this is the first thing to get started on how different types of data looks like for all these different omics fields. You can go through bytes and molecules. Also, this course will help you understand which specific field do you want to focus on? So one of the questions is that you know about these different fields, but you're confused which field you want to specialize in. So you can go through bytes and molecules where you will learn about these different types of fields. Obviously not uh, an advanced learning or an in-depth knowledge, but an introduction to an extent that you are able to understand which field you would like to specialize in, all right? So you have these introductory lessons on different omics fields. That is one thing that you, that you can go through and learn from. And uh, the second set of lessons that you'll find in bytes and molecules include research specialization tracks. Now, what are these research specialization tracks? So there are different research areas in which you can apply the skill set or the knowledge that you gain for a specific type of data analysis. Now, these research specialization tracks could be uh, infectious diseases or oncology or precision medicine or space omics or metabolic disorders, right? So there are different tracks where you can uh, explore these different types of data and um, carry out your research. Now, what are these tracks and what type of research is possible? Uh, we have also added some introductory lessons for you to understand about these different specialization tracks, like precision medicine or infectious diseases. A space omics is one of the most emerging fields. So you can go through and explore that. All right. And uh, for those who are new to the field bioinformatics or new to the field of computing languages like R and Python, you can again go through the lessons here to just get an understanding of what both of these computing languages look like. And uh, one uh, suggestion for those who are uh, newbies, pick one language at a time. Don't try to gain expertise in R and Python simultaneously because many of you do that and then you face some problems. So it's better to pick up one language, get an expertise in one language first and then take up the other one. All right, so now we discussed about uh, bioinformatics and how you can go through these different omics fields and research specialization tracks and pick the one that you want to work on. Now let us try to understand what the field genomics is all about and what type of analysis uh, could be done in this field. Welcome back to Omics Logic where we simplify bioinformatics and help make omics data analysis logical. In this short video, we will discuss genomics. What is genomic data? How is it organized, analyzed, and interpreted to be such a powerful resource in the hands of clinicians, researchers, and entrepreneurs that are reading the DNA code to battle cancer, fight off infectious diseases, and even 
solve crimes. Let's start by reviewing some of the fundamentals of genomics. Just like a book, the DNA code is organized. Letters form sentences, sentences form paragraphs, paragraphs are organized into chapters. Knowing how to read this code can help us decipher the full story about who we are and look into our history. Understanding how we are connected to other living things around us, what makes us who we are, and how can we explain some of the differences as well as diseases that we experience. DNA contains instructions for various functions a cell must perform to grow and maintain life. Therefore, DNA contains both actively needed recipes and all kinds of other instructions that need to be stored but not necessarily used all the time. Today, there are several competing human gene databases with many thousands of differences among them. And although the number of protein coding genes has gradually converged, the number of other gene types has exploded. The omics technologies are used to explore the roles, relationships, and actions of the various types of molecules that make up the cell of an organism. Together, these are referred to as systems biology. Many types of omics data can be generated using various technologies. One of them is called next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing. The data from high throughput sequencing can be used to characterize detailed genomic variants, epigenomic regulation, as well as gene and isoform expression. In this part, we are going to be talking about genomics. Genomics refers to the structure, function, evolution, and the sequence of DNA. A specific type of variation can lead to harmful results. For example, a change in function that is harmful. This is called a mutation. Most single nucleotide changes are found outside of the coding regions. So these are non-coding variants and have no impact on the biological function of a protein or called silent, though they may affect gene expression or splicing. However, variants found within the coding region may code for functional changes in amino acid structure called missense or predict premature protein truncation, nonsense and thus may have a possible direct association with disease. One example of a non-synonymous mutation that is associated with a phenotype change but not disease is a mutation in the FGFS gene that causes extremely long hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes in people. Depending on the type of sequencing method, FASTQ files can be quite large, sometimes over several gigabytes in size per file. To analyze such raw data, many different tools for genomic data analysis are used. These include sequence alignment of reads and full sequences, analysis of relationships between sequences and their evolutionary divergence, measurement of gene expression, relationships between sequences and structures, as well as somatic and germline variant calling methods. The tBioInfo is an example of a big data platform developed for analysis and integration of such data. It can be used to perform all of these analyses and many others using an intuitive and user-friendly interface. One of the major objectives of genomics is linked to sequence alignment. Sequence alignment can refer to two types of alignment. To learn more about these analysis methods and their applications in various project examples, you can complete the genomics course series. This series will include a more expanded overview of key concepts, principles, and examples of genomic data analysis. All right, so that was about the field genomics, a very brief overview of what the field is all about. Now, I would like to show you the course on genomics that we take you through uh, the intensive uh, training program and also the tBioInfo platform where we could perform different types of areas of analysis and we'll try to learn what type of analysis is possible. Okay, so we'll now type in the search bar genomics and when we do that we would get this head of course three genomics and there are several lessons listed out here now what is the series of these lessons like what will you learn in them so the first thing is that uh, you need to understand is what are the different types of platforms technologies and methodologies that could be used to sequence genomic data all right 
and then how you can extract the data from public repositories. If you are, you are a researcher who has the data uh, being generated in your own lab, then you obviously have the access to the data. But if you are one of those who want to learn what type of uh, data uh, is available and what type of analysis would be possible, then there are uh, several different repositories that you can refer to. One of them is BioProject. So you go to BioProject, NCBI BioProject, where you can type in about a particular type of condition that you are uh, interested to explore. So let me write breast cancer and TP53 gene. Now, uh, we have a case study on the portal where we have tried to understand what other different types of mutations uh, that are present in the TP53 gene that cause breast cancer and that uh, could be pathogenic or uh, harmful. So when you look at the specific variants or uh, that could be present in a gene for causing the disease, the next step after that is once you have the variants in hand, you want to understand if they are pathogenic, benign, harmful, harmless. So we'll get to that in just uh, through the hands-on in just a minute. All right, so I've just written a specific query in the search bar and I get specific hits that I could go through and then see what type of uh, analysis I would like to do. So just opening up the first hit just for an idea. If I do that, what I can see here is about this specific data that is available. And uh, how was it collected? What other groups does it have? I can click on the total SRA experiments. Here we have 355 samples, and you will get the information about each one of these samples here then. All right. Now, if you click on one of these samples, you will then know. Uh, what the sample information is all about. There is a problem with my uh, browser. I'll open this in Microsoft Edge so that it is clear to you. Okay, now when you open this, you can learn more about the specific type of sample that you have clicked on. You will get to know about uh, the sample source and how, where, through which specific study was it submitted. And then you get to know if it was single and or parent. And then if you want to download the FASTQ files or the FASTF files directly, you can simply click on the sample and then get the access to the FASTA or the FASTQ files and uh, also look at the read left. All right. So now going back to Chrome. Okay. So that was about how you can look at a specific type of sample. Now, the best thing about the server is on the server, you have these different areas of analysis, transcriptomics, genomics, metagenomics, single cell, and then uh, you also have epigenomics here. And uh, you can also perform machine learning analysis. Now, when you want to process a genomic data analysis pipeline, all you need to do is just put this session number list of the um, SRA files that you have here, and the server will automatically pick up the faster or the fast files for further analysis. All right, so you go here, you just uh, take up the run info file, and uh, then you can proceed with the pipeline. I'll just proceed one of the pipelines right now to show you what type of uh, results do you get, and first of all, what a pipeline looks like. So this is a run info file that you can download from here. And here you have the session list and more in information about each one of these reads. What uh, is the release date, load date, spots, number of bases, average length, size, all the details about that specific read, okay? So let's go to the tbioinfo platform now. There are two main pipelines for genomic data analysis. One is this mutation variant calling pipeline where you can um, process your FASTR, FASTQ files or run info file and get a VCF file and annotate that. So this specific variant calling pipeline will help you look at specific variants and then annotate them to understand if they were pathogenic or not. And the second type of pipeline that you have is the phylogenetic analysis pipeline where you can uh, 
take the FASTA files or the FASTQ files of different organisms and try to understand the evolutionary trends maybe or carry out a haplotype analysis or look at these uh, variants and try to understand which organisms are close enough um, to evolution. All right. So giving you uh, a brief overview of one of these pipelines, I'll take you through the breast cancer mutation variant calling pipeline. I clicked on the drop down button and then I get these demo pipelines that I can run. So uh, you can go through these demo pipelines if you have an account on the server. To get an account on the server, you just need to sign up on the Omics Logic Learn portal and within 24 hours, you will get your credentials for the server as well. You can log in and see uh, what type of pipelines are there and then run these demo pipelines to explore. So in a pipeline, you have these different algorithms for different steps of analysis. And you can select these different algorithms, sets of different algorithms to process something. So pipeline is where you just select these different types of tools and you have your raw file and you want to have your results, which you can analyze, all right? So here I would be following these steps where I start the pipeline. I use an alg algorithm as Trimomatic. So if you're aware that in the sequencing process, adapters are generally added. So to remove those adapters, we use Trimomatic. And once we have the reads without adapters, I map those reads on the reference genome using uh, Butai 2 algorithm. I also have uh, other algorithm options that I can use. Here I use Butai 2. And then I select visualization. So this is basically to visualize the results on JBrowse that is integrated on the tbioinfo platform. And to call the variants, I have uh, a lot of options here. I use mutect2 and then click on annotation to annotate my results and then simply end the pipeline. So you see how easy it is. You just need to upload the data. And while uploading the data, you have to uh, select what type of data it is, single and pair, and what type of data you are uploading, FASTA file, FASTQ file, or SAM or BAM file, or a VCF file directly, and then choose a variant calling algorithm, and then finally annotate your results. So uh, because of this time constraint, I have uh, processed a demo pipeline so that I get the, re the results when I process the pipeline. But if you process your own pipeline, it would take few minutes to few hours based on the file size and obviously the sample numbers. Now I'll click on J Browse. Meanwhile, it opens. Let's see what the mapping stats file has for us. And you also get the VCF file here that you can download and um, use this VCF file for further analysis on other tools and uh, databases too. Now, in the mapping stats, you will get to know how well the read aligned to the reference genome with a overall alignment rate. That is approximately maybe 99%, 98 for uh, one of them though, two of them. So approximately 99% for all, all of the reads, and that is a good alignment rate. Now, if I go to J browse, uh, this is a very interesting interface where I will first of all select the reference genome that I want to map my reads on. And I have these samples here with different reads that I can map on my reference genome. And then I have the GFF file that will help me annotate the genomic regions and uh, the VCF file. Now I am interested in TP53 gene. So I just type TP53 and you might get errors, no worries. You, you can simply reload the session. Let me cross this. Now I can see the TP53 gene here and I get a list of variants here that I can look at. Now, if I click on a specific variant, I can see, I can get the information of the variant too. I close this. It's taking a little bit time to load, no problem. So this is how the reads align on the reference genome. Here in the reference genome, you have both the strand information, three prime to five prime and five prime to three prime. And zoom out a bit. 
And if I click on a specific variant, I'll get to know the chromosome position and what type of variation it is and uh, uh, what the specific variant or what the specific change is. Right. So that is about the variant calling pipeline. And uh, now let's go back to understand what the field transcriptomics is all about. Get solving in the cloud with the Google Cloud free program. As a new user, you'll get $300 in free credits for the first The central dogma of molecular biology dictates the flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA and then to protein. In order to create proteins from these genes, RNA copies are made in the nucleus and will be subsequently transported into the cytosol, where proteins are built based on their sequences. In other words, for protein coding genes, RNA is made from DNA during a process called transcription, and protein is made from RNA during translation. There are different methods available for detecting and quantifying gene expression. Reverse transcription PCR, or RT-PCR, amplifies DNA based on two primer sequences framing the section of interest. Since PCR amplifies DNA and not RNA, RNA is first converted back to DNA prior to amplification. This is done via a process called reverse transcription. In nature, this process is carried out by retroviruses. In northern blotting, an RNA sample is digested into fragments that are separated by size in a gel using electrophoresis. They are then transferred to a membrane that can be probed to test for the presence of a hypothesized RNA transcript. Microarrays, like northern blots, are hybridization-based, but in contrast to a northern blot, a microarray yields highly detailed information about the individual genes that have been transcribed. These signals are then detected, quantified, and used to create a digital image of the array. Finally, the digital image is used to identify the transcribed genes. Protein coding genes in genomic DNA contain large stretches of non-coding sequences called introns that are spliced out of the RNA transcript by an enzymatic complex called the spliceosome before it is passed to the ribosome for translation. The parts of the gene that remain in the mature, processed mRNA transcript are called exons. These are the parts that encode the amino acid sequences and will be used in protein production. Next generation sequencing technology allows for advanced studies of gene expression because it captures a snapshot of the whole transcriptome rather than a predetermined subset of genes. Okay, so we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. And you have the participants uh, yourself in the chat box. And I'm also curious to know, do you have any specific research interest within bioinformatics? Uh, Aishi says uh, she wants to do metagenomics. Uh, Shrikhani, isn't the screen visible with the audio? Uh, right now, the screen just stops. Was it uh, audible before? Yes, it was audible. All right. Converted into cDNA that is then sheared and placed into a flow cell. Inside the flow cell, cDNA fragments are amplified using bridge PCR amplification, and the flow cell is then inserted into the sequencer. This machine uses image analysis to capture each letter in the flow cell fragments by analyzing visual patterns and then converting them into a sequence of letters. Typically, NGS reads are between 30 and 300 base pairs long. They consist of a series of letters T, C, G, and A. Recall that a typical RNA-seq pipeline includes three main steps, pre-processing, mapping, and quantification. Pre-processing is needed to clean up our data by removing the adapters, trimming some of the reads, and removing the PCR duplicates. This is important because PCR amplification is not uniform across all reads. Then, we take the cleaned up read sequences to map them onto a reference, using a FASTA file for sequences of the genome and GTF files for annotation. Based on the quality of annotation, we can use various strategies for mapping. Once this step is complete, we have to quantify expression levels and give each expressed element a number. 
Okay, so when we talk about a transcriptomic uh, study, there are three major steps that are involved in the study. The first one is pre-processing, and then you have mapping, and then you have quantification of uh, the reads that align to a specific region on the reference genome. And after that, you might want to look at the differentially expressed genes by comparing the expression levels between two groups of interest. I'm monitoring the chat. Let me know uh, what are your research. Okay, sorry. All right. So once you have the reads aligned on the reference genome and then you quantify the expression levels, after that, you can perform differential expression to understand uh, what the differentially expressed genes could look like and then know in uh, which pathways these genes are involved or which pathways these genes affect and which further other genes uh, are in the network. All right, so I'll take you to the transcriptomic section now. I have 10 minutes with me, so I'll take you to the transcriptomic section real quickly. And maybe we can uh, look at the uh, resources that you can refer to for transcriptomics and metagenomics. So here is the transcriptomic bulk RNA-seq section where you can pre-process the reads and then get a quantified gene expression table on which you can perform differential expression and pathway annotation. But if you have a gene expression table on, on which you want to further carry out your analysis for differential expression and annotation of the pathways, you can further uh, uh, go through or process this pipeline here on differential expression. All right, now let's click on the bulk RNA-seq section. And here, let's go to the PDX project, breast cancer pipeline. So to get started, I click on the start button. And then Trimomatic to trim off the adapters. PCR clean, I use to remove the duplicate reads that um, get added during the PCR process. Now for mapping, I have two options, either to map on a genome using these tools or map on transcripts using these tools. I'll map it up on transcript using Botai 2T, which will map the reads on the reference uh, transcript on. And then I'll quantify the gene expression table. I have different options to that, Sailfish, HTC, or RSEM. I use RSEM. And then I'll click on DSEC2 because I also want to look at the set of differentially expressed genes. And then I'll end the pipeline. So just to give you a brief overview of what this pipeline is all about, what type of data I have uploaded here. So I have uh, two different types of groups here, two different types of breast cancer. One group is uh, estrogen receptor positive type of breast cancer. Another one is triple negative breast cancer samples. And I want to understand that what are the differentially expressed genes and what are their levels, uh, the genes with abnormal expression level, when, when I compare the expression levels of both of these two groups of genes and uh, then get a list of these genes. For this pipeline, just get to know what the differentially expressed genes are. Now, I get uh, several results here in the uh, visualization option. I just quickly open them up. Meanwhile, it loads. I'll show you what a gene expression table looks like. So I get here different uh, files. I, expression isoform expression genes. Now, one gene could um, have different variants of genes. One gene could splice out through the alternative splicing process and could form different parts of genes that could further express, right? So if you want to look at the isoforms that are formed from one set of gene, uh, then the expression table that you get is the isoform expression table. And the gene expression table would have the information of all the exonic regions uh, included in that specific gene. Now, if I click on the expression genes txt, I'll get the gene expression table here. I'll, I'll prefer to open it up um, on Excel. We'll share the recording of the session with you. You can take this time out and uh, go through some of the demo pipelines and see what results you get and also explore the results yourself. So in the gene expression table, in the first column, you have a list of uh, gene IDs 
ensemble IDs. You could also have gene symbols in some of the uh, results. And uh, in the first uh, column, you have the samples. So in the first group, you have the ER uh, positive samples that I mentioned. And in the second group, you have the triple negative samples. Okay. Now, in this specific gene expression table, you get, you get to know if this is one of the samples. Then in this sample, what was the expression level for these different genes? And uh, in total, we have 4,244 genes here. 4,243 rather. The first column is the information of the samples. And from this set of genes, you want to exclude uh, the genes with uh, zero or less expression levels and then want to just consider or look at the genes with abnormal expression levels. So you get the result, that specific result from the algorithm of DSEC that is used for differential expression. And if I open the differential expression pipeline here, then pipeline result here, then you can see what information do we have inside the pipeline. Now, if I open the DSEC file here, I can see that now every gene, uh, every gene ID has a gene symbol and the gene name. And also some statistical tests were evaluated for these specific um, types of genes here. All right. So I then have to put some filter on these specific types of genes. And then after putting up that filter, I'll get to know what the differentially expressed genes look like. Okay, so I won't be overwhelming you a lot right now. So let's quick, quickly see what type of results do we get in the dashboard and the visualization here. So we can look at a volcano plot here. And in the volcano plot, we again have these statistical tests. What are these statistical tests? Why am I so much interested to look at the log to fold change in pH adjusted value? And uh, how can we infer or interpret which uh, is what spe which specific gene is differentially expressed by filtering out um, the genes through these different statistical tests? So this is a volcano plot. And here, this is a gene EGFR that um, has 12 times more its expression level than the normal expression level and is differentially expressed here, all right? So like this from the volcano plot, you can get to know which genes are differentially expressed and a heat map has a range here and shows you which genes um, have what type of expression levels. And uh, you have single uh, volcano plot and heat maps so that you can explore a box plot for the gene expression level of all the samples and a box plot for individual uh, sample expression here. And a multi-QC report that is actually towards the very beginning in the visualization where you can know what is the uh, read quality of the reads in your samples. Okay, so that was about transcriptomics. Now, very quickly taking you through the resources for transcriptomics and metagenomics, I think we uh, have reached the time of the next session. So for... Um, Metagenomics, I'll definitely share some resources with you that you can go through uh, with the symposium recording. And for transcriptomics, you can explore course five on transcriptomics. And then for metagenomics, you have a specific course. The conceptual understanding here remains the same about the sequencing technologies, what type of data you get, what, did, what are the different data formats, how do you... Um, uh, clean this data, how do you pre-process the pipelines and then clean this data? And then how do you uh, perform different types of analysis? What are the different statistical tests that you can um, use and what these tests mean, what uh, filters or what parameters to apply? Then how do you interpret your result? So in that sequence, you will learn everything about a specific type of study. And then here comes the metagenomics coursework. And for those who want to get started with R and Python, specifically for biomedical data research, you can type in the chat R and Python. Here you will find two courses for R and two for Python. The first one is for high schoolers uh, with just a beginner level sort of understanding. So I prefer you go through uh, the second course works if you're not from a high school. 
and uh, it would help you understand uh, from the very basics how to uh, install R and then how to import data, what are the different libraries and packages, why are they used, what type of visualization or uh, what type of plots can you create, box plots, heat maps, CG plots, volcano plots, different types of visualizations that you uh, that you can create to uh, extract out or visualize the patterns from your data, and then how to perform dimensionality reduction, visualize your data using different techniques, how to perform different statistical tests, and some analysis, differential expression or uh, clustering classification that is unsupervised and supervised analysis. And in Python, we have uh, more machine learning methods, machine learning lessons that we can explore. So that was about R and Python resources that you can explore. And with that, now, as we have reached the next session time, I'll just uh, stop sharing and pass over the stage to Sri Gauri. Thank you, everyone. I can see some uh, questions in the chat. I will just uh, take up those questions. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Nalika, for that wonderful session. And uh, with that, uh, we have the next session that is focused on medical genetics and genomics. And I'm sure that several participants are there who are interested in this field and uh, will be finding this session helpful. So to start with this session, please join me in inviting Ms. Anuja Mishra. She is a, a bioinformatics specialist at Premark Life Sciences, and she will be discussing on the topic overview of American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics Guidelines. So with that, I would like to pass on the stage to Ms. Anuja Mishra. Yes, so thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm just sharing my screen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. So can you confirm if my slides are visible? Uh, yes, yes, it is visible. Okay. Yes. So first of all, good evening, everyone. My name is Anuja Mishra, and I'm currently working as bioinformatics specialist in Prima's Life Sciences. So thanks for the given chance, and without wasting any time, we'll move ahead. So as you see, here is our today's agenda. There we'll be looking overview of the ACMG classification, some terminologies and nomenclature, some classification rules, and one of the case study. So when we talk about ACMG, what exactly ACMG is? So in 2015, ACMG, that is American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, along with the Association for the Molecular Pathology, has published some guidelines, which is an important resource for doing the variant classification. So basically, they have uh, developed some primary guidelines. And after that, there have been multiple clarifications in the interpretations. And there are multiple papers also published, which says, how do we use these rules? So just to set a background, in 2015, a work group was set up, which included clinical lab directors, some clinicians, members of ACMG, AMP, and CAP members. So they had a goal to develop some terminology, which can be used for classifying the variants so that all the labs can use those terminology and report the variants in a particular and similar way. So for that, what they did, they have sent surveys to around hundreds of sequencing laboratories. And after multiple rounds of discussion, they arrived at some points. Uh, basically, there were two major points involved in that. So the first point was that the variant should be reported in a five-tier terminology system so that the terms included for variant reporting will be a pathogenic a likely pathogenic, uncertain significance, that is VUS. There will be a likely benign and benign. And in the first go, the work group will be only focusing on the Mendelian and mitochondrial variants. So these were the basic two points which was covered in that uh, discussion and collaborations. So when we talk about pathogenic and likely pathogenic, what these terms actually mean? So basically, the pathogenic variants are those variants which are responsible for causing any kind of disease. And also, there is an ample scientific researches and evidences behind that, which supports an association between the uh, disease and the gene variant. 
but in case of likely pathogenic if you see the likely doesn't have any definite uh, definition involved but when we say likely pathogenic that means it is giving around 90% certainty that the variant is probably causing a disease but yet there is no sufficient uh, evidences available when we say vus that is variant of uncertain significance that means there are not enough evidences available so that the variant can be classified as a pathogenic or the benign and that's why it is falling into criteria vus and in that cases we are not definite and we do not know that the variant is responsible for causing any particular disease or is involved in a, any development of that disease as there is a likely pathogenic with 90% certainty there is a likely benign with 90% certainty that the variant is probably not responsible for causing any disease but again there are not enough evidences available so hence we are giving it a term as a likely benign and when we say benign that means it is very definite that the variant is not going to cause any disease and behind that there are multiple researches literatures and evidences available which are showing this kind of things so when actually these rules are applied for if you see there are multiple different levels or ways to classify any kind of variant and these rules are basically designed for mendelian diseases or maybe germline variants or if you consider a variants with high penetrance and also for small snvs and the indels there are separately all together different guidelines for cnvs and large insertions and deletions so these are the four which you need to focus more on with respect to nomenclature acmg has also designed a kind of uh, standardized criteria or set of rules in the way a variant can be reported and that is maintained by this group which is called as hgvs the full form is human genome variation society so one of the example is if we are reporting any variant either it is present in a genomic location or either you are reporting its cdna change or if you are going to report the protein change it should contain some suffixes before that so example if you are going to report a genomic sequence it should start with g dot if you are going to report a cdna change it should be starting with c dot if it is a protein change then it will be a p dot and for the mitochondrial variants it should be m dot so this is the link which i have given for hgvs and this is one of the example taken from that site so if you are reporting this variant you see there is a nomenclature being followed here g dot 123 a to g so g dot is representing the genomic location 123 is the nucleotide position a is the reference allele the greater than symbol say that it is a substitution and finally the g is the substituted nucleotide so you can go back to the link and you can explore more on these things then with respect to literature and databases uh, again acmg has also given some important points when considering the databases because you are going to use these databases or literature information for providing more evidences and for the classifying the variants in that cases acmg says that whenever you are going to use any kind of information you have to use with some caution and you have to take into consideration some points in that case if you are using a database then you have to understand whether the database is having enough of control set or not or if there was any family related details involved or not and also it is uh, emphasizing on understanding the points whether the database is frequently updated or not if you are going to use any database then definitely you need to check what version you are currently using and how frequently the database is used and updated in the background and also you can see whether the database and the information which you are going to use contain some of the genomic information or not are they giving any transcript based information and the variant which is already reported in the database have they given any kind of quality stats which they have used for assessing the variant quality and what was the source being used for the variant to be reported into that databases so all these points when you consider and then you take a literature and databases into your uh, as an evidence for reporting the variant then only you can say that okay with uh, higher confidence you can report that variant 
so in the paper if you go back to the acmg they have given a list of some of the databases that can be used for doing the population based studies or maybe to understand the gene disease association or for performing the genome sequence analysis and to download some of the genomes so there is a big list which you can go and explore this is just the name of the databases and the functions which is it is going to do So again, I wanted to uh, give one more detail about the ClinGen. So basically, it is a NIH-funded resource that defines the clinical relevance of the genes and the variants. Uh, so it is mostly used in the precision medicine and research purposes. So they contains all the original guidelines with some of the adjustments and clarifications done based on the original guidelines which was which were given by the ACMG, and they maintain it very nicely. so that it is very handy and very useful for all the clinical laboratories to follow and so that all the labs can use it in the same way the rules were intended to use so this is just an example in that cases if you have a particular gene or if you have a particular variant and if you don't know what is your uh, basically gene to phenotype association is going to be then you can come back to this site and if you type the gene name in that case you can see whether the gene or the protein or the variant is being curated or reviewed by the group or not and what kind of classification they are giving what level of evidence is they are providing so considering all that information you can consider while reporting those variant in the clinical sector and also if you talk about clingen they have their own expert panels which provide different kinds of ratings and the quality for quality for basically uh, linking those gene related details or variant related distance to a particular phenotype so talking about the core rules uh if you again go back to the paper 2015 acmg guidelines there is a big table which is describing all the classification rules and regulations so in the rows you will be seeing the variant evidence categories and the columns contain the strength of the evidences so this is the table which i am talking about so the if you see the classification is based mainly on the population data or maybe predictive data there is some functional data involved there is some inheritance data and uh, this all the data which is there all these evidences are basically considered in the direction from the b9 to pathogenic and it is going from strong supporting from moderate strong and in some cases very strong so in cases when you are going to do a variant classification you have to come back to this table and then you try to understand that in which category your variant is falling and accordingly you will be assigning those criteria and those categories to your variant and if you see there is one more information a second piece of information along with that table which is already shared in the paper and this is how so these are the criteria which is already defined and using those criteria you can assign some of the criteria and to get it at a big picture level and to reach at the proper variant classification you can use this information uh, and basically this will be helping you for the reference purposes also and if you actually see how how do you go for it in that cases they have given a very complete guidelines and clear guidelines where it will be saying that if you want to say a variant is very very strong pathogenic then in that cases you need to have a very strong evidences plus you need to have more than one strong evidences or at least you need to have two moderate evidences or either you can have one moderate and one supporting or either you can have greater than two supporting evidences so if you have any one of these things and combine things then you will be saying okay these are the criteria which my variant is belonging to and these are the the numbers which i am assigning to my variant and finally i am going to classify my variant as a pathogenic variant so similarly for likely pathogenic for b9 likely b9 they have given a complete list of details and rules so based on the population data there are some rules given so first of the rule is if any variant or we can say minor allele frequencies from the public databases having the human resequencing data or maybe genome add in that cases if the frequency is greater than 5% then it is considered as a benign variant and then you can classify it as a ba1 because if you see if the frequency is greater than 5% then it is going to be more common in the population and it is not likely to cause any diseases 
but again there is some exceptions given but there is a very short list which you can go and explore in the next set if you see that the population frequency is greater than what was expected for a particular disorder then you will be classifying it in a criteria called as bs1 but here in these cases you have to set your own thresholds on the other hand if you see that the variant is completely absent from any kind of population databases then there is some kind of moderate evidences for pathogenicity and then you can classify it in a criteria called as pm2 but if you see a variant present only in the case samples that means the affected individuals and you do not find that variant present in the controls then there is a strong evidence that it is a pathogenic variant and you will be classifying it in a criteria called as ps4 so the another set of rules is based on the effect prediction where you will be actually using the computational tools and scores for understanding the impact of that variant on the protein change so if a computational algorithm says that it is having some impact on the uh, way, if it is having some impact on the protein level or maybe some impact on the causing the disease then you will be classifying into the pathogenic criteria that means it is having a deleterious effect so in that case you will be saying it in a pp3 group but if the computational algorithm says that it it doesn't have any impact then you will be classifying it in a criteria called as bp4 but if you have any kind of silent mutation or maybe synonymous mutations which aren't predicted to have any kind of splice site effects or impacts in that cases it will be a completely benign variant because there is no evidence of the pathogenicity that's why you will be classifying it in a criteria called as bp7 so these are some basic things but if you go at the higher rate then you can use the moderate evidences or strong or very strong evidences based on what kind of things you are seeing example if you have any uh, say missense mutation present at some position where other mutation is known to have a pathogenic effect in that case is taking that into consideration you will be assigning it into a group of pm5 which is the moderate evidence for pathogenicity and if you have any protein which is having a length changing effect or maybe there is a frame shift mutation either a uh, in frame insertion or an in frame deletion or either there is a stop mutation which is not leading to a null effect or that means it is not going to be a null variant in that case you will be saying it as a pm4 evidences and you will be putting into a criteria of pm4 again if the if you have a different nucleotide change but the amino acid change is similar where some pathogenic effect is already known that will be a strongest level for uh, giving the ps1 criteria and a very strong level will be where you have a loss of function and the mechanism of disease is known in that cases you will be saying pvs1 that is very strong evidences again uh, whenever you are considering any kind of classification you need to be uh, very careful because there are always a pitfalls and especially when you are going to assign a criteria for the pathogenicity and when you are going to use any frame shift mutation or you are dealing with any kind of stop gain mutation then you have to be double sure that whatever you are giving is highly accurate because a gene can have a multiple isoforms present right so in that cases if you see that this is just an example you consider if any kind of mutation is happening in this exon and if this gene is having multiple isoforms then all the isoforms are going to get affected but if any mutation is happening in this alternatively spliced isoform this alternatively spliced exon then only one of the two product is getting affected so you cannot assign a pathogenic case uh, until you are very sure that it is going to have a very strong effect on the biological system so this kind of thing you need to consider and take it uh, keep it in your mind when you are giving any pathogenicity effect for a variant again there are some other set of rules based on the functional studies so uh, if you have sequenced any patient samples and if you find any novel mutations then this rule is not going to be applicable however if you look at previously reported or studied variant where there might be uh, some functional studies being already done then you can use this kind of criteria so the basic rules will be to identify a very good functional study 
and when i say good functional study what do i mean you have to see whether the functional study was done using how many types of assays because there should be at least a greater than one way for assessing the function also when you are considering any study there should be positive and negative controls also present for doing the validation so that you have a higher rate and higher level of confidence when you are going to report anything so if that considering the previously uh, done functional studies if you consider that and if they say that okay it has a deleterious effect then it will be uh, getting categorized into a ps3 domain and if not then it will be a bs3 and there are uh, actually very few computational rules or algorithms which says about the pathogenicity effect because if you know a gene which can tolerate the benign mutations that means it has a very low rate of benign mutations but have a multiple pathogenic mutations present in that gene then it will be a part of pp2 criterion but if you know there is a some gene in which say, there are some mutational hotspot present but there is no tolerance at all for a benign mutation in that cases what you will be classifying it you will be saying it is a pm1 criteria again there are some correlates based on the inheritance pattern so in inheritance they consider the proband they consider the maternal and paternal samples so proband is the basically the first affected member in the family and if you uh, happen to see any kind of de novo mutations then it can be classified into a ps3 or pm6 depending upon the confirmation of the paternity or maternity samples and if it it is in the case of recessive disorder and it is present in the trans with any kind of pathogenic variant then you will be classifying it into a pm3 criteria and if you see a variant present in either cis or trans having a dominant or a pathogenic variant then it will be a classified into a bp2 criteria and if it is present in some alternate causes then it will be a part of bp5 criteria and again if you have a more than one family members in your study and if you are able to establish some kind of you know correlation or co segregation with that disease and the affected persons in that cases you will and if you were successfully able to establish also in that cases you can initially assign the pp1 but again this can get changed based upon the number and the distance of relation and finally if you have a family member but they do not have uh, they do not actually segregate the variant that is in question then there is a strong evidence that the variant is the benign variant and that's why you will be categorizing it into a bs4 level mm -hmm. and again there are some other categories and other set of rules for defining the variant list so uh, you can consider in this way that if is if there is any database you are referring and someone has entered that uh, there that they believe this variant is a pathogenic variant but they have not provided any evidences used that they have used for establishing the classification details in that cases what to, uh, it will be mostly falling into either a bp6 or pp5 criteria but if you see again this is not recommended because if there are not evidences in the first hand if you find then you can try to get as much as information you can get and then you can go for more uh, you know holistic classification and finally if you know that uh, some patient's phenotype is highly specific for a gene and if you feel that it is not enough for any kind of disease then it will be categorized into a pp4 criteria again there will be a pitfall which you have to consider because you don't have to consider all the criteria and you don't have to go for double counting because if you say that a variant is having a loss of function and if you have already assigned a pvs1 category then you cannot go again for lane changing effect that is pm4 or predicted deleterious pp3 because see if it is having a loss of function then definitely it is going to meet all the rest of the criteria so you just have to use the strongest level that is going to apply and you need to pick only one item from the row again with the caution and you have to make sure that you are not going to double count on anything so this is one of the example which is from the iowa institute where they were uh, studying some of the patients and that patient was having osteopenia and the rickets which is basically the loss of calcium in bones and not having enough of bone strength and some of the kidney problems and the pain 
and in that case they had a negative family history and when they sequenced the patient samples and they analyzed the data they found that there were two variants in this gene that is atp6v0a4 so one was the frame shift deletion or the deletion of four nucleotides and another was the substitution mutation basically this was a missense variant so initially when they started to classify the variant they found that the this gene has multiple isoform but the variant which was falling into the exon that exon was the part of all the isoforms and that's why they classified it into a pvs1 uh, criteria and this variant was found in the nomad database that is the population database with around frequency of 0.0075% that's why it was categorized as pm2 so at that time they had only one very strong and one moderate effect and that's why they classified into a likely pathogenic group and they were waiting for more evidences to come by so that they can reclassify this variant and in case of missense variant again the variant was found in the population database the nomad database with the frequency of 0.027% so it was getting classified into pm2 and from the computational tools like sift polyphen and some other tools they predicted it to have a damaging and a deleterious effect that's why this was classified into a pp3 criteria and they knew that they had the information that only few gene that is only three genes are responsible for causing this disease and it is an important part that's why they uh, classified it into a pp4 but still they did not have enough of evidences to say it as a pathogenic and they couldn't classify it into a b9 sector also but uh, fortunately when they went to the literature surveys and papers they could understand that this variant was already classified the, uh, this variant was already classified into the pathogenic and likely pathogenic and that's why combining the evidences found in the paper and combining their own evidences finally they were able to classify their variant having one strong two moderate and three supporting evidences from papers to a pathogenic group and in the similar way from the frame shift mutation uh, they already had classified into a likely pathogenic again going from some literature surveys and databases they found that this variant was already reported to have a pathogenic effect and considering those evidences also as a supporting material they were able to classify this variant as a pathogenic variant so basically these are the rules which i was talking about this is the list which is given by acmj guideline they clearly state that what all criteria and how many criteria or strength of evidences you need to have so that you can say whether your variant is going to be having which kind of effect whether it will be falling into a pathogenic criteria or likely pathogenic benign or likely benign so you can go back to the paper and you can try to understand all these criteria as one by one and classify the variants accordingly and one more thing i wanted to mention is about the variant reanalysis that is the variant reclassification so sometimes what happens is when you are trying to classify a variant there might be chances that at that particular point of time there are not enough evidences available so example if you have a variant from the population database and in that case you could only assign a variant as having a vus one that is variant of uncertain significance but after a certain point of time there were multiple literature surveys done there were multiple evidences involved then that was reported in the databases there were additional family members also tested so based on all the evidences classified now you are able to reclassify the variant from vus to either pathogenic or benign effect so this is a very important thing if you talk it of in the clinical sector and this is something which clinical labs are required to do on the quarterly basis so every quarter they have to take all the vus being studied and then they have to understand whether the vus variants are again getting reclassified into any of the other criteria or not and then these are some of the resources which you can go through to have more in depth knowledge on the acmg classification the nomenclatures and then you can go through the clingen website also for more details and try to understand how actually the classification is being done in the clinical sectors and i guess i am done with my presentation so if there are any questions i can take that okay thank you so much uh, ms mishra for the wonderful presentation
Uh, we do have a couple of queries in the chat that I wish to share with you, but uh, through an email, since uh, we are out of time right now. So okay. uh, I'll be sharing with you the participant queries through email, and the participants uh, will be shared with us. Yes, you can share us on the email, and I will try to revert back to all the questions. No issues. Thank you so much, Ms. Nisha. So Thank with that... Uh, uh, so with that, let me invite all the participants to the next session. Uh, so if anyone is interested in pursuing a career in bioinformatics or genomics, but unsure of where to start or how to gain the necessary skills and experience, then this is the best uh, session for you, which is taken by Mr. Emmanuel Adam Lukan. He is a research fellow with Helix Biogen Institute, Nigeria, a research organization that is focused on accelerating research in life through in-depth technical skills, training, and capacity building. And in today's session, he will be discussing on bioinformatics capacity building opportunities for students and young professionals with Helix Biogen Institute as a case study. So with that brief introduction, now I'd like to pass on the stage to Mr. Imam. Over to you. Um, Mr. Emmanuel, could you please unmute yourself? Mr. Emmanuel? Uh, please let me know um, if you're in the meeting. I have uh, given you co-host access. Hello, so um, you... Hello Gavin. Hello, yes, Gavin. Tony. Yeah, I, I, I guess you just joined now, so All right. you just joined a meeting, yeah. All right, perfect. So in the meantime, let me quickly give uh, an introduction to the speaker while he's joining. All right, I hope my screen is visible at the moment. Okay, all right. So Mr. Emmanuel, he's a research fellow at uh, Helix Biogen Institute, Nigeria, which is a research organization that is focused on accelerating research in life to in-depth technical skills training and capacity building in bioinformatics and genetics. Emmanuel graduated with a bachelor's degree in medical laboratory science from the prestigious Ladoke Akintola University of Technology in Nigeria. He is currently a member of the Education and Internship Committee of the International Society for Computational Biology Student Council. He is also a fellow of the Open Life Sciences mentorship program where he is designing a bioinformatics outreach for university students and high schoolers in so that was all about mr emmanuel that i wanted to interview all the participants to so if mr emmanuel is here please uh, unmute yourself to start with it. all right uh, and meanwhile he is uh, getting ready with this presentation i would like to ask the participant how have you been um, enjoying the session so far? Are there any particular session that you were able to enjoy? Let me know in the chat. I am also sharing with you a feedback form that you can fill it out and let us know your thoughts about the session so far. And you can also let us know about any queries that you might be having while attending the sessions, and we'll be happy to pass on to the judges. All right, uh, now I guess we would like to pass on stage to Sonalika. Meanwhile, we are waiting. So over to you, Sonalika. Thank you so much, Sri 
let me share my screen. Can you confirm if my screen is visible? Yes, it is loading up just a moment. Yes, we can see the bioinformatics and data science for everyone's screen. Perfect, all right. So uh, I would now like to discuss about uh, the bioinformatics research services that we provide that you can leverage as a scientist or a researcher who is generating data in your own lab or is interested to carry out further analysis with your research question or your data. And uh, also I would discuss about uh, the training programs and the research projects that we have uh, conducted successfully in the United States. So a brief overview about myself, as you all know, I'm Sonalika, the project manager at um, Pine Biotech. And um, our vision is to enhance human health and well-being by enabling biological research and discovery with relevant data, solutions, and support. And our mission is to simplify bioinformatics and advanced research through our modular and intuitive multi-omics analysis platform that is powered by human experience and artificial intelligence. So, so we have had the privilege to work with the professors and researchers from, from very reputed institutions, uh, to name a few, NIH, UCSF, DARPA, Roswell Park, Georgetown uh, University, LSU Health, New Orleans. We have also worked with researchers from Tulane University and many more. Now we are an international team of entrepreneurs, researchers, and clinicians, and led by accomplished bioinformatics experts with clinical, academic, and pharma expertise. And most of, of our team members have advanced degrees in biotechnology, bioinformatics, and computational biology from top international universities. And uh, we are doing this with a relationship with the Dauber Research uh, Center. So the platform, the T-BioInfo platform, is built to help prepare the biologists and the clinicians for the large multi-omics data sets that they have to deal with uh, on their own without relying on technical support to set up the computational environments and pipelines for processing. And the simple-to-use solution can help train as well as prepare anyone with a biological data set for advanced computational analysis visualization and annotation and most of such data types are generated randomly and high speed through high speed require, requiring complex computation data processing and as a procedure to generate a structured data set that could be visualized and analyzed statistically we provide the platform that the researchers can go through seamlessly and to support research i would like to briefly discuss about the tbioinfo platform which provides user-friendly and intuitive access to multiple standard and custom data analysis methods. The platform offers a single interface to access various processing capabilities like phylogenetic tree reconstruction, multiple sequence alignment, variant calling from NGS genomic data, transcriptomic analysis of RNA-seq data, 3D structural analysis, and screening of small molecules, as well as specialized pipelines for oncology, virology, neuroscience, and agrobiological applications. And what are those services? What it includes? And to begin with, I would now like to take you through these services where the researchers can use the AI-built platform to analyze their data with expert guidance and free consultation. Here we have some costs mentioned for standard services, long-term projects and collaborations. And this we can take towards an analysis towards the um, end of the presentation. The TBIO Info Pipeline Builder offers a color-coded, logical, and easy-to-follow interface that works for multiple structured data outputs, which offers intuitive visual outputs and creates reproducible workflows for fair data analysis on a simple and intuitive user interface for processing, analysis, and machine learning methods for multi-omics data. 
I, I would like to take a pause here as I think the speaker, uh, Mr. Emmanuel is here. So let's take a pause and let's catch up soon to discuss about the different types of analysis that a researcher can perform on the platform. And also then we discuss about a few interesting projects that we have worked on and what results did we get. Over to you, Shri Gauri. Thank you so much, Nalika. So now I'd like to pass on the stage to Mr. Emmanuel to start with the thing. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shri Gauri. Um, it looks like he got disconnected once again. Perhaps you can continue with your presentation. I'm unable to find him in the participant list. All right. I think there could be a connectivity problem maybe that Emmanuel is facing. He can take his time out to resolve it. I'll continue with the various areas of analysis in the meantime, and you can let me know once he's here. All right, so let's have this interesting discussion about these analysis that as a researcher, you can leverage. Okay, so I mentioned the last time that we would be discussing about these different uh, areas of ana analysis and what uh, analysis is possible on the platform. And to talk more about the platform, over 70% of graduate students, researchers, PhD scholars, and faculty working with the TBioInfo platform have found it to be extremely useful for big data analysis tasks, where you'll find the sections by data type, which includes NGS, mass spec, structural data, and others. You can run analysis or play around with demo pipelines, learn about visualization, statistical analysis, and machine learning as well, and find previous pipelines that you have run or by logging into your account information and bank. So the users get an uh, allotted space that is around five terabytes that they can use. Now from processing to statistical analysis methods, the TBioInfo platform offers a user-friendly interface that is ready for advanced bioinformatics analysis, where modern biologists rely on high-performance computational infrastructure to be able to run complex bioinformatics pipelines in the cloud. And to understand this process, the training programs offered by Omics Logic will be uh, helpful for the researchers to use the research bioinformatics analysis platform for big data to help you develop a logical understanding of the key methods involved in such data preparation. Now let's look at each one of these areas of analysis on the TBioInfo platform one by one. So to begin with, let us discuss about transcriptomics, which allows users to run quantification of gene expression, differential expression, and pathway analysis pipelines on the server. And as a result, you get insightful plots, including heat map, volcano plot, gene enrichment plot, GSEA plot, and a rich plot highlighting differentially expressed genes and pathways. Next is the single cell transcriptomic analysis or single cell RNA-seq data analysis section on the server, which uses barcodes, gene file, matrix file, and metadata that is obtained by sequencing reads from single cells. And this pipeline lists out marker genes, UMAP and DSNE plots, feature plots, virant plots, rich plots, and also assigns clusters to the cells based on observed differentially expressed genes. These plots ain't just useful to understand what the single cell expression is, but also adds weightage to a researcher's findings and thus a publication. Now let's look what the metagenomic section has for us. This section unveils the microbial abundance in the samples. The two popular methods used for the analysis includes data to and kind to analysis of amplicon sequencing, whole metagenomics, long read and functional analysis, and the output includes alpha diversity, beta diversity, NMDS, and taxonomic abundance plots. Also, it helps understand the evolutionary trends through phylogenetic analysis. 
Next, we have the genomics area of analysis, which provides researchers a list of variants observed in the samples. We just also looked at some of them in our previous session. And these variants are called upon by aligning the samples on the reference genome and then visualizing the variants in an interactive platform like JBrowse, which are detected through powerful variant callers like Freebase and Mutec2. Next, these variants could be annotated to check if they are novel or already reported and present in databases like Clinvar, Cosme, DBSNP, or uh, a researcher's manually prepared file. Last but not the least, we have the data mining and the machine learning section where a researcher can perform supervised and unsupervised analysis to analyze patterns, group data objects by feature similarity, and train machine learning models for predictive analysis. Under supervised area of analysis, you have the classification and the regression algorithms that you can explore and use for your analysis. And under unsupervised analysis, you have clustering algorithms like edge cluster, k means, pp scan that you can use for your analysis. In order to find these meaningful associations in heterogeneous multi omics data sets, this TBioInfo platform was put together that helps you or offers a mix of the supervised and the unsupervised multi-omics integration approaches like SNF tools, iCluster Plus, and BiClustering. And if you're interested to learn more about what type of data is required to run the pipelines or how to process the data, what should be the flow of the pipeline, what outputs to expect, and how to interpret the results to gain biological insights, you can contact us and then we can further discuss about um, the analysis required for your research question. And here is what some researchers who have used our platform uh, for their research projects have to say for us. Now, I would also like to discuss about some of the projects that we have worked upon, but before I do that, I would like to talk briefly about the portal, which will be your guide to do wonders on the platform. As I showed, showed you that there are various resources that you can uh, go through and learn from. So this portal gives students options to analyze a given data set, follow code dependent parts or code independent parts. And these data sets and associated publications can be used in several ways where you can learn bioinformatics without any coding at all. For that, in each project, we explain the analysis pipelines on the user-friendly TBioInfo platform for big data analysis. So under the courses tab, along with the courses, what you can see is a, a list of case studies. You have a lot of case studies on different types of omics data analysis. So once you have a skill set or once you have an expertise uh, for a specific omics analysis, how do you really apply that skill set or that knowledge to a research question in hand? So to learn that, you can go through these different case studies to learn how a research question could be answered step by step, which tools to use and how to interpret your results. Now, you can also learn the scripts behind many of these steps. Learn to wrangle, clean, visualize, and also analyze data in popular languages like R and Python in order to create your own analysis. And finally, you can hear about the projects and their research applications as well in our mentor guided training programs where experts share their experience and support research projects that could be developed by you. So there are people who, uh, frankly saying, run away from codes. So for the ones who are not from a bioinformatics background, but are really interested to apply or use these tools for their data analysis, this is the go-to platform that you can go through and learn more about, or you could also use it to validate the results that you get through your steps. All right, so to discuss about, about some of the uh, projects that the researchers have worked on with us, one of them was pathway annotation from rainbow, zebrafish, and omic. And because of some uh, obvious reasons, I won't be going into much depth of the projects right now, but just to give you a brief overview of what type of projects can you work on as a researcher. Our, uh, we have also worked on RNA-seq data analysis of embryonic stem cell uh, 
that had two major groups, mutant cells and control cells. And this project was mainly for a researcher and a professor in the LPRN Institute, that is Louisiana Biomedical Research Network. And we have also worked on pregnancy uh, screening of the cell-free RNA from the plasma of two patient cohorts. And this was a pretty interesting study that I was a part of as well. And we also worked on uh, to understand the effect of retinoic acid, where we performed the RNA-seq analysis of retinoic acid treated, encapsulated, and embroiled bodies. Again, this project was um, for a professor and a scientist in the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network. And we did an interesting Dino assembly of herpes virus genome where the project uh, aimed to perform de novo transcriptome assembly of herpes virus, which has a large double-stranded DNA genome of approximately 152 kilobase pair length, and where two sets of paired and fast few files were obtained from transcriptome sequencing of viral isolates from the host green African monkey. So that was just a brief of what type of projects we have worked on. And with that, I would like to pass on the stage to our uh, next speaker. So just would like to confirm, yes, we have a next speaker amongst us. Hello, Dr. Lisa. Let me share my screen and introduce you. Trying to share my screen. Yes. Hi. All right. So we have uh, Dr. Lisa with us. I would like to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Lisa Pranenko finished her bachelor's in biophysics and master's in genomics and bioinformatics at Siberian Federal University. And she's currently a PhD student at the same place. Her PhD thesis is about plant genomics, where she's performing a study on epigenetics and genome annotation of the oil palm. And she's interested in all kinds of areas of research while she loves working on mammals and uh, studying genomics and transcriptomics. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I would now like to pass on the stage to you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to... Um present our research here. Um, can you see my screen all right? Yeah, I yes, think, yeah. we can. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so I'll be presenting the research done in um, Tabber Center on integrating multiple single cell data sets. Um, as an example, we took prostate tissues in health and disease. And our story really started um, on only um, benign prostate uh, hyperplasia. It's a disease when the prostate is enlarged. Um, and um, the difference is that it's not a cancerous disease and it should not, you shouldn't have the prostate radically removed by surgery, as in cancer, of course. Um, so in our case, we had four donors um, for, all, for BPH. Uh, each donor had uh, samples taken from two different areas of prostate, the stroma and granular areas, and three, uh, this is the stromal um, area and this is the granular area. And uh, we also had three uh, healthy donors that uh, the samples were taken also from two different uh, areas, the transitional area and peripheral area. So we started with um, only a benign prostate hyperplasia and, con and healthy con uh, donors. And when we analyzed um, our data with SARA package um, on uh, the platform, the TBAR platform, 
Um, we ended up with uh, separate analysis for healthy donors and for BPH. And we see here that um, in healthy donors, the majority of the cells are epithelial cells in yellow. Um, and we have very small clusters for myeloid cells and lymphoid and um, for smooth muscle and fibroblasts. Uh, when we look at BPH, it's actually a very different um, situation here where the clusters are similar in size somewhat. Uh, we don't have as many epithelial cells and they are even separated into two separate clusters here. Uh, we have a lot more lymphoid cells and myeloid cells. But when we decided to look a bit more closely at BPH, uh, we saw that some clusters were actually sample or um, donor specific. For example, this small cluster that is uh, a part of endothelial uh, tissue, um, it is entirely comprised of the cells from one donor uh, who received alpha blocker treatment for nine months. Um, we think this suggests that this um, treatment uh, affected somehow the expression of uh, genes in this tissue. And that's why we have it separate from the rest of the endothelial uh, cells from these two donors. Um, another thing that we can see here is this purple clusters that we see in each cell type that are slightly separated from the rest. Um, they are also from single donor uh, who is actually the youngest of them all. And they have the highest PSA, uh, which is the prostate uh, cancer marker um, and highest glucose levels, but they don't have any um, additional medical conditions like diabetes or hypolipidemia or hypertension. Something that these two donors actually have reported uh, to have these conditions. So. Um, we hypothesize that uh, this cluster separation uh, can be um, a result of these confounding uh, medical diseases or uh, treatments that these donors um, went through. So um, next, we were also interested to see some differences between uh, benign prostate hyperplasia and prostate cancer. Um, and we uh, integrated two data sets. Each of them had their own control uh, samples inside. But um, apart from obvious technical um, noise that we were expecting to see, because, well, these are obviously two batches that were, they were done in two different lab laboratories on two different dates by <laughs> different teams. So they're bound to be batch effect, but um, also we have to keep in mind that the way these samples were taken was also different. For BPH data set, uh, this was taken by biopsy and for cancer data, these paired samples uh, were uh, taken from the prostate itself after radical surgery. So the prostate was removed um, and then uh, the uh, doctors or scientists histologically studied the prostate and took samples from the area that was cancerous and the area that was histologically um, healthy. But the thing is what we know about cancer that uh, the changes in gene expression that can be in this prostate before the cancer actually overtakes the whole organ, they still can be different from the true um, healthy organ. So we, um, we will vary of the control that was in cancer because it might not be a true control. Um, and the Technical part of this was how to integrate this data. Uh, here you can see this separate uh, batch that has its own epithelial cells. It has its own endothelial cells 
small, small cell cells, um, lymphoid cells that are separate from these clusters from BPH. Um, this is the picture after Sura's anchor integration, and obviously it did not work on our data for some reason. We still have very um, evident batch effect. So another approach uh, for batch effect correction um, is Harmony. Uh, what it does, it looks at uh, clusters um, in each batch, and uh, well, you saw here that although they are different, they are still classified uh, as the same cell type. So here as well, we have them, they are different, but they're still classify, classified as uh, parts of the similar cell type. Um, and then for these clusters, uh, the centroids are found, for example, this one and this one. Um, and then, they uh, correct the factors for clusters so they can merge them and we have this uh, mixed cluster in our case um, it's very uh, it, you can see it very well on the pca uh, this is before correction where we can see a clear shift of our data on pc1 and after harmony corrected uh, the pcs um, this shift is gone. Uh, then the UMAP was built on this corrected PCs and uh, these smaller clusters uh, that correspond to smooth muscle cells, lymphoid tissue, myeloid tissue, they mixed very well. But this big cluster that is uh, epithelial cells, we see that this still is differentiation between um, BPH data set, BPH batch, and uh, cancer batch. Um, but this might not be actual technical noise that we wanted to remove. This can be a legit biological difference uh, between these two batches or between um, subsamples between them. So we um, this might be very meaningful finding for us. So first of all, we wanted to see how these cell types in the integrated data set are different um, in terms of cell composition. Uh, to normalize for different library sizes, we only took 1,000 genes, uh, sorry, 1,000 cells from each sample. And um, we separated them by our state states. So this is the BPH control, something that we consider as true control taken from healthy donors. Um, then we have BPH, um, and then we have uh, cancer control. Uh, we don't consider it true um, control because it's um, it's taken from a the organ that already has cancer at some part of it, it might have um, differences that are not, uh, you can't see histologically, but in terms of expression, there already can be some differences there. So, and, and cancer. And um, we can place it uh, as a tree. So from our true control, there is a difference uh, in terms of uh, in BPH that we see a reduction in epithelial cells, like this is in control, all the yellow is epithelial cells. There's not many in BPH, but there are a lot more lymphoid cells in uh, green and myeloid cells in blue, and also a lot more smooth muscle cells. Um, these differences te uh, tested by uh, T-test um, were significant um, for BPH com uh, compared to control and compared to cancer in lymphoid, myeloid, and smooth muscle cells. Um, when we go from our true control to cancer, to cancer control, there's not many differences in um, myeloid or lymphoid uh, clusters, but there is um, difference in um, the composition of epithelial cells. We see that the cluster that was enriched in, BP, in true control 
is actually absent in our cancer data, but another um, clusters of epithelial cells are present in cancer control and in uh, cancer data. Um, and again, about BPH, what we actually see here, the increase in lymphoid and myeloid cells makes sense because uh, what we know about BPH is that it is um, an inflammatory process and um, many numbers of T cells and B cells from lymphoid and neutrophils from myeloid cells are expected to be elevated in BPH, but also we had higher numbers of smooth muscle cells. So I wanted to uh, show you what BPH looks like on cellular level. And in case of normal prostate, this is the prosthetic duct. It is lined up with uh, different types of epithelial cells. Uh, so the luminal cells, basal cells, uh, there are sometimes neuroendocrine cells. Um, and, and other, of course. Um, and in BPH, we see a lot more uh, stromal cells and stromal cells are normally uh, present, represented by fibroblasts, myofibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. Um, they are enriched in hyperplasia and that's exactly what we see. Um, interestingly, uh, we don't see uh, a significant increase in fibroblasts. There is some increase, but it's not significant. Um, so yeah, based on cell composition, uh, we see very good difference in BPH, but we don't really see any difference in cancer compared to control. Um, and when I was talking about epithelial cells, how our one cluster changed for another cluster, um, this is actually due to different subtypes of epithelial cells uh, that we have. So this, uh, yeah, this is the picture of, uh, with a different uh, types of epithelial cells. Some are more specific for peripheral zone, like luminal cells and basal cells. Some are more specific for um, transition zone, um, like Hillcock cells. And for example, club cells, they are basically everywhere in, in both tissues. They're sometimes uh, present in uh, this lining. And we can see that club cells are separated from the rest of the epithelial cells. This is exactly the separate uh, cluster of epithelial cells that I was talking about in the very beginning. They're so different, they are um, separated from the rest of the epithelial cells in BPH. Um, so let's look at um, the epithelial cell subpopulations in our four uh, stage, states. In BPH and in control, we have this basal um, epithelial cells um, abundant in our sample and a bit of luminal cells. And um, in BPH, we have many club cells. I did not find anything in literature about this phenomena at the, at the moment, but uh, our study is ongoing. So maybe we will understand why it's like that. Um, and in cancer and in cancer control, we have a lot more neuroendocrine cells, Hillcock cells and luminal cells. So this is about um, how we not only have technical noise that we were fighting um, during our integration of data, but there is bound to be some biological differences, especially since our sampling for these two batches was quite different. Um, but well, it's nice that we um, overcame our batch effect with Harmony, but one problem with Harmony is that it doesn't really change your expression table. So um, it's good, it's perfect technique for visualization, but when it comes to differential expression, what, what do you do with your expression table? How, how to um, actually overcome batch effect? And there are several ways to do it. Um, 
first of all, there are ways to uh, correct batch effects so that it will um, change your expression table. But in our case, those methods didn't really work very well. So there are two more <laughs> approaches. First is you can regress, uh, use regression to remove the effect of your batches on expression table prior to differential expression. Or another way is to use built-in SURA functions uh, for differential expression that also have tests that can remove um, these factors by regression themselves without these prior changes to expression table. Um, those are logical regression tests and must that can uh, that can remove batch effect uh, during differential expression. And we used must uh, with this batch effect uh, removal. Um, so we had a lot of genes uh, that were uh, differentially expressed between uh, cancer and uh, BPH. And uh, for myeloid uh, tissue, we wanted to, um, it, it's impossible to just go through all these genes. So we came up with a way to um, group them into pathways using gene set enrichment analysis, something also um, available on the TBI info platform. So how it works in a few words is that um, we have several genes from this pathway and we have all our gene set so we align uh, sorry we order our gene set from the one um, from the genes that have the biggest log fold change and to the ones that have the lowest negative log fold change um, all our genes and then we look at the genes that are present in a specific pathway like cytokine activity and here they are highlighted. The length of this um, bar uh, shows the value of this log flow change. All of them are negative in our case. And gene set enrichment analysis works uh, that you go by each gene, um, like, your st like steps. And if there is no gene in this position, uh, the enrichment score uh, is reduced. If there is a gene, it actually rises, so you add some value. And the more genes are there, like here, we can see an increase in this enrichment score. Um, what did what it designed to show? It designed to show if we have uh, an enrichment in one of the like areas of our gene set. For example, if they're only here, we have a pretty big enrichment score at the very end. It will be negative. If our genes are enriched here, we will have a pretty big enrichment score and it will be positive because it will all be at the very beginning. When our genes are um, distributed everywhere evenly, the enrichment score will be very low because it doesn't really tell us anything about this pathway. And it only tells that like there is no pattern for this uh, specific pathway, and we are interested in the pathways that are either um, enhanced or inhibited in our comparison. So um, this is the distribution of log fold changes, and uh, in comparison for cancer versus BPH, all our pathways were inhibited, means that they were increased in BPH and inhibited in cancer. And uh, some of uh, here, all the pathways are somehow connected with immune response, um, like uh, chemotaxis of leukocytes, granulocytes, uh, neutrophils, um, cytokine receptor binding, cytokine activity, response to chemokine. So everything about um, immune response is enriched and increased in BPH and or it can be uh, viewed as reduced in cancer. Um, I did not show um, the pictures here, but we did the same for BPH versus control. 
And we also saw something that we expected, the immune um, pathways that were enriched in BBH, the MHC functionality, the antigen binding and vesicle transport. Um, when we checked cancer versus their own control, the cancer control, we did not find any pathways that were uh, significant, but we did find a few, uh, several genes, and um, two of them were parts of heat shock family genes, and they are they were were significantly overexpressed in cancer, and these genes are known to be. Um, essential for cancer survival in um, prostate cancer. And another cell type that we um, are looking here at is epithelial cells. And good for us, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it just makes it more interesting that we not only have uh, pathways that are inhibited in cancer, but also the ones that are um, uh, enriched in cancer. And these are ion transport, uh, zinc ion transport, and also um, epithelial cells differentiation in prostate gland development. This suggests that differentiation of epithelial cells in cancer um, is a lot more active um, than in BPH. And um, the pathways that are enriched in BPH versus cancer are all about apoptosis and cell death. And um, it can be viewed a bit differently. Yeah, it's not enriched in BPH, but it actually is inhibited in cancer. And that's something that we know already that cancer cells have a huge problem with um, apoptosis and cell death. And that's why, um, that's why it's cancer, basically. Um, this is the end of my presentation. The work is ongoing, so it's a bit um, unfinished. Um, but if you have any questions or anything, I'm, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lisa. I have a question for you. Sure. So when we talk about single cell transcriptomics, it's a field that is emerging and a lot of people have a lot of questions right now for this field. So what do you think, uh, what does it mean to researchers to really adopt this technology of single cell technologies, how it could be really beneficial to them and how is it different from transcriptomics? Right. So, uh, I think it's extremely beneficial. Actually, um, the great thing about it is that we can look at different cell types of um, the organs. Like in the prostate, we can actually look for differentiation, a differential expression between cell types. Even We can even pick some sub-cell types and look specifically in them. This is something that we can't really do with bulk RNA uh, because we technically can't pick the cells uh, by our hand to test that. So it's a huge um, advantage of single cell. One of the disadvantages is that it's, uh, it's not an easy um, experiment to do. And there are uh, technical dif uh, difficulties. One of this is integration of data sets uh, that we spoke here that not all the approaches that we used actually worked for us and sometimes you have to go through all the approaches that you have uh, to find the one that will work for your data set. Um, another thing is um, cell type classification because it's also tricky. We, um, I did not add it here but we actually tried um, three gene sets um, for our cell annotation. The the um, what you see here, these cells, cell types that are uh, classified. This is also something like state of art procedure because you uh, not all the genes that are known to be cell markers actually work. Um, in a single cell because not all these genes are, the expression of these genes picked up very well by this technology. And not all the gene markers that were found in bulk um, RNA sequencing also work for single cell. So you really have to um, 
also play with it. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you. And for the single cell data, the ones who want to explore the public repositories to really get the data, uh, can you share some databases that the researchers can explore, the students basically, who are in their graduation or post-graduation and don't have the access to lab generated data right now? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, this data set that we used here is also a public data set. Uh, we took it from an article. So you basically go to NCBI, look for articles that you uh, want. All the latest publications, they have to uh, deposit their data to GEO, uh, Gene Expression. Um, I, don't, I don't remember what the last uh, letter is. Gene Expression Omnibus. But... Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we found our data there. Basically, you just check uh, if it's the experiment that you need, the machine that you need, and the um, file format that you need. For single cell, there are basically two uh, types of input data. That is tenic uh, genomics, where you need to have three files. And there is another type is when you just have one table. Um, our platform works with both um, data inputs, so you can download them and try uh, try it out. Also, um, what we implement here is Sira pipeline with some additions, um, but Sira is publicly available. You can try its code. You can try to upload the data from NCBI and try to run this step by step. The cell annotation in Sera is not perfect, and we use different approaches. We use a CS type package, which um, I like very much, but the rest can be run uh, with Sera as well, the original Sera. Thank you. Um, we have a question by Dr. Raghav. Dr. Raghav, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Sonalika. And great talk, Lisa. They, I mean, extremely insightful. I, I just want your comment on uh, on cancer uh, biology. Uh, I mean, definitely from your talk and also from other uh, literature, we know that single cell uh, uh, RNA seq is going to add up uh, or um, provide a lot of information that is not discovered or that is not uh, discussed earlier. So, can you also comment on situations where bulk cell is going to be enough? for most of the investigations? And uh, on what special cases do you want the uh, experiment or the investigation to be uh, upgraded to single cell technology? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have to say that I'm not very experienced in cancer uh, research, uh, but um, Bulk RNA is, uh, it also has its own advantages. For example, single cell doesn't really give you a lot of uh, data. It doesn't give you a lot of expression per cell because there are some limits, but bulk RNA is a lot better. And there are actually approaches to combine those two. So we have bulk RNA, we have single cell, and uh, we can deconvolute them um, to enhance um, advantages of both. But in my opinion, um, there are a lot of, uh, I think that for a lot of cancers, if we um, look at bulk RNA, we will still see um, differences in genes if we know what genes we're looking for. Then we can make um, targeted RNA-seq and we don't really need a, a single cell. But when we have specific cell type, like in case of prostate cancer, uh, when, uh, well, at least the article says that um, the most differences happen in epithelial cells and not in the rest of the cells. It's, it's better to identify those cells and separate them from analysis. Um, in BPH, for example, uh, research says that um, fibroblasts, are of the, the most interest. So they tend to separate fibroblasts and uh, look into fibroblasts in more detail and just remove the rest of the cells. 
And in BPH, like on this uh, slide, we see that actually fibroblasts, they don't really make up the majority of the cells. So if we are looking to find some differential expression differences in fibroblasts, they can be lost in all other cells because it's not the majority, we're not sure. If we have targets, we can overcome this. If we don't really have targets, it's better to um, export, well, not export, but separate your cells from the rest, in my opinion. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Raga. Uh, so my next question to you is, what are the specific challenges that needs to be considered while, anal while analyzing the single cell data? This uh, is for yeah. the research. As, as, yeah. yeah, as I said, um, well, for me, um, in my experience, the hardest parts are integration and cell annotation, because this is this never works from the first try and you really have to play with it and um, you have to try to understand if it actually makes sense biologically um, and yeah for uh, with integration it's technically uh, hard um, and with cell annotation you don't always understand if it makes sense or not and you have to try different gene sets from different literature. All right, and uh, what about uh, in terms of interpretation and application? What would be some of the challenges by interpreting the results from the analysis? Um, if you do everything well, it's not so hard to interpret it. I mean, uh, if, if you actually annotated everything correctly and if, uh, you're not exactly uh, looking for differential expression between batches, but uh, between actual biological uh, differences, um, then I think the hardest part here would be to um, combine this big chunk of data in something you can actually look through. Uh, because in our case, when we test for differential expression, we end up with thousands of genes that you cannot possibly check uh, manually. So you have to come up with ways to, um, to group them. Like in our case, we came up with uh, this pathway analysis. Um, it can be different types of analysis uh, that can be used there. Or yeah, I think something like that for interpretation. Um, it also depends on, what what you want, uh, what is actually the difference uh, that you're looking for, because you can look into cell composition and how many of different cell types are present, or you have to go into differential expression or even expression in specific genes, only specific genes. I think something like that. And how this information that one gets or how the knowledge that one gets from the single cell study could be implemented in terms of drug discovery or designing a better therapeutic approach, how could this be useful? Well, um, I'm not sure about drug discovery since I don't really have any, any um, experience in it, but um, in case, well, for many diseases, it's really to look for um, markers, early markers, or at least 80 markers of this disease. In case of um, BPH, many uh, tests that are ran on people, they give false positives uh, when testing for cancer. And these people uh, go through radical surgery and their prostate is removed only to... Uh, then be declared that they don't really have cancer, they have BPH, and BPH doesn't require you to, to have your prostate removed uh, since it's not cancerous. So this is a real problem in uh, medicine, how to avoid this uh, radical surgery when it's not needed. And this happens basically because the uh, current testing systems are not efficient enough or not um, good enough. And uh, single cell can help you in identifying markers, gene markers and signatures 
that can be useful in uh, differentiating different uh, medical conditions between each other. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, that was uh, very much informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa, for this wonderful talk and okay. also answering all the questions. Uh, if there are any questions uh, amongst the participants, you can please unmute yourself, raise a hand, put in the chat. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things yeah, that um, not a lot of researchers are currently working on, but they are really interested to learn more about it. So I don't think we have more questions. Uh, all right. Okay. With that, thank you so much. And uh, I think we can now move to our next participant, next speaker. Sorry. So we have amongst us Dr. Laura Harris. Yes. Hi, Dr. Laura. So before I pass on the stage to you, I would like to introduce you. Dr. Laura has uh, accomplished her medical um, biology degree, and uh, she's an award-winning educator with over 20 years of diverse experience with expertise in infectious disease, immunology, neurology, astrobiology, and oncology. She earned her PhD in biomedical informatics from Rutgers State University of New Jersey, and she has two master's degrees, cell and molecular biology and microbiology. Um, she did that after bachelor's in microbiology in 2003. And she did her uh, bachelor's from Michigan State University and she has a career in the industry working as a research associate and a medical writer at various stages throughout the preclinical and clinical drug development process in and alongside pharmaceutical companies, including Pfizer. She then settled into academia where she rose to assistant professor and assigned his position working at a laboratory coordinator at Devonport University before becoming the director of training for the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research at MSU. We are pleased to have you amongst us, Dr. Laura. I would now like to pass on the stage to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, just give me a second to get my screen going. We should be good now, yes? Yes, I can see our screen. Okay, so um, first off again, thank you for the introduction and the invitation to come talk to you all today. Um, my name is Laura Harris and I'm gonna be talking to you about a program that I've been working on for the last few years uh, called Biomoma, uh, Biological Multiomic Meta-Analysis. Um, I've got my contact information there, my email and my LinkedIn. Um, I'll go ahead and plot that into the chat at the end of the lecture and um, I'll take questions at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. So really, I started out working with transcriptomic data. And transcriptomic data had its roots with the microarray technology a revolution, so to speak. So microarray came about in the early 1990s uh, by Stephen Forder and some of his colleagues. And they basically developed a chip that you could then look at chemically um, with photosensitivity to determine the chemicals on the chip and what their concentrations were. So at this early stage, it's simply about developing the chip, not applying it to anything biological. Um, once we started getting into adding nucleotides onto there, we very quickly started adapting that to everything. Um, human medicine, animal medicine, uh, plant-based biology, and you see microarray and subsequently RNA-seq used in a wide variety of areas. So it really has been a major revolution over the last 20 or 30-ish years, uh, just based on a little tiny chip. And so as I've mentioned, we've looked as uh, 
scientists and uh, medical clinicians at everything, you know, infectious disease, cancer, immunology, neurological diseases. And then people have taken that technology and expanded it into any sort of biological questions. So, you know, what are the environmental impacts on plants, for example? Um, and then the use for the chip expanded over time. So instead of just putting DNA on and looking at things like gene expression profiling or single nucleotide polymorphisms, now we're starting to see more sophisticated use of that chip, uh, such that now we're looking at you know, epigenetic markers, uh, such as chromatin modification on the chip chip, rather than an RNA-seq or a microarray chip. Uh, you can also look at genomic structural variations, looking at things like variation and copy number, for example. So it really has taken on a whole wide range of uses, which is very good for generating data that we can analyze. And as our previous speaker just mentioned, the gene expression omnibus, which I'll call GEO for here on out um, is a major part of that. So GEO is a public repository for all sorts of microarray chip-based data. And this is just a screenshot that I took probably about a week ago of all of the holdings within GEO. So you'll notice, for example, that there's almost 200,000 publicly available data sets. That's what a series is. Those series are profiled on platforms, which are the actual chips. These chips are made by like Illumina, Affymetrix, et cetera. And there's around uh, 25,000 of those that are represented in the knowledge base. And pretty close to 5.5 million samples and continuing to grow also. So, you know, a lot of power within the data housed in GEO. And this is a little hard to see, but what you see here is that data is varied based on what its application is. So there is a lot of transcript omic data, either through the microarray itself or through RNA-seq. But then you'll see, you know, genomic variations, genome binding, occupancy profiling, methylation profiling. This is not a complete list. So if I had scrolled down, I could see things like non-coding RNA profiling, protein profiling, bioarray, et cetera. So this is where we start to get into the idea that you can do a multi-omic approach, not just looking at gene expression, but then incorporating the findings from gene expression to findings from other types of data, for example, methylation profiling data, to get more of a whole cell view of what's going on in a particular disease or biological question. So then around that, I started working with transcript omic data. And so bioma is the biological meta-analysis not multi-omic yet. So I'm only dealing at this point with one type of data, <clears throat> primarily transcriptomic data, either microarray or RNA-seq, or sometimes I'll discuss later epigenomic as in DNA methylation or proteomic, which in protein profiling. One second. This is what I get for talking too much. <laughs> and so Bioma has successfully been applied to compare differential gene expression in various um, ways. So, you know, looking at antibiotic resistance, uh, specifically in Staphylococcus aureus, um, think MRSA if you're a clinician kind of person. Um, we've expanded that to pseudomonas and looking at antibiotic resistance in E. coli, you know, various superbugs. Um, and then of course, SARS came along. So we applied the methodology there. I'll be talking about some papers um, that I've published in that area. We're expanding into cancer and neurological disorders now. But um, the idea here is that you basically take transcriptomic data, and you're going to do differential gene expression analysis. 
And then you're going to use that to be able to look at pathway changes. And then if you do that across multiple data sets, you then can get a meta-analysis. And if the data sets all start reporting the same genes or the same pathways, then you know those are potential uses that could be examined in the laboratory or further examined in the clinic. So they could be good for, you know, discovering new drugs, repurposing current drugs, or just having a general better understanding of what's going on in a disease process. So with Bioma, we've got a probe signature. So this is going to be a list of probes that's directly from the data you get from either your laboratory or from Gene Expression Omnibus. So this is a list of genes, a list of methylation sites, lipids, whatever. And we're going to rank those, I'll call them genes for now, just you know, for consistency here. Um, we're going to rank those by phenotypic variation. So basically the difference in gene expression between my diseased and my control group. I'm gonna represent that probe signature by this line here where red is going to represent overexpression in my diseased or um, experimental group. I could be dealing with plants, you know, that are nutrient deficient or whatever. And then the blue end would be underexpressed in the, um, um, diseased versus the control. And in the middle is going to be expression that is roughly equal between the two groups. And so I've got my data up here. In this case, I've got enough data because I'm using a bulk data set to be able to differentiate between an identification signature, second identification signature, and a third verification signature. And I can do this between my experimental and my control samples. I'm gonna rank my genes, get my signature, and then I'm gonna take the top 10 or so percent of the genes in those signatures, and I'm gonna use them to define a query gene set. I'm gonna use query gene sets defined by the signature tails, both the overexpressed and the underexpressed for the identification signatures. And I'm going to use gene set enrichment analysis to basically cross compare them between the two signatures. This will give me a set of leading edge probes, which if I find similarities between the cross comparison, I can use them to define a panel of genes. So this basically will give you a panel of overexpressed and a panel of underexpressed. <laughs> I can then use those panels against that third verification signature, use some random modeling and see which of those specific genes in the panel are also represented strongly within the verification signature. So that then gives me an idea of genes that are associated with a particular disease state. Oh, excuse me, my voice is giving out. So for the example that I've got on the prior slide down here, this link goes to the SARS paper uh, where we did this type of analysis. So we were looking at um, SARS-1 to define our panels and verify our panels. And uh, this was SARS-infected lung tissue, uh, epithelial cells, if you're real curious. And then we wanted to obviously compare it to modern day COVID, SARS-CoV-2. So this is where the meta-analysis part comes in. Since I have panels of SARS-1 genes that I'm confident because I was able to verify them in non-overlapping data, I can then use those same panels and compare them to signatures that were defined from SARS-2 data. So these are new data sets, again, from GEO, where they're taking SARS-2 and infecting epithelial lung cells. 
find the genes that are both over and under expressed and then compare them across each signature that I can get my hands on. In the study I'm referencing, we went across like seven or eight different strains of COVID and 30 different data sets. But that will then give you genes of interest that are very relatable to the laboratory. So in the case of our SAR study, we found interferon genes were very highly overexpressed, and that would be great for interferon therapy, for example. To get a whole cell approach, we can then look at it from a pathway level. And so we can then define pathway signatures where we list the pathways, which are basically gene ontology, biological processes, gene sets that I get from the molecular signature database from Broad Institute. And now I can rank those gene sets by their normalized enrichment score when I compare those gene sets individually to the signatures that I just defined. I then can rank the pathways and that will give me a pathway signature. So this is kind of shown at the top up here where I started out with the same gene signature that I had before. Now I'm gonna compare it to those gene sets that I just talked about from MSIGDB rank them based on normalized enrichment score, I get a pathway signature. The red end are going to be pathways with a positive normalized enrichment score. These are upregulated in my disease state compared to my control. And then the blue end would be downregulated in disease state compared to my control. Do the same sort of cross analysis between my pathway signature that is identifying from one set and another set. And I can define pathway panels from the leading edges of those gene set enrichment analyses. These pathway panels can be compared then to pathway signatures from independent data sets, use some random modeling and figure out which pathways are consistent. Do the same type of meta-analysis approach, you get pathway level view of the cell. So this has all been done with one type of data set. In the case of SARS and my antibiotic resistant work, it was transcriptomic. But as you notice from GEO at the beginning of the talk, there's a lot of different data sets you can get your hands on or that you could generate in your lab. So here I'm showing example of a methylation profiling data that would give you information of the epigenomic level of the cell. You could incorporate single nucleotide polymorphism or copy number variation, you know, genome variation profiling data. This could give you more of a genomic look at the cell. You can do transcriptomic like we've been talking about that looks at messenger RNA production. You could then incorporate non-coding RNA profiling data. So this could give you a look at the gene silencing that's going on inside the cell. And then profiling for proteins could give you a proteomic approach. And of course, if we combine all of these different types of data, particularly from the pathway signature level, in addition to the probe signature level, we then can get functional genomics, where we're literally taking more of a whole cell view of what's going on in the system. And so the check marks you see here is what we've been working on uh, to develop this biomoma uh, approach. Um, and in this case, we're using cancer. So we have paper in review right now with cancer informatics. Um, we've been accepted, but we've got some edits to do. And that's looking at the methylation profiling level, again, doing this type of meta-analysis across, you know, 40 different signatures and several different data sets. I think we had like 12 different cancer types in that study. We have just completed the level of transcriptomic. And now we're incorporating the proteomic and the transcriptomic for uh, non-coding RNA. So what's been interesting now is to try to figure out what it all means. So there are some genes that we see that will be 
overexpressed or pathways that are upregulated at the methylation level that are underexpressed or downregulated at the transcriptomic level, the messenger RNA level. There are some genes and pathways that don't really change or that change in one, but not the other. And so now I'm really have to dig into the biology and finding, um, you know, my colleagues that work more in the biology side and ask them, hey, you know, here's what we're seeing at these various levels. How might you interpret this whole cell picture? And so that's been pretty exciting to do. And we haven't quite gotten into the genomic variation part of it yet. We're hoping to. Um, but that's going to be the next series of papers um, in cancer is to show this whole model working. And it'll be a fun summer. So then just to conclude briefly, we started just looking at one type of data. So BIMA um, is finding molecular changes that are associated with a phenotypic variation of some type of omic data. And then using a meta-analysis approach to find genes or pathways associated with that variation, that disease. It's been used successfully across the different types of diseases. We're now applying it to plants, which is kind of cool. Uh, we're also looking at how uh, space affects different uh, tissue types in animals and plants. So that's you know, a lot of applications for this kind of approach. Um, and again, it helps to identify new drugs, repurpose current drugs, and just get a better understanding. Oh, and then expanding into the multi-omic part of this, integrating the findings across the different types gives you a multi-omic approach and then gives you more of a whole cell view of what's going on physiologically. So again, I'll go ahead and uh, plop this information into the chat. You know, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in learning more about it or working with this process. Um, you know, I'm happy to help or you know offer what assistance I can. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris. Let me quickly share my screen. And uh, we do have a couple of queries in the chat that I wish to share with you. So uh, first, um, one of the queries that we have is, what are some unanswered questions that you think can be answered with multi-omics that could not be answered with a single type of omics data? Well, what I really get excited about now is this idea of a digital twin that we could potentially take a cell or even an organism like a bacteria or ideally a human and replicate it in a virtual environment. So then that way, if you monkey with the digital twin, you can then begin to predict how your actual twin would respond. And I think that's where we can really get into some good areas in individualized medicine. Thank you so much. And then um, the next question is, how can data visualization and data integration techniques used to facilitate multi-omic meta-analysis? And what publicly available tools are available um, well, as far as the what publicly available tools are available, there's Google for that. And those are constantly changing. They're constantly updating and revamping. So, you know, Google is your friend uh, in that regard. If you would repeat the first question, that would be terrific. Sure. Uh, so how can data visualization and data integration techniques used to facilitate multi-omics meta -analysis? Well, I mean, people are tend to be visual creatures. So anytime that you can put your data into something that is visually pleasing and easy to understand, you're more likely to get people to buy in um, and to understand and use slash adapt your, your methodology. Um, so definitely visualization and integration you know, is a huge part of it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's weighted any heavier than say predictive accuracy 
or the ability to, you know, learn something biologically from your system. Thank you so much. And then we have uh, another query. All right. Uh, it looks like Dr. Raghav has raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Raghav, could you? Yes. Hello, Dr. Lara. Great Hello. talk. Uh, you compared your methodology with the G-set enrichment analysis and also spoke a little bit about the panel uh, 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 generation. Can you please let, elaborate on that? What uh, excess or extra information your methodology adds than simply uh, performing a gene set enrichment analysis and identifying patterns associated with that? Okay, um, so first off, let me clarify something. Uh, the methodology uses gene set enrichment analysis. Uh, so the same limitations that apply to gene set enrichment analysis inherently do in apply to this technology. Now, where most people use gene set enrichment analysis is basically to take a gene set that represents a pathway and apply it to a gene signature to just basically say, is this pathway over or, or sorry, up or down regulated in my um, data? What this does is it takes a whole pathway approach. So rather than just looking at selected pathways from gene set enrichment analysis, you're effectively looking at all of the pathways at once. And I have seen people recently start to do that in their papers as kind of like a shotgun method, which is awesome. But rather than just using it as a shotgun method, the Biomoma actually uses another data set as query in order to find which pathways are most associated with your disease state, and then further uses gene set analysis for verification and random modeling. Excuse me, again, my throat's giving me okay. trouble. Um, but okay. anyway, I, I hope that helped answer your question. Yes, 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 perfectly, perfectly. I mean, if, if I may add, so then uh, you add a layer of resolution that is uh, not being covered by gene set enrichment analysis a standard approach. Am I correct in that regard? Correct. And that's just from the one level. <laughs> Once you start going multi-omic, you're in a whole new ballpark. Of course. Of course. Thank you very much for the time. Yeah, Excellent. you're welcome. Great question. All right. And I can see that Tanmoy has raised his hand. Tanmoy, could you please ask your query? Yes, ma'am. I was just asking that uh, as a student of uh, as a student of medical biotechnology, I want to ask you that what is the purpose? Can we use it in a clinical stage? Because initially the bacteria grow very less, and when we put it into the wet lab and culture, it does not give us any result. But within a two weeks, it is uh, it makes a huge amount of uh, infection stages it the, raises the infection but so how can we control this using bioinformatics um well here it would be a lot easier for me to discuss it based on an actual example in the clinic i haven't had too much problem in terms of comparing different states so for example, one data set that I was looking at uh, was comparing HIV positive and negative, well, one data set was adults, the second data set was children. But regardless, they were positive and negative HIV people. And then some of them had active tuberculosis, some of them had latent tuberculosis, and then some had, you know, normal lungs. I, I don't want to say normal tuberculosis, but you understand not on TV. Um, and so there it was kind of like um, a time course clinically because the latent TB is likely going to be like the remission of a prior infection with TB that could reemerge later. And so we were trying to find, you know, which pathways or what cellular mechanisms were keeping the TB kind of dormant from a human biology standpoint. So from that side, clinically, we haven't had too much of a problem. Um, 
I will acknowledge that this technology, uh, this idea is not great with single cell. Uh, so you do need bulk, but you know, a minimum of three flasks or three test tubes or three Petri dishes per condition is enough to give you a standard T test. And once you have a standard T score, you can rank your genes and make your pathway signatures and, and go on from usual. And you know, the Antibiotic resistance uh, with MRSA and Pseudomonas were all based on, you know, N of three per group. So smaller sample sizes don't really seem to affect it. The quality of the data will, though. You do need good RNA extraction. I hope I answered that yeah. question. Yes, ma'am. And one thing is that when we grow TV culture, TV culture takes a lot of time to grow. It takes Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can take weeks. So oh, yeah. that is one problem in uh, when we are doing diagnosis because the time lost in growing that culture can sometimes be fatal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to argue that. There's not much anything can be done to speed that up. I'd yeah. kind of be concerned if there was. <laughs> Okay, thank you for answering that part. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much, Jack and Moy, for asking that query. And there are some more queries for you. That is, uh, Chimasha is asking, um, are there any meta-analysis done on Parkinson's disease? Um, I mean, have I done it? A little bit. Um, I unfortunately cannot share that data because it's part of a partnership with a pharma company. Um, but we have used it for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for um, Rett syndrome, for you know some neurological disorders like that. So can it be done? Yes. Um, I find that when you're dealing with the neurological disorders, the biggest challenge, there's two challenges. One is de clearly defining what condition you're talking about. Alzheimer's is probably the worst because when you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you really don't know what its root cause is. You just understand that this is, you know, a type of dementia. So the data kind of gets scattered and it's hard then to tease out, you know, certain genes or pathways because, you know, you could have someone that's getting Alzheimer's because of a prion disease or someone that's got Alzheimer's because of a plaque buildup or, you know, various things tend to contribute to Alzheimer's. It's a phenotype, not a mechanism. <clears throat> so in that case, it's a problem. The other challenge has been part of the brain. So if you're taking samples from, you know, the cerebellum versus the frontal cortex, obviously your gene transcription is going to be different. And a lot of data sets just put brain and you're stuck with this, well, where is it in the brain? And then you get the noise from different parts of the brain when you're trying to do the meta-analysis. So those kind of things are considerations that if, if you can design your experiment, you know, if you have access to clinic or the lab and can design an experiment where you're consistently taking the same part of the brain or the same tissue type, that's definitely helpful going into any bioinformatic analysis. Thank you so much. And I have received a follow-up on the previous question that I've asked, how can okay. data vision and uh, data integration, what available tools are there? Uh, I believe um, the participant is asking, are there any specific tools that you would recommend? I could go on forever. It really depends on what you need to do. Perhaps you could just give a few examples for the participant. What are they doing? Uh, no information on that. Yeah. Let's say um, <laughs> about the cancer. Well, again, like, what are you doing? Are you doing protein modeling? Are you trying to find copy number variation? Are you annotating a genome? You know, there's so many tools out there that the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what do I want to get out of this data? And is this the right data that I should be using to answer the question? A lot of times I'll get data, look at it and be like, yeah, well, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question. So I either need to find better data 
or I change my question. Depends on what I need to be able to do with the project. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can get this where, you know, maybe BioMoma predicts some genes, but some of those are hypothetical proteins. Now I need to start going into protein modeling, things like FIRE2. Um, I would have said 3D ligand site, but for some reason they're having trouble recently. Um, Sybil or any sort of, you know, protein modeling, docking program, stitch, string, et cetera. Not usually what I deal with, but, you know, if I need to, they're there. So really depends on what you're doing. And then uh, we have one query on how can machine learning algorithms be integrated with the multi-omics metana? <laughs> uh, trade secrets are fun. Um, basically, what I would like to do in the future is to actually incorporate deep learning, because what you're seeing here is already considered machine learning artificial intelligence, but we can make it more sophisticated. So adding things like a deep neural network to analyze the signatures instead of gene set enrichment analysis could give a better outcome or a different outcome um, and has yet to be done. It's something, you know, as I said, kind of working on that sort of thing. But there are challenges associated with that. Um, GSEA is already well established. It's well documented. You don't have that whole black box part of a deep neural network, um, or sorry, you, yeah, you don't have that black box with GSEA that you do with the deep neural network. So yeah, there's a lot of room to expand this. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Now we would like to move on to the next part of uh, today's symposium, which is price distribution for the poster presentation. So the prizes will be awarded in the category Best Technical and Research Project on a Competitive Topic, Promising Research Direction for Future Potential, and Most Innovative Approach in an Established Domain. So with that, let me first invite uh, the first participant who has won the third prize, which is uh, Chimasha Indini from Edinburgh Napier University, Sri Lanka. So Chimasha, congratulations. Could you please unmute yourself and let us know? What are your thoughts? Jamasha, are you there? I just saw Can your name. Yes, you congratulations, Jamasha. Yes, you're perfectly all. And I would like to thank uh, the entire Omics Logic and Pine Biotech team for giving us this opportunity to present the um, uh, re our research. And um, a special thanks goes out to um, Sri Gauri, Dr. Raghav, and Sonalika for all the generous support and guidance given to me throughout the program. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please stay in the meeting. I would like to ask you a few more queries before you leave. Let me announce the okay. next uh, second second prize winner for the Pulsar Presentation Competition, which is Tanmoy Biswas, who is a medical biotechnology student from uh, Kolkata. Congratulations, Tanmoy. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. So it was a nice learning curve for me and for every things in the medical community. I had this question for so long. Now, at least I know how to solve the problem. It's just the tip of the iceberg. And thank you for Dr. Raghav and you all guys. You have given me lots of help from discovering data and I have disturbed you a lot during this session. So it's very nice to be a part of this. And I'm very happy to get something that I have worked on for six months and some, and it's become a very good thing now. I don't have words now. <laughs> Congratulations, Tanmoy. So um, please stay in the meeting. I'll like to follow up on some of the queries that I have for you. So now, finally, the first prize for the poster presentation competition is won by Ariana F. Rahman from Basis Chandler High School, uh, Arizona. So, Ariana, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. All right, could you please uh, admit your co-host? Uh, will you be able yeah. to un uh, turn on your camera? Um, sure, I'm actually at a, a symposium right now, but I can do my best. Um, 
I'd like to thank everyone um, for the opportunity to be at uh, the present at your symposium. And thank you so much for everything that you all have done. The poster presentation and everything was so well done. And I'm very happy that I was able to do this research. And I thank everyone from the Omics Institute I would not, uh, from and Pine Bio, I would not be able to do this without you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ariana. I believe that you have to leave the meeting very quickly since you have to yes. the... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Ariana. Yeah. So let me quickly get back to uh, other participants. So up uh, first, uh, let me ask uh, Chumasha. Chumasha, are you there? Yes, Shigari, yeah. All right. Uh, can you uh, let me know what uh, is the preparation that you went along with during the part of the poster presentation? Because uh, there might be students who might be interested to uh, uh, do their poster work as a part of symposium in the upcoming time. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would like to share? Um, yeah, I think uh, you mean uh, specifically for poster presentation or the um, generally for the research? For the poster presentation. Oh, yeah. I. I think I went online and <laughs> got some tips. And I actually, I uh, referred uh, graduate posters. And uh, from there, I got a lot of tips. All right. And what was your uh, motivation behind the research topic that you were trying to work on? Um, this is something I've been, um, the, the literature review I've been doing since my undergraduate. I always uh, wanted to do something like this, but um, only after graduating, um, I could do this. So, because um, I think yesterday was, um, yesterday also um, this was mentioned, um, even though it's all uh, like, it. I mean, it's very, all, all the bioinformatics stuff is open source and you can really learn online, but the navigation is what, uh, we sort of, it, it is the part I felt most difficult. And this is um, where I got a lot of help for that thing. If you have, uh, what I want to tell is, uh, if you have a research question um, that you're really interested, then it's very easy to navigate. And even a um, little bit of guidance, you will have, you will can, uh, you will be able to um, do the research. If you have first, Thing is to have a research question, I guess. All right, thank you so much. And I believe there are participants uh, with us in the symposium who could not join yesterday. So could you please uh, quickly give a overview about the topic that you have done, as well as uh, what do you plan on doing with your project afterwards, now that you have finished with your project? Jumasha, are you there with us or did you get disconnected? Hello, Shri Gauri. Can you please repeat the question? Sure. So uh, we have with us in, uh, in the symposium participants who were not able to attend yesterday's poster competition. So yeah. could you please uh, give a brief overview about the project that you have done and tell us about how do you plan on continuing with your project? Is it that uh, you plan on publishing or what is the... Yeah, so basically what I did is... Um two differential uh, expression analysis and gene set uh, enrichment analysis um, on uh, circular RNA profiles and um, gene expression pro profiles from Parkinson's disease. And um, what I have uh, found was, um, even though it's from two different data sets, I found um, a subset of uh, genes that are significantly enriched in um, PBMC in Parkinson's, which also encoding for circular RNAs. So um, then on there, after that, I um, did all the gene set enrichment analysis and um, find out the most significantly enriched pathways. And I am currently uh, repeating this analysis for uh, many different data sets to increase the statistical significance and confidence. And um, I'm also excited to um, see the results. Um, the, uh, what I found most challenging was to find uh, 
the oncoding genes for a set of circular RNAs, uh, circular RNAs um, because um, even though um, there are many circular RNA databases, based um, mostly um, it, they are for cancer. For Parkinson's, I found it very difficult to find um, those databases. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much exciting and I'm hoping to finish the analysis soon. Thank you so much. And do you plan on, uh, are you planning to apply for your higher studies and showcase your project? Or what is your plan? Yeah. yeah, I'm hoping to start my graduate studies in this autumn. So yeah, and also I'm um, hoping to do a um, PhD in immunology. So yeah, this will be the um, Parkinson's. This, uh, these are the studies that I always wanted to do. I'm particularly interested in the inactivation of TLR4 mediated uh, neuroinflammation in Parkinson's disease. That is the topic I've always uh, thinking about and this is a sort of a result of that. I really wanted to sort of see the question in different angles. Um, yeah, so that's the plan for now. Thank you so much, uh, Chimasha. And uh, you, we have with us uh, the mentor who guided you for your project. So um, Dr. Raghav and Sunalika, do you have any uh, reviews that you would like to share? It looks like they are not in the meeting at the moment. Hi, yeah, we are here. I think Dr. Raghav, would you like to go first? By the way, congratulations, uh, Chimasha. Thank you, Sonalika. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sonalika. And now uh, let me move on to the next participant, Tanmoy. Are you there with us? Yes. Yes. So first of all, uh, can you please introduce yourself uh, to the participants, your educational background? Yeah, I, I am Tanmay Viswas and I have done my bachelor's in medical laboratory technology from West Bengal University of Health Sciences. So actually this was the, uh, actually this was not my questions. It was the curiosity of our interns that were in the bacteriology lab. So, Actually, the curiosity was developed by somebody else and answers were found by me. So actually, the thing is, when we work with microbes and when we do the wet lab, we don't get the results. And the results that I'm seeing here are totally much more different from what results that we expect. So when we are dealing with fermented diet, we generally, we will think about everything would come down to lactobacillus and bacteria, lactobacillus types. But when I went to the research, conducted those plot makeups, then I found that lactobacillus was never present. It was present in two samples and that also was below 1%, 0.1% sometimes. So so now, now I get a picture that it's not everybody is bad. Sometimes Clostridia, which is referred as Every go if you go to every microbiologist and they had clostridia, they would say a big mafia bringing out guns and killing everything in the intestine. So it's not that clostridia has some good functions as well. So it helped me understand the basics of the microbiology for me also. So also get a knowledge about where I was wrong in the wet lab, how dry lab can intervene and solve the problems. So it's not about every every term that every microbes we classify, this is the bad and this is good. That's not the case. It depends upon the situation, how they interact with the body. It's about opportunistics to be, means you have, those people have to be present at the right place at the right time. So it's a great learning curve for me. And this thing can be implemented in, this has a huge potential. It can revolutionize the healthcare field forever. We can save time, money, resource, everything can be saved. If we combine these two together, it would be a very nice thing. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for you all guys. Dr. Raghav especially helped me developing the concepts and all, under, making me understand every small bit of it. Hey, thank you so much, Sunray. Can you also um, let us know what was the preparation that you went through to prepare your poster? Do you have any tips or tricks that you would like to share with the upcoming? Yeah, basically, basically, the thing is you have to get your concepts right from the base. Your concepts, if your concepts are right, then you can clear up much more. It's not about the poster. It's about clearing your thought process and getting much more knowledge and gathering the knowledge that you developed from this poster. This poster is just a tiny part that I have the knowledge that I have gathered. So this is just a small repository. Actually, the data present in that poster is not significant because the whole analysis was very large and it contains very much number. This is just a small part that I put in there. Right. And what do you plan on uh, doing after completing your project now that it is completed? Some students publish it. Some students like Achumasha, she is trying to uh, showcase it as part of her higher study. What about uh, your plan? Actually, I have a second round of interview of a startup. So I'm just is starting that clinical clinical round of that. I am writing a, a paper that they have given. So I'm just doing that. And hopefully I can clear that round and I can be part of them. So it's, it was a great learning. This learning helped me in this clinical and uh, this previous round of interview. And this all helped me to clear it quite easily. So I would be hopeful that clear this round also. All right. Congratulations, Tanmoy and Shimasha for the poster presentation. And uh, I wish you guys all the very best, to, including Ariana as well, although she is not here with us right now. But once again, congratulations, and we look forward to seeing you all bloom and uh, bloom in your field. Thank you so much, Shigari. Thank you, Thank you Shimasha. Thank you, Tanmoy. And with that, now I would like to pass on the stage to Sunalika to invite uh, the next speaker. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Shrivari. Shrivari, uh, Emmanuel is our next speaker. Uh, All right, I guess uh, Sonalika is having some issues. So let me just quickly share my screen and introduce him. All right, so last time we could not catch up with you, Mr. Emmanuel, but uh, this time we are glad to have you back. So let me quickly give you an introduction to uh, the next speaker, Mr. Emmanuel. He is a research fellow with uh, Helix Biogen Institute, Nigeria a research organization focused on accelerating research in life through in-depth technical skills, training, and capacity building in bioinformatics and genomics. Emmanuel, Emmanuel graduated with a bachelor's degree in medical, uh, in medical uh, bi laboratory science from prestigious Ladoke University of Technology from Nigeria. And he is currently a member of the Education and Internship Committee of the International Society for Computational Biology Student Count. He is also a fellow of the Open Life Science Mentorship Program, where he is designing a bioinformatics outreach for university students and high schoolers in Nigeria. So, and today he'll be talking about bioinformatics capacity building opportunities for students and young professionals at, with Helix Biogen Institute as a case study. So with that brief introduction, the stage is all yours, Mr. Matt. Oh, um, good day, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. It's um, it's evening in Nigeria. Uh, can anyone hear me? So I uh, you know I'm communicating well. Hello. Yes, you're perfectly audible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, first I I would say um, coming. Uh, I, I would say um, this is going to be a brief discussion and 
I'm going to be starting with my story. Uh, uh, like I've been introduced, I'm Emmanuel Adam and I'm, I'm a graduate of, uh, of medical laboratory science. Um, yeah, so um, today I'll be talking about opportunities for, for young people, you know, capacity building, which my organization, Ellis Biogen, you know, is involved. So uh, I'm coming. Yes, Emmanuel, you're perfectly audible. Uh, if you have slides, could you please share your screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, ca can you see my slide? So this is Ellis Biogen, and um, we are a research biomedical uh, research hub, improving healthcare, vaccine development, and diagnostics to diagnostic kits development and um, biologics through artificial intelligence and machine learning to prevent and control outbreaks of infectious disease. And our research institute is located in Obomosho, or your state, Nigeria. That is the southwestern part of Nigeria. And um, it has been a wonderful platform for young people like myself and other young people out there, you know, to get themselves equipped with knowledge and skills in bioinformatics. I remember when I finished school in 2019, when I before I went for my one-year compulsory internship at the hospital because of my background as a healthcare professional, I met my mentor who is the executive director and principal investigator for this research institute. That is the person of Dr. Elijah Ladipo. And he got me interested in bioinformatics, though I was I was introduced to bioinformatics in my fourth year because my my discipline, like my course, my undergraduate degree, was a five year course. So he, I were introduced to bioinformatics and molecular biology, but it was looking abstract, and we never knew what in what way bioinformatics could be applied in. I don't really want to go back because I I know would have been told about how the you know the fields in bioinformatics. Then he got me interested. You know, he got me very interested in this field. And I remember I volunteered in, um, I volunteered in the planning committee for the first bioinformatics conference in Nigeria. And from there, that sparked a flame for me in bioinformatics. And I'm really excited about the journey. It has been, uh, it has been adventurous. It has been, you know, it, uh, it has come with a lot of opportunity. And I want every younger person out there that bioinformatics is a field that you can get yourself, um, get yourself into. So we've been trusted by world leading companies, and our vision is to be the best leading translational research institute in biomedical sciences, providing high level of training, capacity building to give inspiration, and to encourage innovation. So. Um, in Africa, we, I, I, my, I and a group of young, I, I and a group of young researchers, we conducted the research three years ago, and we found that with the high level of awareness, or will I say the without, uh, or going out uh, level of awareness of for bioinformatics education in Africa, we are still um, African has not gotten to that point of having a good number. output of bioinformaticians, and that is a cause of concern, Rick. We could see how tools of genomics and bioinformatics came being in developing vaccines. So um, I really want to appreciate what Omis Logic is doing. I, we could see and appreciate your work in Africa. I also want to appreciate Omis Logic for also partnering with us in some of our, some of our trainings. Uh, yet, you don't need to be, you don't you don't need to have it all. When I mean have it all, you don't necessarily need to have an advanced skill before you start your career journey in bioinformatics. You could pick up internship programs. You could keep you could, you could pick up online courses, and you find yourself in that journey. And bioinformatics is not abstract, even though it's an interdisciplinary um, um, field which includes statistics, which includes um, um, biology, 
which also includes you know you know you know computer science when you talk about computer programming but you can always find your 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 stay your fifth in bioinformatics like uh, my background is more medical sciences um uh, i i never i i never had that um thorough thorough education in computer programming but bioinformatics has exposed me to things like machine learning and computer programming and um I, i'm bringing it out here to see the works that we as Ellis biology had done we've done a couple of trainings that we have you know up, um, upcoming trainings like the intensive workshop on mr vaccine design what we do for our organization and what makes us quite different from other organizations is that we are there to equip students young professionals in being involved in translational research i'm of the opinion of science for africa by africans the truth of the matter is um as Africans, I'm, I'm speaking to Africans down this space and also other people from low middle income countries. The West will not always solve our problems. The West will not always solve our problems. But we can be up in our games to solve our problems. We know our, our challenge, we know our challenges, we know what we face. And we could we are the best people to provide solutions and that's why i'm calling on every young person over here i want you to shoot your shots at taking an interest in bioinformatics i know why you judge this symposium is because you want to get engaged and omis logic at itself as an organization is a good platform you can start your interest in bioinformatics and because of the because of the mentorship i would gotten from ellis biology I've been able to, I've been able to take part in, you know, teaching, in, you know, in, in teaching some online courses for young people. You know, just a young boy like me, less than thirty, I've been able to, you know, take in some courses even without a master's. And this has been a platform and privilege. Currently, we have over four fifty students undergoing internship in our lab. I don't know. Last week, we had some of them. Um, in the last one month, we've had some of them work on designing vaccines for some infectious diseases that are really baffling in Africa, like negated tropical disease. If you go through our, our LinkedIn, our LinkedIn, our Twitter, our, our, our Twitter account, you would see some of these beautiful things that you 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 would, you would see some of these benefits that young people do papers that we've published you know adding value to the community of science i i are you, are you still with me hello yes we can hear you okay and um um Currently, we are pushing out a project with Open Life Science. I don't know how many of us know about. I don't. I don't know how many of us know about Open Life Science. If you know about Open Life Science, you could just put it in your chat box. Open Life Science. Open Life Science. It's um. It's a sixteen-week mentorship program for young people, young professionals, and students. You know, um, to develop interest of open life science in, in open science. And also to contribute to, to contribute to the body of science. Currently, I and a team of of three people are currently working on um, bioinformatics university outreach, where we could reach out to you know university students and get them equipped with skills in bioinformatics and um, bioinformatics and, um, and and genomics. I'm going to be sending a slide. To the organizers so they can share with us so i can put all these things in here because i'm having issues with you know my slide at the moment and um secondly as a young person you could join societies which are bioinformatics centered we have societies like the international society for computational biology we also have a society called african society 
of bioinformatics and computer bi biology. From there, what these societies do for you is to provide you platform for personal and professional development. Currently, I belong to the Student Council of the International Society for Computational Biology. Yes, you don't need to have all the old skills as a bioinformatician because bioinformatics is a growing space. But you could add value. You could contribute, you know, to development of bioinformatics in your country, in your in your location. So currently, I serve on the educational uh, education and internship committee of the student council of the International Society of Computational Biology. And currently, we are developing. You know, we are working with sister organizations to, you know build platforms to create platforms that young people could get interested in bioinformatics you can't talk about any field both in physical sciences in life sciences in agricultural sciences that you're going to apply bioinformatics even to physics you can apply bioinformatics in physics you can apply bioinformatics in chemistry you can apply bioinformatics in agriculture you can you can um, apply bioinformatics as a tool, as a field, as a discipline, also in medicine. And there is a need for Africa. I also want to plead with Omi Logic. Um, we want, you know, you as an organization to invest more in Africa. We have a lot as a challenge for us in Africa. One is the infrastructure to, you know, the infrastructure in um in in getting you know in getting ourselves rooted in bioinformatics one of the infrastructure is in africa we have unstable internet facilities internet subscription is quite expensive and when you want to run you know genomic data you know how much you know data you're going to get you know internet subscription you're going to get to in analyzing you, you could analyze a genomic data for over for a couple of days and wait and another issue we have is um low power supply you know some of our communities don't have access to electricity these are th things that are standing in as ch challenges to us in africa also the economic the economic um, situation of africa is very poor there's a need for uh, i don't know how many of us here are representing organizations and i want to plead when you are creating programs training programs for africans please put in the economic the economic the economic uh, 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 putting economic factor of what Africans are facing, like Nigeria, we have ninety percent of Nigerians. Nigeria being the most populated, um, uh, pop, you know, the most populous black nation in 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 in, in the world, and in Africa, we have ninety percent of us living, you know, ninety percent of us living below, uh, living at that poverty line. So some of us won't be able to, you know, afford trainees of let's say two fifty dollars. Even fifty dollars. There's a need for us to, you know, inculcate open science. There's a need of us bringing in programs, training programs that no one, whether in Africa, whether in other low medium, middle, um, low medium income countries or low income countries, no one is being prevented in partaking in this training. And that is what we've been doing in Ellis Biology. We've organized free or uh, free programs that, you know, students. Uh, students can easily assess this training. Yes, yeah, sometimes we'll say, okay, paying for, for the training is going to make such people committed, but many of us can't really afford this. Many of us cannot really afford this. So there's a need of us putting up scholarships in helping, you know, young people, students getting involved in 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 bio in, you know, in bioinformatics in Nigeria as of today we have over, we have over two hundred universities in Nigeria and up to eighty percent of these universities students in these universities even academic staff in these universities have not come in contact with bioinformatics so there is a need for us to create you know that training and also mentorship. There's a place of mentorship. Currently, I'm a, I, 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 I'm a team of re young researchers. We are trying to, we are, we are working on conducting a research to assess the level of awareness, knowledge, and practice of bioinformatics among you know, undergraduate students 
and postgraduate students in Nigeria. So we've known that many people get equipped with bioinformatics, but in Nigeria as of today, that create a platform where even when we train young people, young people, students, they can easily apply these skills. They can easily apply these skills. But I want to say that Africa is, is a good market for us to get people equipped with bioinformatics. Africa is, is loaded. If you're talking about medicine, Africa is loaded with a couple of edge challenges ranging from infectious disease to non-communicable disease like cancer. We have, we are still battling with malaria. Currently, malaria candidates, malaria. Zero to five um, years of, you know, uh, children between zero to five years die of malaria. Millions of students die of malaria. There's a need of us developing vaccines, and this is where we could, you know, get young researchers involved. There's the need of us putting out outreaches to get, and I appreciate what Omis Logic is doing, getting high school students involved in bioinformatics. I want to plead with Omis Logic. You could step down such program for high school. I was really excited to see those who won, you know, you know, you know, who won prizes for, you know, the symposium. We could step down trainings for high school, for high school students. For high school students, it is high time we get to introduce, you know, high school students to bio, you know, to bioinformatics. When I was in, um, fifteen years ago, when I was in high school, it was just, uh, it was just like a form of peer pressure. My 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 colleagues were choosing medicine, uh, medicine engineering. We didn't even know what we wanted to use the profession, you know, this, this career pursuit, this career, you know, these disciplines for. But when we come in to introduce, you know, high school students to bioinformatics as an early stage, it's going to help them create that interest. We need to build innovators. We need to build, we need to build a team of people who can think at early stage to provide solution, to provide solution. And that's what I want to plead with. That's why I want to plead with um I want to plead with every organization represented here. Let us invest in bioinformatics. Let's invest in bioinformatics. Ellis Biogen is doing well. I want to say um uh, I, I, I really love the interest, the enthusiasm of you know students and young professionals to bioinformatics. But we are we have limited research institute. We have limited you know, you know, training outfits that can provide this bioinformatic, bioinformatic, you know, you know, training. I think as organizations, we also need to invest also in um in, in you know train the trainer courses, train the trainer courses. You know, we could develop research clubs, bioinformatics research clubs in our various universities. You know, to get people, you know, to get people aware about bioinformatics. These are things we need to look in. These are things we need to look at. And I look forward that when we are done with our research to us, you know, to assess the level of awareness of bioinformatics education. Students and graduate students, we are going to be able to share with our city organized upcoming, you know, symposium. We could really share too provide you know we should solutions which are evidence-based and how to be evident and how to make it evidence-based is when we get in the third Is anyone there? Hi. I'm able to hear you. Yeah. We can hear you. Well, your yeah. voice is breaking. Maybe you can change the position. What do you say? Your voice is breaking, I think, for like 30 seconds ago. 
30 seconds ago. Okay, I said, I, I, I okay, I said, I, I, I said, um, if there are questions, let's feel free to ask questions so I can, I, I, I can reply. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer questions. But I promise to get us slides so we could go through, you know, some links you could, you know, get across to us. Yeah, over to you, moderator. Yeah, is anybody here? Hello, is anyone there? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Are there questions? You could... Okay, you, you, you could feel free to uh, ask what. Thank you okay. so much, uh, Emmanuel, for okay. the uh, insightful talk. So if anyone from the participants are uh, you know, having any kind of queries or something, they can uh, please unmute themselves and they can ask uh, the speaker directly. Please feel free to ask any kind of question. Okay, still then, I have received a few queries from the participant. So the first query, Emmanuel, uh, is what essential suggestions can be proposed to aspiring researchers pursuing a career in bioinformatics and seeking to join Helix Biogen's team in Africa? Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm Okay, what are the necessary um, essential suggestions? I would say, uh, one of um, we have Omis Logic here, and um, I really appreciate what Omis Logic is doing. And um, Omis Logic, as I know, uh, provides internship, virtual internship, and research fellowship. You could really gain skills there. Take up online courses in bioinformatics. Um, you could take up courses in um, online courses. Then I also advise you could also seek in, you know, um, and so on, like, how would I put it? You could seek in internships, like Ellis Biogen, you know, gives in internship, both online internship and physical, um, and in-person internship. So I'm gonna be sharing in, when I will share my slide, I'm gonna be putting in, you could just get into our website, Ellis Biogen, you could just browse it out. Um, on that, the learning and career, you could see options to join internship. Almost Logic also provides such internships, so you could you could get in. Then another beauty, another beautiful thing I would say is, um, and I I see that in Omis Logic and also Ellis Biology, they have community you could belong to, community of aspiring researchers or professionals in bioinformatics. Please join in those communities. In those communities, maybe join their you know their social media pages, join platforms that these communities build on, like WhatsApp. Um, they could share, you know, in you find that in those communities, you find, you know, opportunities shared. You could find opportunities to, you know, to to collaborate, to network with other inspiring, you know, um, 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 young folks, professionals in bioinformatics. Then thirdly, get a mentor. Get the mentor. I know we've been all here today, you know, listening to since yesterday. We've been listening to, you know, you know, wonderful speakers. They've shared in their LinkedIn profiles. Connect with them. Connect with them. Connect with them. You know, they could mentor you. They could mentor you. So um, currently, Ellis Biogen Institute runs a campus about scholarship program, which we are going to be opening again this year. Just um, follow us on our social media platforms. I'm going to be sharing that with us here. So when do such about uh, campus abortionship um, 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 training is out um, on, our, on our social media spaces, you could you could join, you could join, you could join. I think I've answered those questions. I have a community, join a community of you know or a, a bioinformatics community. I have a good mentor. Partake in trainings, not just getting yourself trained. Go for hands on, get yourself involved in projects. There's a place of you seeking in knowledge and there's a place of applying 
those knowledge and skills. And that is what I love about Omis logic. That's what I love about Ellis Biology. We put in the skills, we will help you put in the skills you've learned in bioinformatics. Because if you don't apply bioinformatics, bioinformatics looks abstract. If you're not finding yourself, if you're not finding, if you're not finding yourself using those skills you've got in, you find yourself not being productive. You could forget those things you've learned. So go for go for trainings that will put you on projects. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm done. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, Emmanuel, well said. So there's one more question uh, from uh, one of our participants, and the question is: What are the different strategic research initiatives that could help address challenges associated with computational biology in Africa? So I'll repeat the question once again. Uh, what are the different strategic research initiatives that would help address challenges associated with computational biology in Africa? Hello, uh, can you hear me, Manuel? So could you please tell us some uh, different strategies like uh, research uh, initiative strategies which maybe Helix Biogen is using so as to spread more about computational biology involve as many people who are interested in bioinformatics or data science and uh, to get start with their research or get start with their career in this particular field. So uh, any strategy which comes into your mind and will, you would like to share with the participant here in symposium. Okay, I, I missed I missed that question. Could you could you go? My network went off. Okay, no problem. I'll just repeat once again. So the question yeah. is, what are the different strategic research initiatives that would help address challenges associated with computational biology in Africa? I guess uh, the participant wants to ask, like, uh, are there any research initiatives or are there any kind of strategy which Helix Biogen as an institute is following uh, so as to address as many challenges which uh, like an uh, African participant or a student might face so as to get, uh, you know, kickstart with their career in bioinformatics or data science or any other domain? Okay. So uh... what comes into your mind? Yeah. Okay, what comes into my mind? Um, yes. um, one, 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 one of the things that this biology is doing to to help you know young 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 professionals and students start up a kind of bioinformatics. Currently, we we are affiliated with um an, a with an university in Nigeria called Precious Cornerstone, where we offer diploma programs. Because currently in Nigeria and even Africa as as a continent, we just have a few universities that offer bioinformatics at undergraduate undergraduate level we have you know few, a couple of few who offers it at um, um also at master's level so what we do uh, at this stage we we, we run in internship we also run postgraduate diplomas where right. um where we you know with affiliated um you know um um what would i call it affiliated universities to provide these trainings for you know students and young people. Then another thing again is um H3 Bionet, H3 Bionet, which is a top. I don't know how many of us know about H3 Bionet. H3 Bionet is a top um, um bioinformatics capacity building platform in Africa, and is resided in um, University of Cape Town. Uh, we also the, the what H3 Bionet does is to host you know periodically trainings in bioinformatics. So we also, um, they give room to collaborate with, with research institutes to serve as classrooms to host these trainings. These trainings go in an average span of time of um, three to four months. So we run those trainings and it's free. And it's free. Then organizations like Omis Logic, we also partner with Omis Logic to also get through you know, the African populace. But when it comes to, uh, I, I think what we need to do is to, um, for Africans, I mean, Research institutes for us to advocate and make awareness for bioinformatics. Maybe we should. I, I, I would suggest if we have other African organizations on the call, we need to, you know, sit up and make proposals for, you know, universities to buy into the idea to run bioinformatics as uh, as an undergraduate degree. 
But even providing, even running bioinformatics as an undergraduate degree, how many trainers do we have? How many people have, you know, their advanced degrees in bioinformatics? So there's a need for us to, you know, push, push, you know, push, um, push that advocacy, that advocacy is to help many institutions run bioinformatics, you know, training, both at undergraduate and postgraduate. I know of a university here in Nigeria. I don't know if many of us know Covenant University. It is a faith-based university, and um, they run bioinformatics at uh, masters and PhD, and they give in scholarship. So you could check Covenant University, uh, the bioinformatics research lab. They run, you know, uh, master's degree programs for uh, uh, for for bioinformatics, and it comes with scholarship. Also, University of Cape Town does that too. You could, you could, you could, you could, you could, you could, you know, get involved in that. But first, you could build your skills without having this advanced. Uh, with you could, you could build that knowledge and skills in bioinformatics without even having an advanced skill. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. And if there are any more questions, you can please put in the chat so that Emmanuel can address. And I would now like to welcome Dr. Gus Kasulich. Dr. Gus, good morning. Good morning. So uh, before you start with your talk, I would like to introduce you. Dr. Kasulich is a professor of virology and biotechnology in the Department of Pathobiological Sciences. And he's the director of the Division of Biotechnology and Molecular Medicine. He is the director of NIH-funded Center in Experimental Infectious Disease Research and the director of the NIH-funded Louisiana Biomedical Research Network for Molecular and Cell Biology 4. Dr. Kasulis has extensively utilized viral vectors for vaccine development and cancer treatment. His other research interests lie in the structure and function of proteins and glycoproteins, the use of virus-like particles for drug delivery, bioinformatics, and the development of new drugs to combat infectious diseases. We are pleased to have you amongst us, sir. Over to you. Okay, great. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, let's see, where are we here? It's probably this one. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Uh, we can see your computer screen right now. Yeah, let me see now. How about now? Yeah, we can see. Okay. All right. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I guess depending where you are, morning or afternoon or evening. Um, as uh, indicated, I'm the um, director of um, the um, Division of Biotechnology and Molecular Medicine Department head here at the LSU School of Early Medicine. And I'm also the principal investigator of the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, which is uh, funded by uh, NIH, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, and it has a priority and mandatory priority to promote uh, data science and bioinformatics in the state uh, of Louisiana. So I'm just going to touch um, uh, a few topics here, um, just more of descriptive. I'm not going to go into high-end uh, data science and bioinformatics. That's probably a different talk. But I will discuss uh, some of the initiatives that uh, NIH has started relating to uh, data science and bioinformatics. And then um, uh, tell you how the uh, NEPI, which is the National uh, Association of Idea Principal Investigators, that represents um, 23 states in Puerto Rico, that have similar programs. Uh, there is a one of those major grants per state with a mandatory focus on data science and bioinformatics. And we all work together um, and we do have regional meetings. Uh, there are four regional meetings. Um, the Southeastern Regional Meeting is in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, September 14 through 17. And there are regional meetings in uh, three other areas of the states. Uh, the um, Southeastern Regional uh, Meeting in, Carl in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, will be also the Regional Data Science and Bioinformatics Conference for the seven states that are represented, Puerto Rico, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, West Virginia, 
um, South Carolina. Uh, so we're all going to be there in September, and there will be a two-day data science and mathematics conference in addition to what are we doing for the national meeting. Uh, December 12 through 14, we have the National uh, IDEA uh, Symposium for Biomedical Science Excellence with 1,500 people attending. Uh, that was a remote virtual conference um, across the entire uh, network of 24 states. Uh, and there was a lot that um, information that was transmitted from NIH, as well as other um, researchers from undergraduates to graduates to principal investigators to clinical translational people, a lot of that having to do with data management and bioinformatics. So let me begin then by, um, uh, obviously, uh, I think we live in an era uh, where data science and bioinformatics are extremely important. And it is exponentially the need for bioinformaticians uh, that understand also biology uh, is acute and is exponentially growing uh, for uh, currently as well as in the future. So uh, that really uh, creates a uh, bioinformatics on demand, uh, uh, having a uh, need to train um, high school students, undergraduates, uh, and beyond in understanding data science and bioinformatics principles. So obviously because of the human genome, human genome project, there was the obics revolution that everybody's familiar, and that includes genomes, proteomes, transcriptomes, epigenetics, omics, whatever omics. We're now talking about um, uh, metabolomics and um, um, in, in addition to transcriptomics and proteomics, ep ep epigenome, epigenetics, carbohydrate databases, as well as metabolomics now. And all of those are really deposited in huge databases. And one of the big... Um, uh, 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 issue right now is that we don't have people that are knowledgeable how to access the, that, those databases and even to compare the databases. For instance, if you have a, a database that relate uh, to genomes for cancer and it had a database for people that are involved in diabetes uh, or you know uh, any other issue, how could you could cross mine those databases to uh, produce uh, in, in silico results of what may be comorbidity parameters and things like that. So we live in an evolution in a uh, very interesting era where bioinformatics is essential. Um, the challenge is to have a proper genome annotation, uh, sequence assemblies, physical mapping. There's a lot that's been done now with uh, protein structure and function. Uh, as you know, AlphaFold is a major program out there that now uh, fairly accurately predicts the structure of specific uh, proteins based on the amino acid sequence and pre-existing information on databases. Uh, that allows you then to um, model how proteins interact with each other, so protein per interactions, to find binding motifs, uh, to look into transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation, histone modification, methylation, and ultimately uh, helping a drug discovery. Uh, so bioinformatics depends on a lot of databases, some of the more classical databases you see here, GenBank, EMBL, BLAST, and then algorithms for high th uh, through, uh, throughout data analysis have been created. So one of the most important things right now is this, this um, uh, fact that we have uh, a tremendous amount of information, trillions of bytes of information into specific databases. And those could be generalized that include DNA, protein, carbohydrate structure, 3D structure, and so on, as well as specialized databases that relate to ESTs, SDS, SNPs, RNA, genomes, protein families, pathways, microarray data. So the bigger challenge right now is how do we train our people to access those data, uh, work with them, find things of interest to their specific project or interest. And then how do you cross check or cross utilize platforms and databases together uh, to uh, come up with uh, potential uh, biomarkers of any kind relating to a disease, specific disease aspect. In fact, the NIH is recognizing this, just opened an opportunity for people to get major grants, R01 grants, not necessarily doing anything else, but really combining databases and querying them for specific outcomes. So no wet lab work, no laboratory. Really, if you're really good at it and you're a computer person and you'll be able to uh, look at databases, you could actually get a major NIH grant. So um, in terms of overview of databases, uh, database indexing and specification of search terms becomes important, archiving, 
uh, the uh, all these data that uh, are generated by uh, next gen sequencing facilities and get ways to archives exist now, as you know, when CBI, Antre, PubMed, XPASI, SwissProd, a lot of them that uh, all of us on a daily basis we're using to query for other um, uh, DNA um, and uh, protein or structures even of proteins themselves. So um, uh, among the generalized DNA protein carbohydrate databases, for examples, you have the EMBL uh, with the nucleotide sequence, the gen bank that everybody's familiar with, and the, the uh, DDBJ, the DNA data bank in Japan, and there are a bunch of other ones in uh, Europe uh, as well as uh, in Japan and elsewhere. And uh, this is an example of the NCBI for the National Center of Biotechnology Information. Everybody hopefully is familiar with this. It's free to everybody, regardless where, the, where you are in the world. And it was established in 1988 and is a, uh, it's a public database. And it's a very tremendous tool for computational biology. And they're also developing software tools for analyzing genome data and disseminating biomedical information. Uh, all that for the goal better understanding of molecular processes affecting human health uh, and disease. Uh, XPAS is another uh, uh, expert protein analysis system that's available and it's, uh, widely used um, uh, by a lot of the researchers. And of course, the generalized DNA protein carbohydrate databases. Um, there's only just a sample of what exists out there. So if you actually Google for uh, databases for bioinformatics, you can see a lot of them. You can also go to the uh, Central Disease Control they have a lot of clinical and other databases, as well as the NCI, National Cancer Institute, or NIAD, uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and they will point you to databases of information they have for viruses, bacteria, uh, cancer parameters, and so on. So um, again, for carbohydrate databases, uh, CarbBank is an example. 3D structures, so you have the PDB, Protein Data Bank, CureBar, RCSB in the US, the ABMSD, uh, the UK, the NDB, which is uh, the Rutgers University, as well as others. So the question is, we have this uh, now trillion of informational bytes, and we have all these huge databases. And if you really look at the number of databases that include cancer data, obesity data, diabetes data, um, all sorts of disparities uh, data, um, the bigger issue is, you know, how do we harness all this information to, our, to be able to understand uh, how disease uh, progresses? And ultimately, how do we use and harness this information to go from omics uh, to system biology and then from bench to bedside to be able to really come up with uh, new methodologies and approaches to treat disease uh, from data really to knowledge? Um, and ultimately, uh, this would lead to computational system biology, which is an acute need, uh, what do we call translational bioinformatics and bio-knowledge engineering to be able to really engineer things based on information that you could garner in silico, uh, whether that would be uh, modeling uh, 3D structures or proteins or uh, working on more sophisticated algorithms to make sense of signaling pathways, you know, when it starts and what is first, second, third, and how does the cell respond to specific uh, stimuli. So um, where is that going? I'll give you an example of that. And we had in our re uh, recent bioinformatics conference, uh, I guess actually it was last year, we had um, uh, the opportunity to have uh, Michael Snyder, who is the chair of the Department of Genetics at Stanford Medical School. And he's the founder of QBio. And this is just a picture of the QBio uh, and the vision for QBio is to, uh, um, to uh, be able to generate uh, new ways to diagnose and ultimately treat disease. And what they're doing in essence, uh, and I'll show a couple of slides on that, is really combining the plethora of clinical data, imaging data, MRI for instance, with uh, genomic, transcriptional, proteomic, metabolomic data. And the goal is to establish a um, digital twin of you. Um, in fact, I'm hoping to get down there and do my own scan at some point. Uh, it costs about $3,000 to do it right now. I think it's going to get cheaper in the longer run. So basically, by developing a digital twin, you can combine all these huge data that are really personal to you, uh, use artificial intelligence then to come up with an understanding of what's your clinical status, um, potentially predict the uh, age of your specific organs, 
point to potential problems that may arise that would, in essence, um, lead into a prevention strategy for you know specific, develop uh, specific diseases that you may be at risk. So um, this is uh, another uh, picture of their website. Um, they're doing uh, a, a physical of the future, which is basically a combination of imaging, MRI, and all of that to be able to uh, build a comprehensive picture of the health and how it's changing over time. And that includes um, all the clinical samples, whether it would be blood samples, urine, clinical data that you have, uh, which is thoroughly done uh, at that, their labs, in addition to imaging and also the genomics, transcriptomics, mm -hmm. and everything else uh, beyond that. And the ultimate uh, uh, plan is to create the uh, a genomic twin, a, a digital twin um, of uh, any patient. And this is a really a primary example of how big data that have been collected uh, and now personalized because all these data refer to big databases for risk factors, identifying specific genes of interest and so on. So it's actually uh, artificial intelligence is looking at those databases, comparing your data and predicting what may or may not be uh, wrong uh, with a specific patient or what may be um, a uh, ways of things that need to be watched as you move forward uh, you know, in life. So I wanna now shift gears. Uh, I just wanted to just give you a sort of a sense of this importance of personalized health and how these big databases and really um, sort of what, uh, underline this need for understanding how to access databases, uh, use those databases, compare um, um, these databases, uh, work with cloud computing, to be able to understand and uh, deliver for specific uh, biomarkers and ultimately new therapies. So I want to also uh, explain the IDEA program for National Institute of Health. Um, so the Institutional Development Award um, IDEA was established in 1993 from NIH uh, to broaden the geographic distribution of NIH funding for biomedical behavioral research. The major observation was that um, practically 80% of all the NIH funding was going to three or four states. So NIH wanted to uh, try to encourage uh, people from states that were not as competitive with those three or four top states to be able to uh, promote biomedical research. So the uh, program fosters health-related research and enhances the competitiveness of investigators at the institutions located in states in which the aggregate success rate Publications to NIH has historically been low, and the program also serves unique populations such as rural and medically underserved communities uh, in these states. So um, this is an older slide. The 2022 it was uh, um, allocation of NIH is at 410 million, um, and uh, is approximately or close to one percent of the total NIH budget. And through our uh, nonprofit organization, we're trying to. Uh, help NIH decide to increase this uh, uh, figure even more, um, ultimately reaching at least 1.5% uh, of the NIH budget. So um, this is this funding that goes in comparison to the total NIH funding to different states. You can see here uh, in Louisiana, for instance, that uh, there were $24 million of IDEA awards out of a total awards of uh, 209 uh, million. But in certain other states, uh, you can see, for instance, North Dakota, um, the major funding for them easily comes through the IDEA program. And it's kind of very important because this uh, uh, funding that comes from this program is actually a crucial factor in generating more income and more competitive funding because um, of uh, funding of uh, graduation from these uh, funding to people that are independently funded and can compete with traditional NIH funding. So uh, these are the five IDEA funding programs, the Centers for Biomedical Research Excellence. And these are funds for new faculty hiring and flexibility for research project leaders. Uh, the graduation from here is obtaining an R1, an independent award. The IMBRI uh, is uh, 24 active awards, 24 states, 23 Puerto Rico. I'm the PI on one of these awards, IMBRI Award here in Louisiana. And one of the most important things that's developed right now and emphasis in IMBRI is to really promote cloud computing training uh, through Google and Amazon through specific arrangements with Google and Amazon. We also have the IDEA CTRs that are what we call mini CTSAs, Clinical Translational uh, uh, Research Centers. 
and those um, fund basic science and translational science, uh, trying to train uh, physicians and others to be able to do biomedical research, but ultimately uh, translating that to their bedside. We also, uh, part of this program, there's co-funding. So if you really have an R1 and R15 and a STEM uh, application for uh, equipment, you could receive co-funding, even if you're not within the uh, funding range of the categorical institute. There are also uh, regional technology transfer accelerators, four of them, and those really um, are now co-funded by the um, SBR CTR program through all the categorical institutes and has pilot programs for uh, teaching business fundamentals for technology core directors, as well as also seeding pilot projects that uh, relate to the development of patented technologies and so on. So um, there are also collaborations and participation in NIH-wide initiatives. So the NIGMS program uh, is now co-funded um, up to um, um, 50 million or so from other categorical institutes. And that relates to um, having supplements to the Imbris to, and to foster collaborations between COBRI CTRs and other R1 funded investigators. Collaboration with non-ID NIH programs. And this is some of the examples here with the maternity, maternal and infant mortality research, uh, the COVID-19 patient registry, and of course the cloud computing for medical research, which is an NIH wide in initiative it's called Strides that involves uh, Google and Amazon cloud computing. There's also competing in NIH wide research initiatives, including the active trials for COVID-19 therapeutics and vaccines, and the rapid acceleration of diagnostics for undeserved populations, the RADx uh, uh, UP programs. So this all the categorical institutes are really involved now in managing and supporting the IDEA program beyond the funds that uh, the IDEA program has available. So uh, I just want to touch base on some of the efforts in NIH relating to cloud computing. Uh, this is the STRIDES program for cloud computing partnerships. So um, this part of this uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud and Amazon, there's a free cloud credit for research. Uh, there's a diagnostic development initiative and eligibility investigators from any uh, part of the IDEA program can apply. And there's open application um, uh, that um, uh, trained a number of people last year. These are some of the examples of participation from IDEA programs. Um, we had um, uh, participants from the Louisiana State University, and they uh, worked uh, in remote training for cloud platform users at the media level, um, more advanced people, advanced developers, and also the, uh, the infrastructure developers. So uh, these people, up to 500 students, uh, have already enrolled in these free programs for IDEA, pro uh, IDEA states to uh, learn how to do cloud computing and use um, uh, databases. So um, the IMBRIS themselves are statewide networks for research intensive institutions. Uh, and we actually help uh, primarily undergraduate institutions, community colleges and tribally controlled colleges to provide them with research opportunities. So um, we have a developmental core, we have a very robust summer program uh, here in Louisiana, which is co-funded by the Louisiana Board of Regents. This is the administrative core. And we have a data science core and molecular cell biology core that we have here in our BRN. I'll explain about that. But really, the intense need right now is to teach undergraduates in data science and bioinformatics. And we have a number of initiatives that we started. And we have a very robust summer program that will bring over 100 people here in Belarus to actually learn on uh, some of the basis of high performance computing, uh, access to cloud computing, as well as also training in molecular cell biology as part of the molecular cell biology core that uh, our program has. So um, enabling cloud computing idea institutions through Imbri is a, um, a, a specific directive of these programs. So cloud computing can provide students and investigators access to high performance computing and modern data science tools without heavy capital investments by institutions. So it's uh, very inexpensive, especially for the idea uh, network. So the Imbri awardees are collaborating with NGMS, the Office of Data Science, uh, and they lead the way to expand access to data science tools and skill sets. The idea is to provide basic cloud computing training, develop cloud tools for self-learning, and demonstrate the benefits of using uh, the cloud. And uh, a part of this interactive training on cloud fundamentals, there were 48 classes on 2021, and I think an equal number in 2022, through uh, more than 60 sessions by Google, or Amazon, um, and where the beginner, the intermediate, and the advanced 
uh, sessions. And these are the uh, number of students that are uh, participating with many Embry uh, investigators, uh, students and faculty participating. So um, they also, uh, NIGMS is uh, through these programs, develops uh, building cloud-based learning modules. And I suspect those modules will be free to everybody. I haven't checked uh, whether you need the password. I think most likely uh, right now the NIGMS site will be available for everybody. So the idea is to have curricula developed by the idea PIs uh, then transfer them to engineers through a three-month professional service engagement and convert these training materials into cloud-based workflows. So there's an outside call now for developing these curricula tools to be able to use, create instructional videos, interactive demos, and uh, practice exercises. But the idea is to train the trainer. So the general medical sciences uh, and GMS support investigators can gain program skills, ultimately develop cloud-based training materials uh, to teach others. So this is the uh, NSGMS sandbox. This is an uh, earlier slide. I think some of these boxes now have been filled. So they have developed uh, by United Strides, Basics Cloud Computing, Google, Amazon, which is available, Mass Spec Data Analysis from the University of Arkansas Medical Center, uh, which is a regional center, RNA Seq Analysis from the University of Maine, MIDBL, and of course, a bunch of other things, uh, including some of the modules and trainings that we actually have available here that are facilitated by um, the Pine Biotech uh, uh, modules and also the Pine Biotech uh, uh, software analysis uh, that we have in place here as part of our uh, next-gen sequencing core. So these are some of the uh, uh, modules that are available and all of these modules at some point will be uploaded um, or linked uh, to our NEPI website that I'll tell you later, but these fundamentals of bioinformatics uh, you can see um, uh, more specialized ones uh, for biofilm microbiome composition, um, biomarker discovery proteomics, and these are really uh, modules that will be available on uh, cloud and it will be access accessible for people to be able to work uh, their data through them. I also wanted to mention, I'm not sure how many people here from um, uh, you know smaller universities here in the U.S., but um, one of the programs has been developed is the R16 or SURE program, and that allows for, for uh, you know, uh, any campus that uh, serves underrepresented or so socioeconomic <laughs> students to apply for grants. And uh, the only requirement is that uh, they have 25% uh, or, or more of Pell Grants, which is really the financial support grants. How much time do I have? Who is my guest, my um, administrator here? I'm not sure uh, what was the time allocated for this. Anyway, so let me go forward to tell you a bit about NEPI. NEPI is the National Association of Idea Principal Investigators, a nonprofit group representing the 24 states. Part of the uh, uh, program, actually, the NEPI website is operated by uh, Pine Biotech right now. And the idea is through uh, NEPI, NEPI to really uh, make all these resources available uh, free of charge to at least the uh, idea network. And so we have an active call for people that have developed algorithms or software or lectures to be uploaded and uh, be able to be available through the NEPI website. And this is the um, uh, the IDEA network. You see the states that are part of the NIGMS IDEA network um, that started uh, in 2000 by the National Center for Research Resources and then ultimately moved to the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. This is the NEPI leadership. Um, I, I just departed as a president, but I'm part of the um, executive committee as a past president. And then uh, Scott Seville is now the new president of NEPI, and we're in the process of uh, assigning a couple more officers, uh, hopefully by the end of next month. So that's the NEPI's mission, to provide leadership, communication. Uh, we want to foster interaction with IDEA programs. We want to share resources, uh, enhance the visibility of these 24 states, develop consensus for priorities and directions, and to identify and disseminate best practices, and to identify opportunities, develop strategies to achieve the common goals. Like again, all the uh, Imbri network at least, and is focusing a lot now uh, through NGMS, so cloud computing, data science, and bioinformatics. Uh, and this is the NEPI website, uh, nepia.org, that uh, you're welcome to look into this and see if you uh, uh, can, uh, find more information or even share information for us to be able to upload it. And through NEPI, uh, we were able to uh, 
sponsor a uh, different omic symposium this back in 2021. Uh, we actually have a bunch of other activities that were sponsored through uh, NEPI that uh, were facilitated through BioBiotech and the omics logic uh, issue. We're also very fortunate to get uh, a uh, uh, support from the Tober Foundation, and we provided uh, CAS awards to our Nisbury National Meeting, and uh, we also covered some expenses uh, going into the 24 and 26 meetings. The Nisbury, the National Meeting, would be in Washington, D.C., most likely in the Washington Hilton in 2024-26, is organized by LSU, I'm the principal investigator of that conference. And uh, typically, there are over a thousand people that come into uh, Washington, D.C. from those 24 states to share the results and their experiences. So I wanted to move very quickly to Louisiana, and this is the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network website. Uh, you're welcome to visit here. There's a lot of information, uh, including training, uh, as well as the omics uh, training that we uh, provide together with Pine Biotech in this particular website. Uh, so it's LBRN. If you Google LBRN, you'll be able to find it. And then a couple highlights. Uh, we have, for instance, this LBRN, um, Louisiana Optical Network Initiative Scientific Computing Bootcamp. Uh, we're going to be expanding it this summer. Uh, we hope to have up to 100 people um, coming into Baton Rouge uh, from undergraduate institutions to be trained uh, in computing as part of this boot camp, as well as other boot camps that we'll be sponsoring. And this is um, the flyer uh, that we had uh, with Michael Snyder as a keynote speaker. We had Christopher Mason, who also uses this combination of data to understand the biology and health of astronauts. Uh, very similar to what Michael Stein and do, but as well as April Wright from Southeastern Louisiana University, who is in part of biological sciences, but is a, a computational biologist and a few others of so notable uh, speakers. So Omics Logic is the other activity that we promote uh, through um, Pine Biotech and through Biomaging Lab. We have over 50 students enrolled right now uh, taking these uh, virtual courses. And what we hope to do is develop courses in every PUI campus, 26, 27 institutions in Louisiana that have their own course, which is enriched by some of the modules that we provide and support uh, through LBRN. So uh, for instance, this here, the LBRN lecture series on molecular structure and functional proteins. This is available through our bioinformatics core, and it has an introduction to computers, an introduction to microbial community, and this is free could be tapped into and listened to um, through that, in addition to the modules that uh, the Omics uh, platform uh, provides. So with that, um, I'm not sure how much time was allocated, uh, but um, this is the uh, LSU main campus with a football stadium. And uh, uh, if anybody of you are around here, welcome to visit with us and uh, learn more about our programs. And I will leave it at that, and I'll return to uh, to our moderator. Thank you so much, Dr. Gass. And I have a few questions for you. So uh, you discussed about the uh, programs that students can leverage from. I just wanted to know, like, uh, where can they find the research and the internship or the job opportunities in bioinformatics <coughs> and data science? after taking up these programs, because um, that is one of the major concerns of students. Yeah, well, you know, it depends where you are, right? In the US, um, there's a lot of opportunities for advanced study, and there are a lot of opportunities um, uh, for actual job. If I understand your question correctly, you're looking yes. for job opportunities? Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, Part of NEPI, um, we intend to post, um, you know, job opportunities. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it will happen uh, quite soon. And then um, if you really contact all these programs in those 24 states, all of them have opportunities for, you know, undergraduates, graduate students, um, potentially other people from outside that may want to come in uh, to get trained. But uh, because it's academic programs, we're focusing on people that are enrolled in undergraduate institutions um, here in the US. Um, we haven't expanded the program internationally, um, but a lot of the content that we create uh, through NIH or through NEPI or through the individual uh, IMBRI programs in state is actually available um, for people 
uh, free of charge uh, in most instances. But the actual training to come here, um, for instance, the proteomics center in Arkansas receives probably over 50 students uh, per year that they train them for mass spec and proteomic analysis. And that's by application acceptance. And then you go over there for like the summer, a couple months to get trained. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities, even for internationals at NIH and all those centers, but um, we don't have a single source where all these job opportunities are available. That was very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Casillas. And uh, do we have any questions from the participants? You can put them in the chat or maybe unmute yourself and ask. All right, if not, then I would extend my uh, thanks to Dr. Kasudas for taking out his time for uh, the talk today. And uh, with that, I would like to now proceed ahead with our next speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Jamie. And Dr. Jamie, are you here with us? Hi. Hi. All right, so before passing on the stage to Dr. Jamie, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Jamie is the next generation sequencing coordinator for the Center of Excellence in Emerging Animal and Zoonotic Diseases and uh, the Center on Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at Kansas State University. He is an expert in genomics and previously coordinated the SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance efforts of Sao Paulo State to develop and apply NGS-based tools for the detection and the study of emerging animal and zoonotic viruses, as well as their interaction with natural host vectors and animal models. Along his career, Dr. Neto has secured around $1.7 in competitive grants and authored over 35 peer-reviewed publications, including articles in Panas Nature, uh, Microbiology, Science, and Journal of Medical Virology. We are pleased to have you with us, Dr. James. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me see how to share my screen here. Can you all see my uh, screen? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Excellent. Okay, so um, can you hear me well? If not, please just uh, let me know in the chat. But uh, yes, all, we can. Uh, all looks good. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be here this uh early afternoon with you talking uh, to you about um, the research and the application and the, how we use net generation sequencing uh, in our um, uh, NGS core here at uh, the veterinary school at Kansas State University. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and I uh, hope we can have like fruitful discussions uh, after that. So, um, okay. Just a brief overview of uh, what I'm going to be addressing um, uh, today. So uh, the focus of our center is on, uh, uh, we have two centers here. I'm gonna be focusing on the, especially on the service that is, is provided through our uh, uh, COBRA Center, NIH COBRA Center that we call the Center of on Emerging and Zoonotic uh, Infectious Diseases. But I'm gonna give you an overview Brief overview on, uh, on 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 the applications on emerging in uh, animal and zoonotic infectious diseases, and then how uh, we can use NGS for epidemiology and research, and uh, the NGS initiatives and services that are provided through the core, and uh, examples, two examples of uh, research that uh, 
we develop here and that uh, leverage on the NGS service that we can provide. So I'm going to be talking uh, in the end about SARS-CoV-2 uh, research and also African swine fever virus uh, research here. So uh, starting with uh, uh, a mix of uh, animal diseases and uh, zoonotic animal diseases, uh, the importance of studying these diseases, I mean, this is uh, especially nowadays uh, with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 emerging uh, from animal to humans, it has become uh, very uh, clear um, uh, uh, the link between all this, uh, this ecosystem. But um, of course, we know that uh, uh, we have diseases that are particular to animals, diseases that affect uh, livestock, for example, that uh, are a problem uh, to, to, to food production, for example. And, uh, but we also uh, know, and these are animal diseases, but then we also consider, have to consider the possibility of diseases that can uh, jump from one animal to another, and then some species uh, of animals can uh, act as intermediates or amplifier of the, of uh, those pathogens. And those pathogens they can eventually jump from uh, those animals to humans and cause disease uh, in humans. So this is what we called uh, zoonotic diseases. Diseases that can uh, uh, jump from animals uh, to humans, for example, and cause, dis and cause disease uh, in, uh, in, in, in humans. So we focus uh, here at Kansas State University in our centers in both animal diseases and uh, zoonotic uh, diseases. So diseases that are important for uh, livestock food production, for example, animal biosecurity, and also diseases that can uh, uh, jump from animal to humans and that humans, uh, animals can be, for example, reservoir for those diseases that can affect humans. So, um, and I'm going to show you how we can leverage on NGS to better understand these diseases and also to uh, create, uh, generate tools to, to monitor or to better study those pathogens. Uh, and just to exemplify here also that some of those diseases can also be uh, transmitted not only by direct contact between uh, uh, animals and humans, but also by uh, vector species. So just to give an idea, uh, more than half or roughly 70% of all uh, the infections uh, that people can get are zoonotic or they can spread uh, between uh, animals and, and people. So this is very concerning because uh, we are in contact with animals uh, all the time. So um, how can we use NGS in this case uh, to get us better prepared and uh, ahead of time uh, uh, for an early response, because that's what we want ultimately to, to be prepared to provide an early response in the case of an outbreak or uh, uh, of the, the upsurge of an emerging uh, pathogen. So uh, the idea here is that we can use uh, next generation sequencing uh, uh, workflows and data to promote, uh, for example, syndromic surveillance. So we can uh, survey the different parts of the world and, 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 and material and, 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 and uh, uh, species for, the, for, for pathogen discover or to the surveillance of non-pathogens. And we can use that uh, uh, to see what's happening and, uh, and what are the pathogens that are circulating or are emerging. And then from that, you can go, if you know those budgets, you can go from there to a local surveillance standpoint. And then you can see in different uh, niches, in different species, in different ambience, and uh, in different compartments, uh, the presence of those virus or the, uh, or the rise of, of emerging virus. So you can check the environment, wildlife, for example, uh, those domestic animals, uh, sentinel populations and patients for those uh, for, for for those uh, target uh, pathogens, and with that, uh, develop uh, right, uh, rapid response actions uh, uh, to 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 fight or to mitigate the spread of such diseases. 
So this is a very interesting model where we can use next generation sequence to, um, to fight or to better understand the spread, the transmission dynamic of such diseases. But in order to implement that, besides many uh, uh, complex factors, uh, some of them that we, that we still have to work and, and to improve are the tools that we currently have uh, for sequencing. And when I say tool, I say sequencers, portable sequencers, uh, optimization, optimization of protocol costs, um, workflows and bioinformatic uh, pipelines, for example, and throughput. If we're talking about uh, preparedness surveillance, uh, we think of this as a global uh, or a large scale uh, activity. And then uh, most of times uh, these activities are limited by the throughput of the currently available uh, techniques. So I should include also portability here. So I'm going to give you uh, from now an overview on the potential NGS applications in veterinary uh, health uh, research, uh, some of them that we do here or we have the potential to do here. So for example, uh, we can use that for pathogen characterization and genomic surveillance, as I mentioned before, to study the uh, uh, discovery of uh, the emergence of uh, new pathogens uh, to work uh, to discover or to monitor uh, natural uh, reservo reservoirs, to infer about, uh, uh, you know, investigate the spillovers when the, the virus, for example, uh, spills from animals to uh, humans or spill backs when you have transmission back from humans uh, into animals. And also uh, choose this information at, uh, at uh, characterization of pathogens in the genome level to improve uh, diagnostic diagnostic tools that we currently have or are developing. Uh, other applications that can leverage uh, next generation sequencing, of course, uh, are host vector pathogen interactions. So you can use that for studying host responses, uh, viral host adaptations, and uh, so many others like uh, uh, therapeutic target identification, virus genome evolution, and uh, characterization in, of animal models. Um, classic utilization in the veterinary uh, health and research, not one of the, the, the main folks we have here, which is uh, population genomics for improvement of livestock genetic, genetics, uh, identification of genomic uh, signatures, and also uh, for the identification of genetic bases of disease that can improve uh, uh, livestock, uh, for example, uh, production. Um, and also, one important, another important, very important component, uh, it's been gaining lots of uh, attention and momentum nowadays with, uh, with uh, uh, especially with, with, with uh, food security and uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance, is uh, the study of uh, microbial uh, genomics, where you can investigate um, a specific uh, bacteria or microorganisms or or the the the, the animal microbiome uh, and to to understand to better understand uh, a microbial resistance or that is very common uh, uh, to uh, monitor what you call uh, the, the resistome or uh, the bacteria the co the, the collection of bacteria that are resistant to, uh, to uh, antibiotics in, in that reside in those animals for example and also but not only that but also and uh, 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 studies on animal metabolism uh, immune response and animal nutrition <clears throat> so um, so those are some of the applications in veterinary health here in our core, uh, we are in shape to uh, contribute uh, to, to, to that research through uh, a, a complete or diverse repertoire of, um, of an NGS-based uh, techniques. So basically, <clears throat> the most common ones that we have implemented and offer and, 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 and use for, uh, for service and research here uh, and they go from whole genome sequencing, um, viral metagenomics, uh, targeted amplification, 
target amplicon sequencing, uh, RNA seq expression, and both uh, uh, bulk uh, whole uh, transcriptomics, and also on a single cell uh, level in uh, 16S. Uh, uh, microbial uh, genomics, and uh, not only in the uh, implementation of available techniques uh, related to this, but also in uh, we are very open and and look forward to the development of new uh, workflows, new techniques, and uh, devices that uh, can leverage again to achieve our goal of uh, studying those pathogens or to developing tools to monitor uh, and, and, and get uh, um, early response, preparedness and early, early response for those pathogens. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, the portfolio of uh, sequencers that we could have currently have available uh, to our uh, core facility, um, so uh, they go from MySeq, Illumina, MySeq, and uh, NextSeq, and uh, Oxford, Nanopore, uh, Minion, and uh, those are in-house equipment that we use, uh, MySeq, especially for small genomes, uh, targeted whole genome sequencing, 16S microbiome and viral um, metagenomics, uh, we also use a lot uh, next seek for larger genomes targeted uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, some studies involving uh, RNA seq, not in the single cell level, of course. Um, Ox4 Nanopore is a very versatile uh, e uh, equipment, especially because uh, it produces uh, uh, long reads and also. But one of the greatest uh, versatilities of this equipment is to be portable, so we can take this uh, equipment actually to biosafe level three laboratories and work uh, with the virus that cannot be, be whose DNA or RNA, for example, nucleic gas cannot uh, be brought out of uh, containment. So this is a so very uh, convenient and uh, and valuable and valuable to develop protocols for those viruses. Uh, we also work uh, in, uh, with uh, uh, Epec Bio here, which is. Um, especially for a single cell and larger uh, genomes and implementing it now for uh, this uh, protocols and uh, potential for epigenomics. So this is available through our core, through our partner, uh, Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. And uh, another component of our core is the uh, chromium controller, which gives us the ability to produce libraries for single cell sequencing. And uh, besides the, the sequencing facilities, one of the greatest uh, assets and uh, that uh, an advantage of uh, the Manhattan campus here we have in our center here is that uh, um, of, uh, the, the biocontainment facilities that we have here, which allow us to um, work, virus, work with virus and uh, experimentally infected animals uh, and to reproduce, for example, clinical aspects of uh, both zoonotic and animal diseases. So we can. Uh, this is a, a this is a, a really uh, a great because then uh, we can uh, use NGS, for example, to study the evolution of a virus, for example, or uh, in those animals in uh, in reproducing uh, actually the disease in those animals. So uh, with that facility, I'd like to show you some of the viruses that uh, we currently, or in the past, we have been able to work or that we work with. So uh, we, we, uh, we work, those are uh, high in containment, uh, some of the SL2 or uh, just SIVs and uh, H EHDV or VSL2, the other are VSL3. So we have, for example, with valley fever virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, high pathogenic, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, we studied with that, swine influenza, Japanese encephalitis virus, vesicular stomat stomatitis virus, African swine fever virus, and um, episodic uh, hemorrhagic disease virus. And these are the animal models that uh, we can use and we currently use uh, to study uh, 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 those diseases, both from the, the host pathogen interaction point, but also for the development of therapies uh, uh, 
for, for those diseases. And more recently, uh, we have included monkeypox virus uh, to the portfolio of, uh, of pathogens in our, uh, in our center. So today uh, I'm gonna show you two examples of uh, brief examples of uh, research that uh, we do here with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also with uh, African uh, swine fever virus. So uh, the impact of SARS-CoV-2, uh, this is one of the interests of, of, of our uh, center here uh, to understand the impact of SARS-CoV-2 in animals, use animal models also to test new uh, therapies against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also to understand the interaction uh, uh, with the host and uh, the potential of, uh, of, 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 of animals to, to act as reservoirs for that. So we know that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has jumped from uh, bats to intermediate hosts until we reached uh, humans. And then in humans, it established a uh, uh, human to human transmission uh, cycle. But we also know in, uh, about uh, events of spillback when the virus jumps uh, from human back to animals, uh, both to domestic and to wildlife. And um, and um, some of those species can support uh, su sustained transmission between uh, them and, and, and also to allow uh, for secondary uh, spillovers in, in, into humans. And this has a very important impact, uh, especially um, on, on vac vaccine efficacy, because some of the mutations that the virus acquire in these animals can interfere the functioning of vaccines against them if uh, humans are infected with those viruses. So it's important from a One Health uh, uh, point of view to understand the interspecies transmission uh, and also the identification and uh, the understanding and surveillance of those species as reservoirs. I'm going to show you the, an example of uh, research we're doing uh, here uh, with, uh, we did here with uh, ferrets. Ferrets are good animal models for res respiratory infectious diseases, also for the development of uh, therapies. So uh, we infected uh, ferrets with a combination of uh, two uh, SARS CoV 2 uh, strains. One of the WA1 uh, is a Washington strain, is an uh, ancestral lineage A. Uh, virus and now and together with the California uh, derived or uh, alpha virus uh, from California. So um, and then we observed what happened uh, with those viruses when they were uh, 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 inoculated uh, in in uh, in ferrets. So the idea was to observe transmission, and strain competition, and not adaptive mutations. I'm going to show you what we have here on strain competition. And it's very interesting when you look at those uh, principal infected animals, and we use next generation sequencing to, 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 to see which uh, variant has infected the animal. And here in uh, ferrets, this is our inoculum, uh, where we had about 40% uh, uh, Washington and 60% um, California strain. As soon as one day, uh, uh, after uh, post-challenge, um, California, which is an alpha variant, uh, takes out completely out competes um, the uh, Washington strain as soon as one day. And this is the same pattern that we see on the upcoming days uh, after uh, infection. So this is this is uh, can be used with any other. This approach that we do here can be used with any other strain combination and animal models that are uh, susceptible to uh, SARS uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, one of the great interests of the group now to leverage uh, NGS uh, whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 is to understand the genomic landscape of mutations because we have so many different animal models and different strains. So we can leverage that to understand what are the uh, mutations that the virus is losing or acquiring uh, when it, uh, it infects those animals. So just to give an example of what we can do is to 
For example, those are the virus that uh, were in the cell culture from passage one or passage two. Uh, so uh, this is uh, when we look at the mutations in the viral genome compared to the reference genome of Wuhan. And then we see, uh, this is the landscape of uh, in passage one. And then we see that some of the mutations start uh, to increase in passage two. And now uh, what we're doing, uh, uh, and we have done this experiment already where different groups of, uh, uh, of ferrets have been infected with the California uh, alpha uh, um, um, strain. So now what we're doing is to um, track those animals. So these animals, we have collect swabs, uh, oral or angel swabs, and also um, nasal swabs, for example, and also tissues after those, after those animals are necropsis. So now what we're doing is to evaluate uh, the viral um, adaptive mutations and tissue tropism of, uh, of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in, in those animals. So um, from SARS, I'd like to switch gears uh, quickly to show you uh, an example of, of uh, on, uh, development of uh, whole genome sequencing protocols and workflows in uh, for African swine fever virus. So um, the virus is, uh, in this case, is a very large DNA virus, a double-stranded uh, DNA virus, whose genome is around 170, 109 kilobases and encodes about 150 and 165 proteins. So this is a virus from the Aspharvid family. Aspharvid is the only virus of uh, actually of this family and has 24 genotypes and it's the only no DNA uh, arbovirus. So it's uh, in fact um, uh, primarily domestic and wild uh, swine species. So they are uh, susceptible. But in the wild, it can also infect uh, and can, can find um, in warthogs, uh, bush pigs, even though they do not develop clinical disease, but they're important as reservoirs. But uh, they do uh, cause, uh, um, can cause acute disease in, uh, in, in domestic uh, pigs. And this is a huge problem for, uh, for the production. Uh, uh, power production in, in the affected countries. And it can also be transmitted uh, by uh, soft tick uh, ornithodorous. So um, uh, an outbreak of African swine fever can result in large economic losses due to high mortality and trade transit restrictions. And currently there's no available commercial vaccine or treatment and the disease is, re is reportable. Uh, to the World uh, Organization of Animal Health, and it's considered a USDA select agent. Uh, so just to the records, there is no uh, African swine fever virus in the United States currently. And it hasn't moved yet. So um, this is the distribution so of uh, the disease in the world. It has uh, it spread all the way from Africa in the early days to Europe and um, and to uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And more recently, the disease has uh, uh, reached um, uh, uh, the Caribbean, uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So it's just knocking on the door of, uh, of the United States right now. Um, so I'm gonna show you how we use a next generation sequencing here. Uh, we use actually to uh, identify and isolate uh, from Mongolia. And uh, with that, we use MySeq for that. We use a direct sequencing approach and de novo assembly in this case. And then using that, we were able to uh, assign this, um, this isolate, both the inoculum, the original stock that came from tissue and then the inoculum, and to confirm there was a genotype to African swine fever virus. Uh, the problem of using this approach right now, the challenge of direct sequencing, is, is uh, it's a metagenomic approach. So we have uh, most of times a loss of host DNA. So host DNA is the majority of the genome that is going to be sequenced. And then we only get a low coverage after sequencing. So this is really a challenge when you're using 
uh, sample, uh, uh, you were aiming to sequence the virus that, came, that comes out of tissue uh, or animal carcasses. Um, so uh, this is an example of the coverage that we obtain right now using direct uh, sequencing. And based on that, then we started to develop a protocol for uh, uh, targeted uh, sequencing of African swine fever virus. So initially, we developed a set of 19 primer sets. Uh, each uh, set would produce a 10 KB or 11, 10 to 11 KB amplicon covering the full genome of African swine fever uh, virus. Of course, it's a pain to work with 19 different uh, PCR reactions before you can go uh, and, and perform sequencing. So, uh, uh, but even though uh, working with independent pools, we could uh, get a full coverage of the genome with an average coverage of uh, 6,000 eggs, which is uh, pretty reasonable. But then we started to optimize uh, this uh, protocol in order to reduce the number of the reactions. So what I'm going to show you now is, a, uh, is a, a, an overview of uh, uh, several pools that we de developed. Uh, ultimately, we, we ended up with this combination. So right now we have uh, four pools of primers that work uh, in independent reactions. And then with that, we can using in ion uh, because we're thinking about portability here as well. So with uh, the different uh, pools, like for example, for A, for B in red, for C in yellow, and for D in, uh, in green, we can, um, we also have for E, uh, uh, but I don't have the data to show you right now, but with the combination of this uh, one, two, three, Four and now the fifth uh, uh, reaction with 4E, we are able to cover the whole genome of uh, African swine fever virus uh, through uh, next generation sequencing. And uh, with uh, an average coverage now of uh, 6,000 X. So this is uh, running pretty well with Minion. And uh, we are also uh, working on the adaptation to, um, to, to Illumina and also uh, to BackBio. So uh, with this, I just would like to finish with talking about a few of uh, future directions or future interests, interests that we have. So we have a great interest on long reads, uh, developing other uh, protocols uh, for uh, long reads whole genome sequencing. And uh, we have good uh, relationships and some partnerships already uh, with BeckBio and uh, Universal Sequencing, which has a protocol for whole genome or for, for uh, uh, producing um, long reads in, uh, in, in, in Lumina. So the idea is to develop a strong uh, veterinary um, uh, health genomics uh, program uh, with them. And also, uh, with uh, the development of portable, deployable, fast deployable NGS device and workflows. So we're working with this. It's an important uh, uh, university industry partnership here with Nobilis. And, uh, and one of the main things that uh, we, uh, we, 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 we have intention to develop also, uh, uh, it's uh, custom bioinformatic pipelines, and, and I see lot, also lots of opportunities for, for cooperation and partnerships here, especially for pathogen detection, uh, direct detection of both mono and poly, polymicrobial infections, uh, and for viral uh, evolution and uh, understanding hosting pathogen uh, interactions. So with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Reed, who is the director of the core, and all the rigged lab, uh, especially uh, Chester, Madal, uh, Connor Cole, that are uh, Patricia, uh, that are mostly involved with the work that I presented and, 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 and with the sequencing. Our centers here, the school, the BRI, Biosecurity Research Institute, USDA, their partners there, and, 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 and other collaborators that have been uh, important to make this work uh, to happen. To happen. So uh, thank you very much again uh, for the opportunity, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions if you have to make.
Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Nehru. It was really insightful presentation from your side. Uh, I have some questions for you in the chat. So uh, the first question is, could you share briefly how you arrived at this topic for your research? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'll try to. Yeah, could you share briefly how you arrived at this topic for your research? At this topic of my yeah. research? Well, this yeah. is a very interesting <laughs> question. Uh, my background is on uh, vector-borne infectious diseases. So that's how I started about 20-ish years ago as, a, uh, as an undergrad and grad student. So my whole uh, part of my academic career was studying that vector pathogen interactions. Then I started using um, um, genomics, uh, transcriptomics, for example, to understand how vectors, how pathogens uh, respond to, it, to each other. And that put me in close cooperation and also in virus discovery, emerging virus. And that put me in close cooperation with colleagues from uh, the Manhattan uh, community like Dr. Uh, Richt. Then that's how I came to K-State here and then uh, started uh, working on high consequent biocontainment research. And, and then I was able to bring my uh, next generation sequencing um, expertise to complement uh, the expertise of the group. So now I'm using next generation sequencing cooperation with them to study those pathogens. So that's how uh, I ended up uh, uh, doing uh, this right now. All right. And what challenges did you and your team face in this project while going through the procedures for SARS-CoV-2 and sequencing? So are there any uh, difficulties faced by your team? Um, yes, I, I, I can list. Uh, I mean, the greatest challenge is when uh, you don't have a, a reference genome, for example, that is available, or when you don't have a uh, whole genome sequencing protocol in place or a targeted uh, whole genomic sequencing protocol in place. And that in those cases, you have to develop everything uh, from scratch. So if it's, for example, a novel pathogen, um, or if it's a non-pathogen, but with, uh, with no workflow already developed, so then you have to start, as we we're showing here, uh, as the African swine fever virus, uh, for example. And also, uh, the bioinformatics uh, pipelines, you know, because I mean, in the laboratory, if you're talking about um, research, you can spend time uh, doing the proper time, reasonable time doing the analysis and with high uh, capacity uh, computer grids and et cetera. But if you're talking about deployment, uh, portable sequencers and uh, response to outbreaks, then those approaches have to be timely. You cannot rely on two weeks, three weeks, or even two days, one day analysis. So I guess the challenge is to develop uh, strong, reliable, and uh, fast uh, bioinformatic pipelines that can be uh, used to complement the NGS workflows uh, that we're developing as well. All right. So I guess we have Dr. Rich and Dr. Kassilis and you from the NEPI. And I have one question for like three of you. So what is the central role of a bioinformatician in the present biological research and development area? So this is open for all, like any one of you can answer this. I'll get my friend uh, Jürgen to take a first shot at this. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Gus. Uh, so without bioinformatics, uh, we cannot uh, analyze the data. So without bioinformatics, we are dead in the water period. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's actually, um, I think the, uh, as I tried to allude into uh, my presentation is that ultimately, uh, data science and bioinformatics is extremely important. And um, we're really going into the direction of probably in silico experiments, because part of the idea is you do a lot of background work and understand a lot of things before you try to go into an animal. So, because you don't want to, you know, overuse animals, you have to understand what's going on. So, um, and I think even with pathogens is the pathogen host interaction. So it's a two body problem. So we not only need to understand um, the pathogens, but also the host 
and how the genetics of the host actually play into this. Because ultimately, combined data and looking at that would, would make sense in the longer run, especially for outbred species like humans, where basically you don't have the exact same uh, genetic milieu. And I know Dr. Rick is involved in trying to generate resistant um, potential species, looking uh, to combine the pathogen host interaction to ultimately uh, create uh, maybe new uh, pigs or whatever would be that would be resistant to those pathogens. Gene edited, gene edited lifestyle. Gene editing, yeah. And that's needs because you need to understand the interaction before you can do the gene editing because you need to know whether you knock out a receptor or you're doing something very specific and how the host will respond. And I might add, uh, Gus answered in five sentences what I needed one for, just so. <laughs> right, Gus? What I might add, if we need very specific bioinformatic approaches, we have collaborators. For example, we work on um, bottleneck, transmission bottlenecks in SARS-CoV-2 from what, what is the bottleneck in cats? What is the bottleneck in deer? And we work with Jesse Bloom, who is one of the uh, specialists in this country at the Hutch. What is Hutch? Um, out Hutch. in Seattle. Uh, Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Center in Seattle. So if we really need to address very specific questions, which we need really specialists, we look around and work. Uh, that's what's the beauty about science. You don't have to know everything. You have you have to know your area obviously pretty well. But if you really need to answer very specific questions and you don't have the knowledge, and in most cases we don't, you go out and collaborate, and then you look for people who have the knowledge, have the algorithms, and have the experience, and and that's how we do it, and that's how uh, we work in my center, which is called SACIT. All right. So, like, how can one use hybrid learning for personal development, both conceptually and practically, uh, practically after this breakdown of SARS-CoV-2? Uh, maybe, Dr. Jamie, you can answer this. So, I'll just repeat this question. question. Yeah. yeah. So, how one can use the hybrid learning for, like, personal development, both conceptually and practically after this breakdown of SARS-CoV-2? How can you use the learning that we have? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think one thing that is clear to us is that uh, you have to be, uh, uh, I, I always say this word, preparedness, preparedness. You have to know what's circulating and has the potential to emerge in order to develop uh, mitigation tools like vaccines, like diagnostics, like uh, um, therapies in order to control them. So um, from, from, from now, from our hour and now, next generation sequen sequencing, for example, whole genome, sur uh, whole genome surveillance, for example, genomic surveillance, you can use that now for, uh, to, 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 to power discover, for example, or agnostic. Well, nowadays, it's very common as uh, emerging port in our agnostic uh, threat uh, discovery. So where you, without a target, you can uh, uh, identify uh, multiple pathogens and uh, start working on them uh, before they, they become uh, a threat. So that's, uh, I would say, um, uh, among many of them is one of uh, uh, the lessons that we can take from the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, if I got uh, right to your question. Yeah. So, uh, like, I just wanted to know one more thing. Like, NEPI is also, um, like, outraging the data science and biomedical research study to the undergraduate and postgraduate students. So what are the more facilities which NEPI is providing to the students and researchers out there to learn biomedical research and uh, learn more skills to develop uh, bioinformatic students and which can be utilized in your labs? Um, uh, Dr. Rick, would you like to take this one over here? Okay, can you please repeat? Sorry, I was distracted. So, yeah, so I just wanted to ask, like, uh, NEPI is also, uh, like, like, enhancing the study of biomedical research 
and they need more students, undergrads and postgraduates or students for their labs to conduct bioinformatics uh, studies. So what are the major steps which your lab is taking apart from what NEPI is doing? So we are, but we are mainly doing sonotic research. So we are in the animal human interface. We, we use next generation sequencing and bioinformatics as tools for our research. So I personally, or we, I personally do not have an undergraduate graduate student in that topic, in that uh, uh, bioinformatic topic, but we work with people within the university. We have a bioinformatics center in the university, which is the bioinformatics center of the Kansas in Brie. And so we work with these people and they educate undergraduates and graduate students. Okay, all right. So I guess with this, uh, we are now uh, good to end this symposium. And I would like to thank all three of you to like attend this symposium and give a talk to our students who are in the learning phase. And by your talk, they might be uh, more uh, motivational, like they might have taken more motivation to study and go in your universities and work along with you in both Kansas and LSU. So yeah, thank you very to, much uh, for joining. Just, you know, I just need to tell you that I'm an outside advisor to KSU. So I was there spending three wonderful days with these, these guys. They're doing an absolute amazing job there. So. Anybody who's interested in animal research, KSU is the place. Just talk to Dr. Richt. <laughs> Sonotic, in the Sonotic, it's uh, Sonotic environment. environment. Yeah. So yeah. it has an NIH. Um, uh, it's very critical. Everybody heard about One Health and Sonotic diseases. SARS-CoV-2 is a, obviously a prototype of that. So we work in that space, Sonotic diseases. And they obviously yeah. include animals. Thank you, Gus. We yeah. love to have you here, and uh, and that was a good experience. I I'm glad it was a good experience for you coming to this little apple. Manhattan is called the little apple. It's a In little contrast. big apple. It's a little big apple. It's because a little big Dr. apple because of Caesar and Dr. Rick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gus. Okay, guys. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you bye, bye. 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 Thank you. So, Parish, are you there? Uh, yes, obviously. So, I guess sure. it was very insightful as well as fun, loving panel discussion. Uh, if I compare with uh, any other. So, uh, and with this, we would like to come to the end of a two days omics research symposium themed around computational biology, data science, and other specialized fields like infectious diseases and many more. We would like to extend our gratitude to all the guest speakers who took out the time to share their experiences with the young researchers and clarify their doubts. Also, thanks to all the participants who have joined our lovely audience. And we would like to inform those participants who have enrolled for the two-day symposium. We will be mailing them their certificates by next week. So goodbye, have a nice day ahead, and take care. Thank you. Uh, sorry, can I ask something? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, is it possible to have uh, the recording of the of the all words? E, yes. Way? Yes, definitely. So uh, we uh, will be sharing the recording of uh, these sessions. Like we will be uh, posting out on our uh, YouTube channel as well, publishing it out on our YouTube channel as well as on our social media platforms, and uh, we will also mail you all with the session recordings, but obviously after uh, doing a bit of editing and other stuff. So we'll do share the session recordings with each and every participant. And uh, Ojaswi has shared the live recording of day two, the link of the YouTube. Uh, so you can copy paste it and you can uh, view it again. Thanks Ojaswi for sharing. 
Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. If anyone is having Madam, any more questions. Hello, hello, please. Yes, yes, Abdul yes, Hamid. Yes, I wanted to ask, I couldn't make most of the class yesterday and I didn't send down my agenda. So, will there be um uh, abdul i guess uh like i cannot hear you properly because you are speaking from a little bit far uh if if it's possible can you please uh type down in the chat box and i'll be able to answer your query i, I was asking if one yeah, couldn't yeah. make the attendance yesterday mm -hmm. will someone be able to get the certificate also i, I um, didn't stay so long ago. Yes. So uh, talking about the certificate, uh, Abdul Hamid and everyone else, uh, there is a specific fee uh, for this certification part. And it is being divided into three different categories, student, then a faculty, and then people from industry, or just we can share the page link in the chat box. You can go through with the a page and you can see if it suits you the resources which we are giving and you can you know proceed with the enrollment part and we'll be sharing uh, if if anyone has missed out yesterday's session we'll be sharing the session recording as well they can take a look uh, at that particular time and they'll also receive certificate if they'll enroll now as well so there's a specific fee for this two-day omics research symposium and it's a very minimal fee uh, Ojasvi has shared the link in the chat box. You can, uh, like, you can copy paste this link and take a look. I hope I answered your question. Perfect. Anyone else is having any uh, doubt or any query? Please feel free to unmute and ask, or maybe. Uh, type here in the chat. You're welcome, Abdul. Okay, I guess there are no more questions. Then we are good to uh, end this two days. Oh, is, this, is this link for only day two training? Um, sorry, could you please repeat? The link for the YouTube watch, is it for the day two training alone? Yes, the link which Ojasvi has shared in the chat, it's the live recording of this day two of research symposium. Okay. So you, okay. can, you can view, yeah, you can see and you can listen all the talks once again. Okay, but well, for day, two, day one, maybe later that one will be sent. Yes, yes. For day one, uh, we'll be sharing it uh, next week okay, by Monday or on your YouTube channel, by Tuesday. Okay. One can Sorry? Find, as everyone can find it on your YouTube channel. Yes, we'll be sharing it with you by Monday. Okay, thank you very much. Day one, yeah, day one recording, we'll be sharing, uh, will be shared with you by Monday. And uh, here, if you want to search, uh, like where is day one research symposium recording, you can search on our YouTube channel. And OGSV has shared the link here in the chat itself. So you can go and uh, take a look if you want to find where the link is. But uh, we'll be definitely providing you with the session recording by Monday or Tuesday next week. Any other question or doubt? Okay, I guess there are no more questions and then we are good to go. Thank you everyone again uh, for joining and uh, for interacting and brainstorming with the guest speakers. And we will be meeting you again uh, in our next Omics Research Symposium, which will be, I guess, in August or so. So thanks everyone. Thanks to the organizing team. Take care. Have a nice day ahead. Goodbye.